Okay, here we are. Um, Roxanne, are you with us? Can you hear me? Yes, magnitude. The Forklings <laughs> are here. <laughs> Hello, Forklings. <laughs> <laughs> That's F O U R, Force Lings. F O U R, rather than F O R C E, Lings. Yeah, the, I leave the members of the Force Field. Right. Now, here's the thing. What we were just listening to from the Freak It album um, started to be recorded in late 65, early 66. So we're kind of coming up to December 2015. That's 50 years ago. What we just heard was done yes, 50 uh, years um, ago. Today I was going through the list of the 179 names of Zappa's influences. Yeah. Right. And, uh, I recognize it. Wonderful way to start by freaking out everybody. Which, uh, Which uh, uh, or abuse the of Android this, memes uh, mysterious, obscure Italian composer, Francesco Sapa. <laughs> you know your yes. secret. Yeah. That's right, we do know, and we're going to go into that. That's part of this book that Frank put out in 1984 called Them or Us. But back to this point, so um, on that, the voices we just heard doing Help, I'm a Rock, um, and that's after McLuhan is pointing out, and me, yes, well, Barry Nevitt and McLuhan were quoted before, you know, in that little interval. Um, it was a, a CBC program on uh, right after McLuhan died and last day of 1980, and Barry Nevitt, his, his buddy, went on CBC, and that was Barrington Nevitt talking first, and then uh, Culkin from his early days at Fordham, like 20 years before, no, only 15, 15 years before, Culkin and Barry Nevitt were probably the closest to people. You know, Culkin and McLuhan's earlier career, Nevitt in the later part of the career, so they're explaining Marshall. And then I would come in and explain that they're pointing to the everything's disappeared for the chemical body. So then it's appropriate to play, help, I'm a rock. You are reduced to rock status, mineral status, <laughs> under angelic, discarnate, super angelic conditions. So uh, it was appropriate to have that just before Frank spelled it out very humorously. Um, but one of the voices on there is Carl Franzoni, who was the... Uh, uh, Vito's right-hand man in the Freaks, the Dancing Freaks. Remember, this freak-out is, is uh, an expression of what um, Frank saw in Vito and his anarchistic dancers, who were a scene for the birds, for Arthur Lee and Love, and, and the mothers and, and the doors in 65-66. Well, Carl Franzoni was one of the main wild dancers on that. He's, he even have a picture of him uh, on the freak-out cover on the inside sleeves and what I just discovered last night and I posted on my Facebook page is he's made a tribute to Gale um, and he was probably born in the early 40s so he's getting 73 or so years old um, or maybe he's born in the late 30s but he's pretty old uh, he put together these pictures of Gale all ages that he had from his own archive I guess from his own experience because he was a a part of the Mothers of Invention Auxiliary. You know, he traveled around. He went to uh, London when Frank first went to London in September 67. And there's that famous Italian art, uh, actress, Car something Cardinale, Angela Cardinale, or Claudia Cardinale, I think her name was. Cardinale. Cardinale, Cardinale. And she's... Uh, Cardinale. Frank. Cardinale, right. And... Uh, um, He's dancing around with her in the uh, New Musical Express or Melody, whatever music, pop music magazine they're in. And there's Carl Franzoni. He's, he, so he was included in the picture with Frank and, and Claudia and some other guy, one of the mothers. So it's very interesting to look at his video and what he, um, what he says about Gail. But the main thing he says, Carol, is that Gail was the prettiest young woman in Hollywood. And... Um, yeah, she, and of course she looked like you. So uh, she was an extension of uh, the TV body of Connie into Hollywood. But the, uh, he shows some really good pictures. Um, 
But in the course of looking at that, I got out Barry Miles' book on Frank Zappa. He was one of the first uh, intelligent journalists investigating and interviewing Frank. And um, he writes out a pretty detailed history of Gale. Now, this guy who died the other day, who wrote the book that Laurel Canyon and, and the Birds and Neil Young and Stephen Stills and Crosby were all military brats who were part of a conspiracy on behalf of the CIA, and they include Frank Zappa's log cabin, which he didn't move into until 1968. And when he took it over in 68, who moved out? Vito and Carl Franzoni, the dancers. They had lived in that building. Uh, Tom Mix, the famous 1920s cowboy uh, Hollywood star, uh, he owned that place and had a secret tunnel over to Houdini's home nearby. So Frank occupies that in 68, but the Birds conspiracy, according to the Laurel Canyon guy, Dave McGowan, that writer, he says it started um, 66, 67, to distract uh, the protest, the anti-Vietnam protest movements by getting the kids into sex, rock, and drugs, sex, rock, and roll, and drugs. And, uh, and uh, it was sim- symptomatic that all these kids who were the stars of those bands were sons and daughters of the military. Well, Jim Morrison and uh, Gail Zappa knew each other as four-year-olds, uh, wherever it was in Florida someplace, because their fathers were in the higher levels of the military. And Jim Morrison's father... Um, was a key conspirator in the Gulf of Tonkin uh, hoax uh, thing that started uh, sort of officially the Vietnam War. And uh, so you've got Jim Morrison and, and Gail Zappa together, and she hits him over the head with a hammer at that point. But she moved, the family, her father moves to London, and um, she got a gig through her father for the Office of Naval Intelligence. So it just came out a month before David died, when Gail died back on October 7th uh, this year, um, at a memorial or in some situation in public where her son Amit says that Gail worked with the CIA and saved the world. And he, Amit says his uncle told him that, so I don't know who his uncle is. And uh, so this... Um, Talking about Gale as a CIA asset or something rubbing up against the television agency supports David McGowan's point. And, uh, and of course, McGowan had to be snuffed uh, a month later, right? But what's interesting is that I read Barry Miles' book years ago, but I had forgotten that. If she is in the Office of Naval Intelligence as an employee, as a young person, in 63, 64, 65 before she goes to L.A., because the family moved back to um, the New York area. He had a new military posting, her father did. Uh, that could explain what, how she had intelligence connections just by whatever she did in the Office of Naval Intelligence. And, you know, being a young pretty girl, the uh, higher-ups would definitely want her around and, uh, you know, what, uh, nurture her or, or have her do something. And, um, you know, we met Gail uh, way back there in the 19... Uh, 70 is one of the, one of the more uh, prominent times, and uh, she certainly came across as a haughty, um, snobbish person who did not seem to tolerate people talking to Frank. Uh, she didn't tolerate us at that point, and uh, you remember her haughty body language? Yeah? So um, was she a handler for Frank? I don't think so, but there's lots of food for uh, somebody to develop that idea. Yeah, because back then when when we were visiting with Frank, we were sitting down in the basement. And that well, that's time. 1988. I'm talking about 1970. Well, even 1988. She kept interrupting. Yeah, I mean, and she was so detached from him and his work and his people and his his uh, friends and his influences. She couldn't be bothered even saying hello to us or getting to know us and what wonderful people we are. Right. That's how she she, missed out. She poked her head in and said, it's 45 minutes, Frank. In other words, she had a deal where I'll come down and interrupt you every 45 minutes so that you don't have to keep talking to whoever's there as an interviewer or something. But Frank said, no, no, I'm okay. And then she came down a couple of times, and then she finally came down and said, Beverly's here. And Frank said, yeah, yeah. So when when Frank put on the album at the end of uh, the first three and a half hours, uh, he put on Broadway the Hard Way, which was just going to be released a week later in the end of October 1988. 
And uh, so we listened to it with him. But I noticed after about, I closed my eyes, and then about you know 20 minutes into it, I opened my eyes, and he had gone. He had left. So he went up to see Beverly D'Angelo, the actress who eventually married Al Pacino. But she is famous for playing uh, Patsy Cline in Coal Miner's Daughter, I think, the, the movie about uh, uh, Loretta Lynn. And she has a good walk-on part. But she was a singer, I think, in Ronnie Hawkins' band up in Toronto, even though she was an American in the 60s. And Ronnie Hawkins' band became the band for Dylan. Um, so um, she became a good friend of, uh, of Gail. And so uh, I guess Frank was supposed to go up and see Beverly while he had a break with us. Then he came back down, and, and we then did three and a half hours talk, not recorded, and got into the uh, paranoid stuff. So uh, I recommend people go and look at this collage that Carl Franzoni put together. Uh, he's a voice on there that we just heard. Help a rock. Help him a rock. Okay, uh, Roxy, is there some things you want to begin with? Of course. Um, yes, uh, there's many, many people saying uh, Frank Zappa was uh, infiltrating the rocks into sort of uh, uh, avoid uh, or, or impede that the hippies reach their goal of love and peace. But um, I think uh, it's not true. Um, if, if one studies um, Sapa's life, he was actually bullied by the authority from the beginning and uh, I don't think he was working for for them. Right. I mean, he even says on the album We're On For The Money that there's a guy creeping around in Laurel Canyon uh, who works for the CIA. So he's saying they're CIA people. He's exposing it on uh, on his third album. And he even did a song around that period, 60, 67, about Ronald Reagan, who was governor of California. And he was saying that that uh, Reagan was the CIA's man, CIA agent, and that he would be promoted to become president eventually. And that was the big discovery May Brussel made in 1973 after Watergate. And then McLuhan talked about Reagan inevitably becoming a president in 75, 76 for bottom-up reasons, not conspiratorial reasons, but... Um, so you have these holy offices, May Brussel, Frank Zappa, Marshall Cohen, all zeroing in on the role Reagan would play. And May Brussel said that the, to the degree that there would be a police state in the United States, it was rehearsed in uh, California first. And things were tried out, like they even had a um, FEMA camp thing called the Garden Plot, where Reagan uh, wondered about, as Governor Reagan wondered about um, how to implement and arrest the radicals running around in Berkeley and in Los Angeles, and the communists and anarchists and, and Negroes. Um, so uh, um, Zapp is writing about it. Yes, and uh, songs about it. Uh, we should not forget that uh, Frank's father was also working for the chemical war industry. The, well, that was that would be what uh, David Mc, David McGowan would emphasize that that like uh, Stephen Stills and Crosby yes, but, uh, and I all think, these other guys. Uh, like now I understand things. It's like in a way he needed to be inside that environment to understand from the inside that uh, there Are is you no. Frank good... too, or Frank's father. Frank or Frank's yeah, father? His, his non-physical Franks. Yes, non Frank. Non-physical, uh, yeah, came forth like that because he needed to, to be an insider of these things and uh, see that many of, of the things he was talking about are not conspiracies, are, are real experiments, and even his father right. was affected by those and, and his family. And, uh, right, let me tell you what, in relation to that, um, the new book by Frank's brother, Bobby Zappa's book, he says that his father worked with a lot of military uh, projects f for many years, and he would stay in a town and work there for a year or so. He did this a lot in California from like 1951 on. 
Oh, Bert's here. Okay, we'll let Bert in. Um, is that you, Bert? This one? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, so, uh, so in in California throughout the fifties, Frank's father would get a job in the in some military aspect, and he'd last about a year, and then they have to move somewhere else. And it was really upsetting to Frankie and Bobby that they had to move all the time every year and lose their friends and not even be able to have time to make any friends. So it was very hard on them as kids, and I guess on Candy, their younger sister, and Carl, the younger brother. Um, but Bobby raised the question, we don't know if our father had integrity and that he would be asked to go into top secret stuff eventually, and he would refuse it. So he'd quit and go try to get a job somewhere else. Or he was an incompetent guy, and he was quite an asshole. Uh, Bobby presents him that way, admits it. Uh, he may have caused trouble and was laid off because he wasn't trusted. So um, it is something that, as a family, they thought about and talked about. Like, why was her father always losing it once a year, and was it based on a good reason or a bad reason? The good reason is that he would not compromise himself and get into dangerous black projects, or he just couldn't do it. So what happens is that Frank writes this Uncle Meat movie uh, in 68, 69, and I read that interview in the first show from Richie York. It's the only explanation, the only interview where Frank talks about this. I was looking at some other people, and they were saying, we never knew what Uncle Meat was about. Frank was talking about it, but we never saw really what the movie was about. But he spells it out to Richie York in the Globe Mail or Toronto Star paper, and it's about it's obviously about his, mother, his father who um, gets involved with some top secret stuff and then quits and is pissed off that he's fired. But Frank makes that, the whole question about his father part of this movie, Uncle Meat, and, um, and then it gets uh, overlaid with another plot by a guy named Uncle Meat who's a former government scientist who's now gone rogue and is using new knowledge to uh, beat back the government. Now, these, this theme is in all the screenplays that I read this week to uh, get prepared for this show. I read the 1964 um, screenplay treatment called Captain Beefheart vs. the Grunt People. Then five years later, Frank updated it uh, in um, 1969 where he was going to have Grace Slick and Jim Morrison play uh, the characters that were just um, local people in 1964. Um, so, uh, and then he does Hunch and Toot in 72, I read that, and then I read Demeras, his, his monster masterpiece, where he uh, bundles all these previous treatments into one huge, massive uh, book with a lot of the conceptual continuity. But it's always about a uh, government scientist, uh, an inside guy getting fired. It's always about that. Every play, pretty Nathan, well, um... the... This links perfect with what I would like to talk about tonight okay, go ahead. or today. Yes, uh, yes because uh, for me, it was a big revelation to to understand the, the concept of artist for Marshall McLuhan is so so expanded. And, and he would say an artist is is a man of any field, it can be humanistic or scientific, who grabs the implications of his actions and of the new knowledge, the new technology. So he, he sees an artist as a hybrid, and um, his work is not only the, the single pieces of work he produces, but himself, the artist, is the medium. And uh, that's, that's um, like uh, he's already embodying this new hybrid of scientist, artist, and um, that's why he was criticized. You mean Frank is? You mean Frank is? Frank is embodying yes. Yeah, you're right. Yes, and uh, I understand now from Bruce McLuhan and learning from Bob, to understand Frank Zappa fully, completely, you need to understand what Marshall McLuhan and Bob are saying. 
because Frank Zappa yes. is not only about the music. He was really this new type of uh, post-literate, um, tactile. He's a new type artist. of porcelain. He's a new type of porcelain. Yes, and, and <laughs> he himself understood. Um, on the one side, the, the the continuity his work has with the past, but also that it's not only about entertaining music or being famous. I mean, he could have been just a rock star, but uh, he pushed all boundaries in every aspect of what he was doing. For example, one of the things he will criticize about the industry and the entertainment, he said, it's very good, we need this, this thing called art or entertainment music because living is so tough and people need this relaxing. But um, he saw how you could be programmed by the environment created, for example, in the hippie freak scene of sex, drugs, and rock and roll, it's just a distraction while the bankers, as he said, they're really working and you're just having fun. And um, he also criticized a lot the disco scene because that was the, the music of cocaine. And he said, this music is not about the music. It's just about... Uh, getting together in a dark place and have sex. Or, and uh, he, he was trying to He would say it was about that. lifestyle. He would say it would be audio yes, wall and, and, for your lifestyle. And also a way of uh, promoting substances that go with that music. And uh, one of the things that uh, he never got aired in, in mass media. He will be a guest in many talk shows, but um, he will be always presented as a type of freak or uh, entertainment and something. Uh, he was always being blasted by, by the people. And uh, he reacted with the satire instead of fighting back he will show his intelligence and, and be funny, and um, people will react good. He will, they will be maybe curious, who is this crazy guy with the mustache? And um, that's, I mean, that is, he, he's not only about the music, that's the, the main point I would like to, to do today. I mean, the music is amazing. And um, I, I'm reading the laws of media, and, and this book made me understand more aspects of Frank, because um, Matron was being criticized that he was not scientific. He was, like Pierre Schaeffer said, just making slogans and obscure metaphors. And uh, many people could not see that what he was saying was so, so deep and was the only real explanation of what was going on. Yeah, I agree with so, what you're saying. Um, and you will see this in the screenplays. I'm reading these screenplays closely. He makes great uh, metaphorical cartoons about this very thing you're talking about, being a scientist and an artist, a comprehensive person uh, who uh, has a uh, small day job of being a, a compu uh, an entertainer, only a small part of his work. Yes, but uh, McLuhan also said in Understanding Media, in a culture like ours, long accustomed to splitting and dividing all things as a means of control, it is sound times a bit of a shock to be reminded that in operational and practical fact, the medium is the message. It's like, um, and what is this medium? The media, and um, he saw 
This is a new type of science that uh, really erases everything else, as, as Zion is saying. And uh, this erasing that started with, with uh, artists like Winston Lewis and Joyce that were already being this type of hybrids. And uh, maybe that's the thing that uh, many people don't understand about Bob, because he, he can talk about medicine and healing and then politics and then Zappa and, and uh, the Matrix and, and uh, using that he is a new type of artist, scientist, this new hybrid that uh, was the archetype to think in the Renaissance and in the, during the Enlightenment wanted to achieve the all-knowing. And uh, that is part of the completion that we're going to get to this point where we finally have all of our senses working as one, not uh, only one being uh, dominating, <laughs> like, like during the fall, fallen stairs, the visual has been dominating, and, and we will get back the new wing. Yes, but in the wing. meantime, <laughs> yeah, uh, Marshall McLuhan discovered the four laws of media. Yeah. And uh, he says he was influenced by reading Bacon and Vico. This both um, had this, um, Bacon had the novum organum, which means the new organ. And Vico had the La Cienza Nuova. And they were already seeing there needs to be another type of science which doesn't fragmentize and divides. Um, both of them had these four principles, but um, Marshall McLuhan went to, to develop the the threat management. And it's very interesting because one of the reasons Bob was sent to infiltrate Marshall McLuhan and Frank Zappa was that they were using the threat management. Maybe you like to say yeah. something. Well, I've said a lot about that. Um, I was, let's just hold that for a minute. Uh, Bert, you weren't with us last week, were you? Or were you? Did you come late? What happened? I don't remember you I was, saying I was, much. No, I was I was there last week. I was there last week. Um, Bob, last this week I listened to um, on your Vimeo page the uh, Living in the Acoustic World, and I found a link. I thought of the connection of McLuhan and Zappa because um, in that video, Zappa. I mean, uh, McLuhan brought out that rock music is like an oral form of education, that it, it, rock music, even though Frank was not really a rock musician, he was just a musician using music uh, for his own weapon, but it blew me away. I never heard McLuhan speak about rock music in that way. I always heard that, you know, he said rock electronic music shattered the universe and everything, but... What he said in there, I took a note, he said that rock is a kind of a central oral form of education that threatens the whole educational establishment. And that's, that's if you look at what uh, you, last week you read a lot of the um, screenplay, you read some screenplays, in the, and Frank yeah. was using that as a tool. And what Frank used as a complete tool is that he had this, the sin class which was sort of like the technology, uh, you know, the musical instrument used, he used all those different sounds to actually get his message across, yeah. to really teach, teach people, open people, those who had ears to hear, you, would, you could say if you wanted to use that type of uh, What was that new sound? Uh, we say those who have the autonomic systems, because we don't have ears and eyes anymore. We're, 
we're inside yeah. our gut, the extension of our sender system. So those who have the autonomic system that can respond resonantly to the frequencies of us, uh, that's who this is for. <laughs> I never thought of that before. We don't have eyes and ears. We've got autonomic systems, and we're inside yeah. each other's guts. I was describing on a What Youth a couple of weeks ago, I was, uh, Jermaine was online, so I started to describe the inner lining of her vagina, and then I started to describe the, al- the elementary canals, it called, where the shit comes down, so I was describing her shit and her bowels. Now, that's pretty rude and disgusting, but that's actually what we have to realize, that in the electronic yeah. discarnic position, we're looking through the chemical body, we're inside the chemical body, that's why... Burroughs and Joyce McLuhan said, would uh, have a lot of digestive processes as a metaphor in their books. Like Joyce, said, all through Finney's Wake, you're inside a body. And uh, that's how much we're inside every part of each other's bodies. So, um, you know, Jermaine could, could describe my scrotum if she wanted to, you know, as she's in there. <laughs> so that's what it means to be discarnate. You have to um, change your, your eyes and ears. You're inside the guts of the other person. So, anyways, you were saying, uh, if you have the eyes and ears to hear it, what do you hear? Well, it just changes your pattern. It just, it just, it just changes your pattern oh, yes, of what, what you're using. Normally... Yeah, the metaphor is that Frank is, he couldn't get a, a top hit. He would present music to Clive Davis and these big guys who became moguls in the university, in the uh, music world. And uh, he would stick to his principles, and they would say, well, that has no commercial potential. We're not going to do it. So he was basically fired from the music industry, even though at Paul Buff Studio, they were making hit records, a few hit records, and they were very talented, uh, yet the establishment would not let them in there. So he was basically fired, like he's always saying about Uncle Mead and his father were fired from government contract work. And he knew that entertainment was part of the government. So it's a metaphor for him. Finding a way to get to you is the lyrics in the um, Mother People song, uh, I think on World for the Money. He said, we found a way to get to you, and he said it in some interviews we read a couple weeks ago, we can use rock to become a new kind of teacher, a new kind of educator, like for the high school. We're an antidote to the high school world. And he says on Freak Out, he says, drop out, forget the senior prom, drop out of school and go to the library. So he's actually got an agenda of um, radicalizing people, but not in any political sense, in the sense of uh, left, right, center. And he's on a teaching mission. And nobody lists 179 people as, uh, as these people have influenced me. First of all, people don't even tell who influenced them. And he lists 179 of them, and they're an inventory of the great teachers in music and in other topics in uh, other fields in, uh, in the 20th century. It was an education, as Roxy was saying, she's going through a list. I got this book. Uh, a guy named Scott Parker writes a book on the making of Freakout. And he lists all 179 people and tells you who they are. Now, there used to be a list that I had, but I haven't looked at it, so it's been updated. So if you want to later go into that list, it's, it's pretty interesting who he, uh, who, he, who he includes on it. But um, including John Wayne. Yes, John Wayne. That came up in the chat line. So, Bert. Uh, Zappa is becoming a teacher, right? I mean, a high school yes. teacher. Yes. He's infiltrating what McLuhan called the global classroom, the city with a classroom without walls, and uh, presenting a curriculum that's worth it. Yes. Yes. And it, it's, it's back then, it was probably kind of oddball for most, but he was really touching on or surveying the whole. Um, environment of, of the counter environment that he really saw that was the, sort of like the May Brussels approach of the conspiracy. So he used uh, yeah. his music and his presentation to raise, you know, raise that point. And uh, you know, sometimes was humorous, was sometimes was vulgar. Yes. He was a, he was a yeah. journalist. He said he was a journalist. And one of his most popular songs, uh, Trouble Coming Every Day, it has different titles, about the Watts Riot song, That's still a very powerful uh, riot that he watched in uh, August 1965 in in Los Angeles. And um, he was writing about, he was criticizing the TV coverage of it as one of many things, but uh, that's a tremendous song. And he said, that's me being a journalist. Uh, He talks about it, I think, in our interview with him. But um, he also said he was an anthropologist. 
And he, of course, was a physicist, and he had a grand unified theory. He covered it all. He, he was being HCE in fitting his wake. He was doing everything, as, as McLuhan was. So it's remarkable that you, know, you have Zap, uh, McLuhan, I call King Lear. He's an old guy who has to divvy up uh, the legacy of Western man to his kids or to the next couple of generations, and that's King Lear's dilemma. And, and Frank is a King Lear since he's in the McLuhan quadrant. How is he a King Lear? He's 10 years older than the, than the audience that he's um, teaching, that he's infiltrating. You know, he's, yeah. um, 60, he's 26, 27, 28 in, in communicating to 15, 16, 17-year-olds. Um, that's a King Lear. And uh, he's trying to figure out what of the musical history of the 20th century is worth bequeathing to the next generations. You know, what, that's you King, the, uh, taking it on. To yeah, understand the phenomenon of, of Frank Zappa, it's, it's like um, when you understand the laws of media, you, you see the, the logical result of what was going on and why would a, an artist like that appear in the horizon. Because with the laws of media, McLuhan saw all outerings are like words, also technologies. And this erased the boundaries between everything, between the metaphysical and the physical sciences, between art and technology, between high culture and low culture. He saw all human utterings had the same value, and all human uh, utterings can be studied at the same level. And uh, that's something Ayan also shows all the time by making quotes from media and uh, making us listening to three-chord songs. Song. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, this, is, this is something that is a, a very important part of the style of Frank Zappa. He... It mentions in, in this say, list. Uh, can yeah, I just say okay, something okay. so I don't forget it? Uh, you know, they have that joke, if um, somebody didn't exist, then we would have invented them. So you're exactly right. If Frank Zappa had not existed, we would have to have invented him as a nece necessary anthropomorphic and environment to the global theater of the 60s. There would have to be someone like that come forth to be an anti environment to the new renaissance of music and sound experience that was happening. So, yes, we would have had to yes, invent and, and I, I say after Bach, you know, I, I talk about how he created the tonality that was, mm. was a system that had a, a focal point, like the tonality, the main note was like the sun, and all the other notes around that were the planets. Because he was um, biased by the Gutenberg galaxy and the visual space, and he wanted to translate this understanding of the power of God in, in the music. And uh, the this the tonality, the harmony, the, the, the system was expanded and developed and used by Mozart and uh, Beethoven. But then, when the electric environment comes forth, the artists start gain, getting away from from the tonality, and uh, it's it's a logical sequence when we understand the laws of media. That uh, because we're in a post-literate age, the things that were created for thousands of years by by the Gutenberg galaxy, by the alphabet and the books, are destroyed in a few decades. And, and yeah. the artists go away from tonality because uh, they are again immersed in the acoustic all at the same time, simultaneous. Audile and tactile and kinetic. Environment. Multi-sensory sound. 
Yes, and, and uh, they start to expand not only, for example, there's the use of chromatic, which is like half tones. And right. for example, Schoenberg develops the system of the 12 tones in which all notes have the same importance. In the tonal system, there is like hierarchies, like the the tonality is is like the king, like the sun, and everybody. All the other notes are subjected to this yeah. tonality and have different harmonic functions. For example, for modulation or to move from one chord to other, there are these laws to create tension and then release. But uh, Schoenberg makes a system where all the notes have the same importance. And Stravinsky also starts using a lot of chromatism and um, they also become somehow kinetic. I think many of the contemporary composers were also influenced by movies because uh, many also made soundtracks. And uh, yeah. the music becomes this type of of narration with a lot of drama and, and sound effects and they, they create big clusters and uh, different types of instrumentations, uh, different, uh, not, they stop using the, the traditional orchestra as it was, you know, these families of the strings and uh, metal winds and percussions and they expand that uh, group of instruments and, and they start exploring uh, other sound landscapes like traditional music because in traditional music there are very weird harmonies and melodies and rhythms and many come from for example shamanic uh, traditions that uh, had another function of, of getting you into a trance or having another type of effect. This is not only like for dancing or or for having a nice music. And uh, very in, in the list of, of the of the freak out, uh, yeah. Sapa names Sean Bevan and very uh, Stockhausen, Stravinsky, Cage, uh, Stravinsky, uh, yeah, Stravinsky, <laughs> as, as his, uh, <laughs> his influence. Okay, uh, yeah. That's why I say, after Bach, Sapa will be the, the most important because it's not only about the music, it's how he's presenting the new ground and, and what's coming. Right. And, uh, and and he had his his uh, own court Bible, and uh, yeah, there are many aspects of his music that, uh, like um, microtonality and the importance of rhythm, uh, multi rhythms, and then also the importance of technology as part of his musical language. Is not only composing with notes, but also with all sound landscapes, like everything he could get from radio, TV, and movies. Like he did all you know, the things. You may not know this term, Roxy. He called it harmonic climates. Talk about media, hot and cold. You know, media as mm -hmm. weather systems was McLuhan's definition. He used the same term, harmonic climates. Yes, but and carry uh, on with what you were saying. Yeah, he gets into this um, new dimension, new hybrid. He could have become an academic experimental composer. I mean, yeah. he he was then played by Boulet and respected by Barres and Cage and everybody. But uh, he so he wanted to reach a wider audience, and he didn't want it to be limited by the environment of the academic elite, he wanted yes. really to infiltrate the entertainment and, and present 
this new music, these new patterns, these, these new ideas to everybody. And, and he the, said, everything is happening all the time. Remember, the, everybody, a lot of people know this video. The first time he's on TV is the Steve Allen show. 1963, mm-hmm. a week before the world's greatest sinner is going to have a, a, a showing in L.A. What does he do? He goes on and instructs Steve Allen and the orchestra of how to play the bicycle. He, t- he takes the teacher role in his first uh, appearance on TV. <laughs> He's going to show how to play the bicycle. <laughs> You've seen that video, uh, Another, right? another like, thing, uh, he will quote, yes, I, I, I love that. Yeah. Because he asked um, the um, presenters, Peter asked him, how long have, been you, have you been playing the bike? And he says, oh, a week. And, and he's already on TV. <laughs> <laughs> For two weeks, I think he says, yeah, a couple weeks. And, uh, yeah, all the time, Steve, who's a comedian, he's, uh, he's saying, oh, we've got a put-on guy here. And uh, so i got to counter his put-on. So he kept saying, well, he turns to the audience and he says, this is pretty neat. This guy was saying, how can I get it on TV? You, you hear that? You remember that part? He goes, he starts thinking, imitating Frank's mind. He goes, well, how can I get it on TV? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll teach him how to do the bike. He was making fun of Frank doing that. And Jerry Hopkins worked for Steve Allen. And Jerry Hopkins, we read uh, some of his articles on um, Vito and the L.A. scene that were in the L.A.P. Press in the first show. He says that Steve Allen, I read this somewhere else later, he, uh, Steve Allen told him after Zappa was on, and, you know, Steve was very cordial, but he said after, do not allow any more put-on artists on our show because Jerry was in charge of guests, and uh, he got a little, almost lost his job having Frank on. And, but, but Steve Allen called Frank a put-on artist. <laughs> Well, that's what uh, is kind of parallel to what I observed uh, when I did The View. They yeah. wouldn't let me be funny. That's right. The host had to be the comedian. <laughs> yeah. And the uh, the guest was the dupe. Yeah, yeah. So Frank switched roles. Yes, he owed Steve Steve. Yep. Um, okay, back to what you were – so you were saying, Roxy, we were sidetracked into <laughs> – Yes, but the one thing he quote often – was a phrase. The present day composer refuses to die. I mean, yeah. now that we know he's Francesco Zappa. We knew the, he was telling us that he hadn't died. He had not died <laughs> for 200 years. Yes, but uh, <laughs> in a way, that's, that's completely ionic because, in a way, with the discovery of the laws of media, that everything is is like a language and, and Speech, it's a type of music, has the same characteristic of any musical discourse. It's really music. Yeah. It's like we, all, we are all composers, and that's what I am saying with this new song of the... And you and being the, the teacher that is going to teach us how to speak right. Because this, Right. Now, McLuhan... In 1964, is explaining that Carl Orff and these composers bringing sound into their compositions. The same year that that McLuhan, who is 40, 30 years older than Zappa, now Marcel Duchamp said an art an art phase lasts about 30 years, and then it becomes public property. So it's 30 years later, Zappa's born late 40, early 41. You know, 30 years after McLuhan's born, and um, he represents the next generation uh, who's going to create a whole different art. But that's why Frank is writing about speech and music in his screenplay, Captain Beefheart versus the Grunt People. Grunt, you know, grunting with speech. Beefheart meets the speech people. Um, he's talking about it in his, his art the same year McLuhan's becoming famous writing about it, you know, metaphysically. So it's, just, it's very interesting, the parallel between the two of them. And, and McLuhan's saying that Young people can be can influence global consciousness now. He said that in 1964 in a National Film Board documentary. Well, for him, Zappa is a young person. So here's Frank creating a whole movement, <laughs> sexual revolution and the freak out thing, uh, as a young person, you know. And, um, and yes, uh, because the, the market of the market of youth 
was um, a novelty. It was um, right. started with the rock and roll in the 50s. And the, the corporation saw there is a big market and they had to start producing things for younger generations. And they coined the term uh, teenager. They, uh, they were called adolescents before that, you know, back in the 19th century, and they were meant to be seen and not heard. But now they could be heard, and so they had become a market niche, so they were called teenagers. So everybody was an, of some age. So they were the teen age. <laughs> that meant everybody Listen, was that, a human being. That's what Sapa says, uh, Debbie is the, yes, Debbie. taking the chance of the music you, know. you are going to hear. Yeah, Debbie controls the world. This is the stupid, Debbie. revolve around <laughs> Debbie. <laughs> uh, let me just say something. Now, let, let me add this point about the, the present-day composer refused to die. McLuhan said that the Gutenberg press, agreeing with Ion, the uh, three or four hundred years of print was a dark age where people's lives were short and brutal and uh, limited, very limited. It only had one little dimension, then you died. That's what the printing press brought in, and it created history or time. Then he says the electric age creates uh, retrieves eternity. So no longer have you got history under electric conditions, what he called the Marconi galaxy, you know, Marconi inventing the wireless broadcasting, wireless technology. Um, it's moved into eternity. That's another part of Ion's message, that we're moved out of the Gutenberg limiting effect of one life and uh, uh, very prescribed, proscribed, into an expanding multi-access to many worlds, synesthesia, to eternity. So the present-day composer refuses to die. Uh, that's because we're, we've retrieved the eternal in the world of language and electric media. You've becoming and started to experience eternity. So just want to supplement what you're saying there. Yes, and, and, and I think he was really, or he is really aware of the real meaning of that phrase. Right, right. Now, uh, um, Bert, uh, what ideas do you get from what we're saying at this point? I see that um, the electronic uh, approach that uh, Frank took, because Roxanne said a week ago that it struck a, uh, a thought pattern for me, is that Bach developed the uh, piano. Is that correct? And he used the 12 tones in the piano to create that. Not and the I, piano, I that Frank the um, keyboard, the clavier. Clavier, okay, okay, the clavier. And what I see is with Frank with the sin clavier, he really opened up a whole new world of electronic communication and um, because that sin sin clavier, I don't I don't think they're still using that. Or if they are, they're not using as complex as he did. Because like when I read in the mother's uh, mother of all in uh, interviews. He was experimenting and discovering things that the uh, the company couldn't even figure out. And my, my question to right. Roxana is: Is that is there? Because okay, the clavier had twelve tones. Now, in electronic music, I'm probably using the wrong language, but are the twelve tones no. magnified or increased? I mean, so that no, I could, the, like, the, um, we are not limited to the twelve tones. That's something. Um, at the beginning of the last century, the Russians and the Germans started to create other types of instruments that will generate sounds in an artificial way. Then that uh, was developed with um, music concrete and electronic music. But uh, at the beginning, there there were no no real technologies for a studio, for recording. There were other techniques like uh, Edison made uh, cylinders of wax, and that's how the, the first uh, recordings were made. But then other technologies developed. And uh, one way to control these sound generators, artificial, like the one of the first responses of 
of uh, the engineers was to use a keyboard. I think it has to do with the fact that during the 19th century, the keyboard was so popular, but maybe it also has mm-hmm. to do with non-physical <laughs> things, like yeah. uh, this tunnel system was there until the electric environment. And, uh, and uh, it's a very easy way to say, I want this frequency. I want do, re, mi, fa, whatever you want, you just press the key. And um, uh, it was funny that before I remember all these organs and the first synthesizers were also made like wood looking. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, yeah, like uh, maybe it was part of the marketing that they wanted to make it something familiar that you could buy for your living room, you know, like a keyboard or an organ. And, uh, but there are many, many other types of, we call them controllers. Now the, the trend is to, to make this um, finger percussion. You just press different buttons and you assign different types of events to the, each button. Like I want here a sequence, I want here this sound, I want this effect or just percussions, whatever. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was just, uh, the Synclavier was one of the first uh, when, there, when there was the, the personal computer, that allowed like uh, people to have recording studios at home. Before it was so expensive, you had to be in a school in an institution to to have these machines. Like when I wanted to start making electronic music, they would not allow me to go inside the studio because they told me you need to be a composer, a mathematician, a programmer, everything. <laughs> just to to see if you can start composing. And that's, that's how I landed with the uh, yes guy, because he was a composer. His family is very wealthy, and, and he had a house with a studio. And uh, he found it very nice that I wanted to make electronic music. And he became like my mentor and um, wow. I got my own equipment because at the time we had the Apple II Plus. You could have your own computer at home. Mm. And uh, the Synclavier was one of the first systems which had a, a sequencer, sampler, like a digital recording studio. But it was very, very expensive at the time. Like, not everybody could afford to have that. And um, there was, uh, after that, also an instrument called Fairlight. But uh, I don't even remember how much they will cost. But they were very, very expensive. And um, they had no, not much memory. One would laugh because now we have so much storage in, in, in any computer, but at that time it was like nothing, and they were so expensive. Did you but, say the uh, same clap here when you were a bunch member? Uh, the, was, what? It, was it the same clap here that didn't have much memory? Is that what you're referring to, Roxanne? Yes, uh, in, com- in, in comparison with what we have now. Yeah. You know, yeah, we, this is when, we will see this, this is, sound that such an instrument costs so much with so little memory in comparison with what we can yeah. access now. And, and she's talking about yeah. when she's 11 years old, which is 1979. She's talking about 79, 80, 81 when she's working with this Gurdjieffian, you know, Gurdjieff mentor. Uh, she's just a kid, not even a Dang. teenager yet. <laughs> <laughs> I will I will play the keyboards and then I will go play Barry's with the daughter of kids. <laughs> yes. Did you say you would go play Varez? Did you know about Varez? No, I was, yes, I knew about Varez and about, but that, I mean, I was making electronic music and also playing Barbies at the time with the daughter of Antonio Rusek. Uh, well, right, you, you knew well, about Varez well, when you were 11? You knew about Varez yes, when you were 11 that, years old, Rafa? Wow. 
<laughs> we have like a, like um, independent electronic music multimedia center, and all the composers, the most important composers, will come and, and record, or or they needed um, PA, or we also did some festivals um, because we were the only ones. So everybody will come and. One of the things we will do is like, if they had a new piece, we will listen to that, or we will go record them. And uh, that was a, a sort of a training of education because uh, they will, for example, say, yes, in this piece I was uh, influenced by John Cage, and look, hear the harmonics, and this and that. <laughs> and, um, is, is, Roxy started Mario listening when she was. What? What did you say? Yes, but I, I think if you have access, like Frank Zappa had to discover all this music, in and uh, by himself he will go to shops and look in in this obscure yeah. part of the shop, electronic music or contemporary composers or whatever, and and he, he was really impressed that these wonderful music, these wonderful ideas, these wonderful composers and sonorities were not on mass media. And look at the list he has. He even has like Silvestre Revueltas, he's a Mexican composer, and um, many others. Who did that he have? He what name? Silvestre Revueltas. The, oh, yeah, we were talking about that the other day. Yeah, there, there's someone, he Zappa even knew about him. Now, let me say this, Roxy, before I forget the... Um... Yeah, he was aware of contemporary music, not only in Europe, but in other countries. That's, that's really amazing. Yeah. That he got right. to libraries, uh, to post, and, and, and research these things. Okay. And he puts this list. It's amazing. But he... Right. Now, I just want to say what's amazing it's... about your situation is that you're sitting there at 11 years old, and you're the only kid around the adults, and these are accomplished uh, musicians in the Mexican culture. And so Roxy sat for 80, uh, let's see, uh, what is that, 1979? Uh, 30 years, 2009. Years. Yeah, no, but you sat, because you went to Berlin and sat in classes, and you still go and sit. She's still listening to people present their new high-tech uh, compositions. At 30 years later, you know, wow. 79 to 2009, until Ion got her off her ass, and now she's here <laughs> co-creating. But she got into this. This was her sport, her hobby, was listening to new developments in electronic technology, electronic music. That's what she did since she was 11 years old. She did it in Berlin. Wow. She still and, goes um, that group. In the city of the Technische Universität, there are auditions every Thursday. And, and you get to listen to new technologies because there's a lot of engineers developing instruments yeah. and doing apps and programs. Right and now, also yeah. main studios from France or England or anywhere come and they have changes. Okay. Bird, or I want to say this. Things. Back to the Bach theme. Um, Walter Boward said, um, Bob, there's only two people in the world who are going to understand you, and you haven't met them yet. Well, I'm inclined <laughs> to think that, that um, uh, Roxanne is one of them because she's the first person to support what I say. I say Zapp is the greatest musician in the history of the world. Now, most yeah, people think that's yeah. an absurd statement. So the more you know what he did is that yeah. the idea that an individual genius could influence the culture comes in with the printing press. So Bach did that. And he sets out something that goes on for hundreds of years. You have to have a new technology, a revolutionary technology, that actually obsolesces music to get away from the influence of Bach. And Zappa came along to be as significant in music as Bach was. And it takes this long to get to that point. But that's like saying Zappa's completing music uh, before. It's now just in everybody's hands to make music. It's no big deal. It's, it's just cooking. Anybody can cook. Yeah. And... Uh, that's, that's why Zapp is showing the, the, the cooking glove on his hand. He's mirroring what everybody's becoming, a, a cook. And, and music is made by anybody. This is the, the, the dilemma Dave Neufeld has. 
as a producer. You know, it's hard to stand out when everybody doesn't yeah. want to listen to anybody else. They want to make their own stuff. So it's symptomatic that when the Android meme, re the after image of the Android meme comes in in the early 90s, Frank dies. You know, he's obsolete. But he will go down in history as the standard of someone who took what could be done and create something like McLuhan said. We had John Culkin saying earlier about McLuhan that we haven't even begun to understand what McLuhan's about. And he was saying that when McLuhan died in 1980. Now we do. We, uh, it's been quite rapid, the, the updating of I understand McLuhan over the last 15 years for people because the environment just rubs it in their face. But the, um, yeah. And I would say that the idea of the medium is the message. That's McLuhan's point. And people are now understanding that because it's obsolete. The medium is not the message. Humans are not influenced anymore. And that's the Bob aspect. You know, if McLuhan was Bach, I'm Zappa. I'm completing what Bach started. <laughs> McLuhan Bach. Uh, but back to this point that Roxanne is the first person I ever met who she didn't understand this a year ago, but over the past year, she now makes this statement. Now, and she could say to any of her friends, she has a few artist friends who are in touch with her, and they're saying, I listen to the Zappa thing. I don't know what you guys are talking about. These are smart <laughs> artists. They don't understand what she's saying. Because she's saying what, what I'm saying is that you've got to look at Zappa as a major historical phenomenon um, like Bach was. Yes. And uh, so I am impressed with the yes, because, Roxy. She's first. Because Zappa yeah, is showing the new ground. That's the, the, the main function of an artist. Like yeah. uh, um, in the laws of media, McLuhan explains it. Every medium concentrates in, in one sense. Yes, enhance one sense. That's a tetrad. It expands, extends one faculty. But um, Zappa is doing what Joyce did in for the book. He's, he's yeah, doing... Yeah. Yeah. The, he's presenting the new ground and, and showing... Right. All the, the implications of, of, of the work of the new hybrid. The, the new hybrid is, is, not limit, is not limited to the, just the music. It's all his right. altering. Well, that's all. where, don't, you probably know more about this than me. You get Wagner, who wanted to create the total artwork. And so the idea of synesthesia, I don't know if he used that term, but... He was trying to mix his media and make this big uh, theatrical, comprehensive multimedia scene. Wagner starts it and influences the, the poets of his time. And you have every generation is, is trying to express the multidimensional nature of sound, not just sound for the ear. They want to get into the what turns out to be synesthesia. And um, Frank completes that synesthetic, synesthetic process because the Android means technology. The computer can simulate synesthesia. Instantly. So when you're saying that he wants, he's not just a musician, he's not just an ear guy, you have to look into the fact he's a tactile uh, synesthetic. Synesthetic. Synes uh, you got anesthetic. What do you got? Anesthete. So he's a synesthete. You know, anesthete. Anyways, I wanted to mention that. That's what I would say you're trying to say. That Zappa I mean, is he a multimodal. Go ahead. It's just his genius of just to jump into the electronic, like the, the synclad. It would be interesting to hear what, I mean, he really, I mean, that was an unknown uh, instrument at the yeah, time. Yeah, but that's, he a later, jumped in there. that's a later development, Bert. What he did on Lumpy Gravy and World for the Money, he makes a statement on the back of the album. He points out that this is not electronically something. It is electronically altered. He makes a distinction. Mm. He's basically describing virtual reality. Uh, that he mm. is he is making up sounds. He is not mm. using electricity to enhance them or amplify them. And he makes that statement on the back of "We're Only for the Money." He um, I mean, if we could Google it, they might somebody has the album in detail. They might tell us. And you have to read it carefully. He points out that um, he is altering things to the uh, in the studio that nobody would understand because they didn't have access. The normal consumer didn't have access to the studio and what was going on. He was trying to make a very technical point that he was actually making up music. Yes, for example, Wagner is very interesting because he was trying to expand also the possibilities of yeah. what you could make with music. 
And uh, as you say, he was already trying to include the multimedia. But what he did, he, he would use like um, double orchestras. Yeah. And uh, his pieces last like eight hours or six hours. <laughs> <laughs> to develop his wow. ideas, he needs amazing, wow. I mean, the resources just to to present such operas, I mean, I, I think only here in Germany there is this festival of Wagner music. I mean, where can that be done with double yeah. orchestras and core, uh, choirs and all these? Uh, he, so he, he was trying to this. expand. Right, so he's doing this at the time the Telegraph comes in. He's, his dates are eight, May 22nd, 1813, until 70 years later, he dies on February 13, 1883. That's right when Joyce, Dravinsky, Picasso, and Lewis are born, 1881, 82, 83. Um, so I'm looking at yes, the... And, and maybe he's, he's like the climax of the tonal music because he, he was trying to, to achieve the most complex, technically, that you could with this system, with the Western the Karen's asking, system. Richard Wagner... Yeah. Um, go, what was those last words, um, the last bit you said there? Yeah, but, uh, with the, the environment of the orchestra and the opera house, I mean, he was like the climax of yes. the, the most you could do in that environment. It's and I think he did like a Wagner What? Yeah, he said, uh, I challenge, uh, like, the next generation of to come with something new, like, you know, innovative uh, after after me. So that's why Weber and Schoenberg and Stravinsky, they, what they could do is to go away from the tonality, to, right. to explore and the chromatic and microtonalities and multirhythms. Because in that sense, he had reached the climax. Right. So here's, here's what it says. He described the aesthetics of drama in this essay he wrote in 1851 called Opera and Drama that he was using to create the ring operas. Before leaving Dresden, Wagner had drafted a scenario that eventually became the four-opera cycle, Der Ring de Nibelungen. He initially wrote the libretto for a single opera. Uh, in 1948, after arriving in Zurich, he was in, uh, he was no longer in Germany, he was in exile. After arriving in Zurich, he expanded the story with the opera Der Junge, The Young Siegfried, which explored the hero's background. He completed the text of the cycle by writing the libretti, the libretti for the Valkyrie and then the Rheingold, and reversing the other libretti to agree with his new concept, completing them in 1852. The concept of opera expressed in this essay called Opera and Drama in another essay, he's effectively renounced the operas he had previously written, up to and including Lohengrin, which was, uh, I don't know what the meaning of that is, Lohengrin. Um, partly in an attempt to explain his change of views, Wagner published in 1851 the autobiographical quote uh, titled, A Communication to My Friends. This contained his first public announcement of what, what was to become the ring cycle. He says, I shall never write an opera more. As I have no wish to invent an arbitrary title for my works, I call them. I will call them dramas. I, pro I propose to produce my myth in three complete dramas, preceded by a lengthy prelude. At a specially appointed festival, I propose, some future time, to produce those three dramas with their pr prelude in the course of three days and a four evening. Emphasis in original, the way he emphasized three days and a four evening. So he is expanding and doing this huge, many-hour experience. When the telegraph comes in, he's responding to the telegraph, unconsciously or consciously, I, we don't know. But that's the point. Right when the telegraph's coming in, he feels the pressure of something new is required. He's actually starting to express the electric eternity. He's saying the opera refuses to die. He's going to make it last yes, forever, and, uh, 10 hours. <laughs> he had wow. also a, a bigger agenda. He influenced Nietzsche. And it influenced him also. Yeah. They were trying to to make art for this new era, for the new Ubermensch. The new gods. Yeah, the yeah. Ubermensch, the Superman. 
Yeah, they, they, in other words, the respond that somehow the electric environment, the telegraph is extending people into a whole new area, and they felt it and said, we are bigger now. We have more organs. We have new uh, environments attached to our chemical body, and we gotta, mm-hmm. we got to c- communicate to that. So Zappa ends that cycle. He comes in and um, completes the potentials of uh, what one can do with this new technology and our new organs. So uh, yes, and, and the way the back there, he had also this idea of also his work being like a big cycle that presented the, the philosophy, the ideas. Like uh, th- there was this retrieval of the an- antique. Antique, yeah, antiquity. Uh, yes, they they wanted to present the mythic to to the little man. Mythic. And to, yeah, to to educate them and to make them connect to the sublime, to the divine. Right. In a way, they had a Gnostic ambitions. Uh, nothing wrong yes, with and, that, um, uh, but. That's why both were abused by the Nazis as part of their yes. um, program. They both? Of their pro- uh, uh, yeah, Nietzsche both and Nietzsche, Nietzsche and Wagner Wagner. were used right. by the Nazis uh, for propaganda purposes. Like, this is our cause. Well, how about this? The Nazis, living in the radio environment, which would be invisible to them, they wanted to use the more recent, older technologies, but were electric. So the thinkers of that were uh, Nietzsche and Wagner. And uh, if they were living in the present and aware of the uh, electric effect of the radio, they would have used Joyce or Verez. Yes, and, and it's very interesting how the, the radio activated this tribal thing yes. in, in Germany it was the first nation with uh, folks radio folks back in folks right the folk. <laughs> folks means the folks yeah. and and they yeah, were they, they were they had the back in, also the folks radio like it was part of the of the program that everybody had to be infiltrated with these new technologies to yeah they to knew program. The, answer, the tribal drum radio was the tribal drum but I just want to say uh, kudos for Roxy. What do you think of that, Bert? She is uh, catching up to me by saying Zappa uh, is the new Bach. That's a pretty uh, big statement. Yes. What, do you, what do you think of that? Yes. It's a very big statement, but uh, what we've presented so far, I mean, she's spot on. I mean, with her musical yeah. background, she's, she, could, she, could, she has the credentials to make such a statement because it's um, – it's, I see. I, I, I support her uh, presentation. He is. I mean, Frank Zappa is the new Bach. And uh, a question for Roxana: Are you, uh, in your spare timing, uh, are you considering composing yourself electronically? <laughs> yes, I always do. Yes, now we yeah. have a new secret pro- project. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, you, you'll be part of the content of it, Bert. You're going to okay. be part of the content of it, Bert. You're going to be okay. massaged. Uh, she's going to take, like, the Nazis who took um, Nietzsche and Wagner as her content. Well, she's going to take Bert as her content and massage it into some new uh, non-physical manifesto. Okay. Okay. Okay, so <laughs> she, uh, Roxy wanted me to talk about Tetra Management. So this is the background to that. And then... Um, yes, because uh, uh, the, the thing with Sapa is, is he's translating what uh, McLuhan said of men yes. have the same value, yes. and he's the first one that, that dares to go and take things from popular culture, like this type of speech and phrases and cliches and archetypes, and mix it all together, and uh, he, he takes all sound landscapes from, from the environment with samplers, but also with, from media and um, from the musical traditions, he really knew about music. Right. And, and he would now, say he never read, for example, but he did read a lot. 
Uh, yes, and we saw like well that. Uh, the I Masonic books that. got a lot of Masonic books, but I'm sure he he was aware of Tell everything it. that was going. Ike Willis, in my dialogue with Ike Willis about AIDS and Thinkfish, he, he was a close friend, dropped in a lot on Frank in the 80s, and he said there was always books and manuals and technologies there. You know, it was a laboratory. And it's like, Frank, we're going to get into this. The difference between Frank Zappa as the public TV body icon and in the actual Frank Zappa, he discusses that, the difference in this uh, 1984 tome called Them or Us. He talks about the difference. And I'm going to do that. Um, uh, let me see. Yes, and uh, 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 like everybody says he's a big revolutionary innovator, but nobody explains really what's going on from the, from the point of view of the evolution of the media and the environment and uh, why he appeared and why he, what he's doing all this mix and, and, and um, already showing the new hybrid that uh, of the artist scientist that uh, sees all creations as as a type of music right. he was already now, uh, trying to make the new song right and you know the band was called the mothers in 1965 and Radio programmers knew that was a slang term for, uh, you know, a, a, a very uh, good musician or a rough musician or a, a wide open, uh, powerful musician. Else, it can refer to motherfuckers. Uh, so maybe that's what they meant. They, that guy's a motherfucker, and then they compliment his musical ability. So yeah. the radio programmers, when when the uh, company signed him in '65, '66. Um, I think he was signed in November 65, so it was the 50th anniversary month. Um, they said, you've got to change your number, your name. Your record won't get uh, played as Mother's. So they either suggested Mother's Invention or he came up with it. So I'm not sure. The point is, what a perfect name because you might as well just say Marshall McLuhan. To say Mother's of Invention, you're studying the technique of uh, inventing. You're looking at the effects yeah. of invention. You're looking at what comes before invention. The mothers, the birth of invention. It's so appropriate, and he was so lucky to get that name. You know, mothers of invention. Yes. Uh, it's language uh, having its say. So um, we have now oh. of invention. <laughs> Beg your pardon. We we will do the matrix of invention. We are the matrix. magic of invention. Oh, matrix. matrix. The matrix of invention. Matrix, matrix of invention. Yeah. M a t r i x is what you're saying, Roxy. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So, um, um, yeah, it's very interesting. Like, um, this is the first time I've had a chance to have someone else who knows something about music to support my statement of the importance of Zappa. I remember when I used to look at him, pictures of him in the '60s. Uh, he would have a profile picture, and he'd have this long flowing hair. He looked like Mozart, looked like a Beethoven, you know, the cliche we had of these long-haired guys 200 years yeah. ago. He actually, <laughs> there was this guy, a rock musician, but if you had a silhouette of him, he was a, a Mozart. He was a, a Beethoven, a, a Chopin. And that's the, the face he had, you know, and it looked very odd probably to people. Probably so odd, they said, oh, I'm not going to listen to this guy. This is some guy, a classical composer. I don't know why he's in Melody Maker or Rolling Stone, but certainly not a rocker. So I'll ignore that article. And the people, the mass mind always ignores what's really going on, you know, unwittingly. Yeah. So I would like to now develop this whole stuff we're saying by going through the screenplays. And the, yes, is that okay maybe, you guys? Is there any? Um, but maybe you could play the... The first video of the, you're talking in the Zapanale, because there you explain very well this uh, right. Frank Zappa being a tactile artist, and, and because this is being heard by other musicians and people that maybe it's new right. for this environment, okay, I think it's, it's important to have it there. Yeah, so I'll bring up, um, uh, so I have to go over to ironbob.com because 
Uh, yes, in the yes. meantime, I, I would like to say in the preface of the loss of media, Eric McLuhan says, this is new food for thought, and this is a new science. And uh, is that's new food the thing. For that? Yeah. For thought and wow. meditation. <laughs> right. And yeah, this, the new science is the new food for all the bodies. Yes, yeah, and, uh, correct. And that the, anticipates the, what the, we're doing. Where Gary Sapa was talking about last week. Yeah, we we are um, we are a new kitchen here with Iandom and with Carol and Dean and uh, making new uh, new foods. Uh, they're not supplements. They're not um, uh, vitamins or minerals or something extra new to it, and that's why we call them complements. Um, they complete the body and the cellular structure. So um, Ion is predict. Uh, no, uh, Zappa, McLuhan, and Joyce are predicting the new cook, the new kitchen. The new song is partly a new kitchen. So here is the video. Um, let me uh, now. What's happening? This is in August 2011. Uh, ben Watson and I are at the Zappanali in a place in Germany called Bad Doberon. It used to be in East Germany, the Eastern Bloc. Bad Doberon. And near it is Pinamunda, where the Nazi rocket scientists did their rocket experiments before, I guess, and during World War II. So we're into that dark area, which Thomas Pynchon writes about in, in his various novels, in Gravity's Rainbow, especially. So... Um, we there's lots of bands playing Zappa music, and they give us a tent where we can Ben and I can present our verbal uh, critical statement, uh, know-it-alls, uh, you know, stick in the mud intellectuals. That would be how we'd be perceived. And there was so much noise coming from the concert nearby that Ben said, "Let's." I can't, I can't uh, talk with this noise in the background. Nobody hears us. I said, well, fuck that. I'm going to talk. I didn't come all the way over here not to do it because it's a um, band in the background, and the, and, the, and, the, and the band, I think they eventually did stop. So Ben let me speak first. Um, I don't know if he spoke before me, but basically I, I took over. So I hope you hear how I introduce myself to the Zappa fanatics. Uh, what I said led to several of them walking out immediately. <laughs> I think the is my want to do is to insult people, being a manipulation uh, by training, uh, by habit. Um, and knowing it was being taped, I had to preserve it for for the posterity and for my audience here. So I was performing not for them but for the uh, cash flow. So we bring up the uh, – click off this, open the mic. Um, And if uh, it's not so clear, audible, I will ex I'll explain it after. So, have I got everything on? Sound. Uh, yep, sound flower is ready. Okay, let's see if it starts here. There it goes. So just aim that towards us. You see? Okay. <laughs> Okay, so what I'm doing is Ben's uh, wife is there, and uh, I'm showing her how to hold the camera and which way to position it. Um, you know, I, just a side thing. Uh, Walter Bowert said that to me back in 1990. I think he says it on that video up in the cabin in Paradise, New Mexico, or New Mexico and uh, corner of New Mexico to Arizona and whatever else is around there is where this place called Paradise. So now, if I told, I would talk about Zappa to Walter, he wasn't interested. Uh, he didn't have much, he just would say, look, I interviewed Zappa, or, or he, inter yeah, we interviewed him in 1967 for the East Village other, and he thought that we were CIA. That's all he would say. That's all he could say. He never got over that. And he didn't listen <laughs> to Zappa, so he didn't know. So, so here is Walter Bowder, an expert on MK Ultra. And I'd have to tell him that, well, Frank is doing a new form of expose of the new kind of MKUltra. So he didn't, uh, he didn't want to explore Zappa very much. And so 
he says, uh, I had met him. Well, he could have been one of these people if he'd uh, gotten a little more clued into what was going on. But, you know, uh, if I said stuff about Zappa in this big, huge way, he thought it was ridiculous. So there, there I was, walking around being in an invisible environment. My mouth was an invisible environment back then. Okay? So I'm telling Ben, showing Ben's wife how to position the camera, how I would like it. You hear that, Roxy? He says, we think about that talking about music is the next stage. <laughs> That's what we do. We don't play that, but we talk about them. Yes. Oh, is, is that, is that yeah. yeah. Uh, that's part of what Ayun has been saying. It's all about the frequency. And, right. And, and this and understanding of, oh. of the environment, of the Ionic. He's, he's talking all the time about the frequency. Talking, talking about talking yeah. and the effects of talking, not just uh, what the verbal meaning is. So Ben's right on there. He says, we, I like the way he says, we think it's the next phase, talking. <laughs> After consuming music, so great statement by Civil ben. Civilization <laughs> phase number three. What'd you say? Phase number three. Phase number three, right? Okay, I just yeah. move it back a bit. Here we go. And you guys, I didn't mute you, so you guys got to be quiet. Next stage after music. Because I frequently interrupt Bob, I promised him to give it. Jesus, he says it's the next stage after music. Music in general. That's pretty fucking amazing. <laughs> the, next phrase, the next phase of art is talking. <laughs> and definitely I'm the greatest talker going today uh, for my quad. He was channeling oh. I am. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Ben, Ben's not even going to talk, but he knew what he'd hoped to do, but he doesn't like the conditions. <laughs> hey, <laughs> he he hates Ion. That's the thing. Uh, yeah, it's not about only the music. Until now, the all musicians went, went yeah, to the develop that. about the music? Yeah, the, the great musicians, the great composers were just expanding on, on Bach to the most. Yes. But then Zappa, it's the new hybrid of uh, infiltrating the popular culture, high culture, all technologies and erasing all boundaries and showing the new ground. That's the thing. Yeah, Zappa is probably the first composer. I've heard many people say that. They, you know, on YouTube, there's many, uh, many appearances by Frank on C-SPAN and interviews. They, they don't talk about his music. They say, I love, Frank. I love listening to him talk. That's what they say. <laughs> I mean, his reputation has come back in a new way thanks to YouTube, where people have never heard him, never got involved with him, but just happened to, maybe because I advised them to, they start listening to his interviews and they're very impressed. Hey, Karen, your that thing is beeping over there. So, uh, um, uh, so this is what Ben agrees. We're Zappophiles, Zappaists, Zappatists. We're saying talking is the next art. That doesn't mean uh, talking uh, that everybody does on talk shows and blah, blah, blah. It's a new kind of talking. That's required, and Frank was a, a prophet of it. Have you, are you noticing what I'm doing there? I'm claiming yeah. that Zappa said in 1971, what you guys all know, when the moon is in 1929, so I start off with a lie. <laughs> <laughs> I'm quoting Lewis in 1929. I'm saying Frank said this in 1971. I'm saying no one noticed that Frank said it. Everybody missed it. And even there, Ben doesn't even notice that I'm, I'm lying. This is, this is awesome. I forgot I did this. <laughs> okay, so uh, we'll carry on. Dynamic there, there's a four-way interplay of relationships there. You got monarchism and his Marxism. Anarchism in his healthy passion for order, and he's a communist sometimes, fascist at other times. Now, the hidden pattern for this is the uh, sensory interplay known as tactility. Tactility is not the sense of touch. It's the interplay of the senses, not a particular sense in itself. And the main pattern for the electric environment is the extension of the tactile sense, an interplay, not any particular senses. So what we have, thanks to Ben, 
He pointed out to me once that the renaissance of the 1920s was painting. That was the revolutionary form, got a lot of attention. In reaction to movies, radio, and automobiles, and newspapers. So we can see the 20s were emphasizing the I. The I was the first reaction to the interplay of electric tactility. Then we have the next revolution, Ben points out, in the 60s, where it shifts to the ear. Rock music, avant-garde music, all kinds of experiments with sound around ear. That was the ear's response, a familiar sense, as people encountered the tactile interplay of the global theater, which means satellite, computers, radio, newspaper, television, and the beginning of the digital. That interplay retrieved a renaissance in ear experience, just like the 20s retrieved a renaissance in eye experience. Now, Ben has wondered what comes next. Well, with the digital computer world, where people actually have a chance to speak back to the media that's presented to them, it's not a one-way broadcasting situation, that essentially is a tactile interplay, but with more and more consumer control of what the content of that interplay is. So we have that tactility becomes a figure in the 80s and 90s until now. Think of this interacting by uh, digital extensions and the digital extended people playing with the eye and all the archive of media that the eye created in the 20th century, mixing with the archive of media around the ear, and then newspapers, and then books, and video images. So this whole mixture that people can start to edit and play with since the 90s is technically itself becoming the form of response to whatever you call this weird media world that people have been in for 30 years. So I see that the third renaissance is the retrieval of tactility itself since the 90s, where people can play with any sensory modality and have a sense of editing themselves and have a sense of autonomy. The autonomy happened more in Web 2.0 than it did in Web 2.0 or 1.0. So in this tactile situation that we have extended all around us over the last 25 years, I propose that Frank Zappa was not an eye man he was not an ear man, he was a tactile man. And he could use any form of experience and call it music. He could compose with his ashtray. Now when you look at his statement in Hot Rats, this movie for your ears, 1969, he is still reacting to the ear dynamic of the 60s, but he has a heavy visual bias, being a, an artist himself, a designer, drawing since he was a kid drawing his scores, there's Frank reacting to the tactile environment, but it apparently seems that he's a musician working with visual editing schemes. You can see this in his interview with uh, Barry Miles in the International Times Magazine, August, September 1969. That's a good explanation of phase, but little, little people realize that Frank was going to drop the mothers, move into a new phase in the 70s. You have this lull in, uh, with the turtles, producing more theatrical events, which is another part of high visual culture. Does that for a year and a half or so. Then he has his accident. And then he comes bursting forth in 73 and 74, featuring work with video. He was hoping to get on the uh, Playboy channel the, the piece called The Token of My Extremes. Now here's Frank beginning to play with interactivity and to wake up not the eye or the ear around the movie dynamic or even the radio dynamic, he's moving into tactility as presented by television and that's where Bruce Bickford comes in. Any baby snake or any Bickford production is nothing but fluidity, metaphorizing and metamorphing and playing with all the sensory dynamics of his clay work. Now the, the shifting and mutating is the best the eye can see of tactility. You can't see the interplay of sensory work known as tactility, but the best expression of that is constant movement shifting, shape shifting almost, that Bruce Bickford presented. So there's a whole new aesthetic that Frank is presenting in, uh, in the 70s, featured and emphasized around Bruce Bickford. And he also gets more fluid in the way he, as Ben calls it, his corporate rock phase in the 70s and early 80s. 
then what does Frank do? In the 80s, he moves into digital work, retreats from active performance, and starts playing with what he called digital dust. Now he's really getting into technology, but it's a virtual form of technology. So that's what I'm proposing here, that the way to understand Frank is conceptual, philosophical background to the degree there could be any, since any form of human expression would be the content of his presentation. The actual form is the tactile interplay of anything for, what is that open? Um, anything available anywhere, blah, 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 God, composition, board, remember 1969, that book, the first one, the NSC of Soul, any time, any with no excuses. I can't remember it either. Can you not be anything, any time, not anywhere. No, 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 no. Yeah. Any available medium, the big note, God. He says, it lists all the same. A couple of big things. That's his first mixed media statement from 1969. It's in Dave Wally's book. It came out in the early 70s. The point is that we see that the revolution of the last 30 years, the extension of tactility itself, Frank was in the foreground of that. This is how you understand Frank in the 70s and the 80s and 90s is Frank, the tactile engineer, more and more making tactility the metaphor for how he saw what was happening to everybody. He's not an eye man anymore, he's not an ear man. Now, there's a very good quote uh, by Carl Rege, who, discussing James Joyce's Ulysses, said something. This is how I adapt that quote. Carl Rege's quote would apply to this, to Frank, at least in the early 70s period. A heap of dung, crawling with musicians, photographed by a television apparatus through a microscope. Okay? That quote, done 60 years before, let's say, by Carl Radick, who died in 1947, killed in a gulag or whatever. Um, that quote leads to the point, Ben has discussed the movie Two Animal Tales as about rubbish. Now, Ben likes to point out Theodore Adorno as a conceptual parallel to Zappa. I propose Marshall McLuhan, because Marshall McLuhan was the philosopher who explained tactility and how it was extended to television. So if you look at Marshall's work, Frank did not play with time. He discussed decorating time, but that was not really what he was doing. He was shaping time, in other words, shaping space. And this is where Ben brings up the word isoplastic, a shaping of things into one. That is exactly what tactility could be, a shaping of all the senses, all the senses in a coherent sense of consciousness. That what you see is organized by your tactile interplay. So the organizing of spaces that the different senses create, the playing of the ear space, the eye space, and then later the tactile space, is the essence of Frank's agenda. So that you can include these ideas, these phrases. Frank Zappa makes people dumb. He does that with cellular signaling. He is used, he does not focus on the univocal approach or drive bias. And every Zappa concept, percept, and musical rhythm comes from Finnegan's Wake. Finnegan's Wake is the first book that is full blown tactile in print. You cannot read with your eyes Finnegan's Wake. You can mix your senses, eye, ear, touch, smell, and kinesis, with Finnegan's Wake, and then you get the rhythm of it. There's so much of what Frank did in uh, the 70s and 80s as a translation of the dynamics of Phineas Wake. Uh, ben wrote recently that, no, maybe this is 2008, he wrote that, um, that me, Bob Dobbs, has the advantage of recognizing that Frank Zappa is the James Joyce of electronic media. That's a very accurate statement if you understand electronic as a tactile apparatus, playing with all the senses and their extensions. When you get into um, some of the theatrical elements uh, like cyborg or the robotic or uh, some of the uh, virtual characters in um, Nemorus, that's being played, you start to see Frank working not just with the senses, but whole landscapes of technology. And the digital, the Sinks Library was the best way to do that. And I think if you look at the cover of Civilization Phase 3, you see a big rock. You see UFOs, sort of things coming in. You see a, a photo of New York City. 
you see what else, Ben? You, you see Roman stuff. It's a mixture of landscapes. And so it is, has a patina of blackness. Because Marshall McLuhan said, since tactility is not a color, the only way you can present tactility visually is use the image of black. Black is the absolute well, color. My perception of phase three is it's all Egyptian, it's scarabs, um, pyramids. I don't see much other civilization. It seems to be almost entirely Egyptian. No, you see the, uh, I live in New York City, you recognize the aerial view of New York City embedded in the cover. But yeah. Egyptian is very, that's relevant now. Yeah. Marsh McLuhan said that the pharaohs, they shape whole cultures. He said the art of the 20th century tends back towards the Egyptian. Now this is very interesting how young Frank Zappa, I mean, he was born 30 years after Marsh McLuhan, but many of Frank's ideas were like a popular translation of Marsh McLuhan, even though Frank did not have that detailed acquaintance of Marsh McLuhan. He had read a couple of his books, and then nobody talked about it with other than me, but he picked up on the tactility and the Egyptian nature. This is the, the deepest Aurelius mode. The Egyptian takes, the Egyptian art takes the whole environment and programs it. Frank's international, uh, intercontinental absurdities, United Mutations, and his uh, emperor aristocratic uh, Demir was him processing the whole range of content in the global theater, just as Joyce had been his way, just as Burroughs tried to do. Frank was the only one doing it as if everybody got consumed and absorbed into Frank's dynamic. That is what Bloom said, an Egyptian style of art, programming the whole world. So the, now, I don't know if Frank knew as Mark and McCone said that, but again, he picked up on the point about it being Egyptian, programming the whole environment. And that is what I call a satellite conductor. The popular mythology. Two minutes? I'm going to come in soon. Okay. The, um, this is what I do. I work fan up. And just ask to start swinging, you know, so it's coming close. I'll just, I have, I have other parts I'll develop later. But to end, I'll quote T.S. Eliot's definition of the auditory imagination. And I'll put in Zappa's name. What I call Frank Zappa is the feeling for syllable and rhythm penetrating far below the conscious levels of thought and feeling, invigorating every word, sinking to the most primitive and forgotten, returning to the origin of bringing something back, seeking the beginning and the end. It works through meaning, certainly, or not without meanings in the ordinary sense, and fuses the old and obliterated, and the trite, the current, and the new and surprising, the most ancient, Egyptian, and the most civilized men mentality, Los Angeles. That is the auditory imagination which had become ordinary awareness, McLuhan said, by 1970. What was not ordinary awareness was the imagination of Phineas Way. But Frank started to sculpt that in the 70s, 80s, 90s. Okay, he's starting very I don't want to compete for the music on the stage, and this is going to be too hard, so... Mr. Bob Dobbs, thank you very much. I'll compete against the stage. <laughs> yeah, they're just fiddling around, giving that ego thing of musicians, like showing that they can tune their instruments for us. Um, Okay, what an awesome statement. I, I can yes. see you. Uh, it's fucking incredible what I said there. And, and Ben sitting there, I'm not sure if I'm reading his face right, but he's not used to having someone else talk and dominate beside him. And he's sitting there like gritting his teeth the whole uh, 16 minutes. <laughs> and then he refuses to say anything at the end because somebody's tuning up in the background. But uh, uh, I guess we, the recording stopped. Uh, his wife stopped the recording at that point. I, I guess not much was said, but... Man, that is a coherent statement. It's incredible. Yeah. We'll have to yes, and, and the, transcribe it. The amazing thing for me was to to see how that connected to your chart. Uh, yeah. There is this uh, transcription. You can go to Ion and Bob to the memo to Prince Charles and. Uh, 
is uh, from the Revelation uh, uh, transcription in which I am it's, it's saying the tiny chart it's it's uh, the angel perspective of of what Bob is explaining and um, he says Bob actually influenced Zappa in his concept of the big note because he Zappa had the big note and Bob has the tiny note and and for me I just to read that I was like <laughs> uh, <laughs> because uh, since since Zion appeared, he he started to point out the importance of the chart and and what's on the chart is part of the of the revelation John was trying to bring forth, and this is the ionic aspect of what we are <clears throat> talking about here that. Um, this was showing the the new environment coming with the ionic technologies. Was right. The, Did you say young meaning Carl say, Young. Sorry. You, you said young meaning Carl Young. You said June. Carl Young, mm. the psychologist. Mm, no. Oh, okay. <laughs> no. Um, but the. <laughs> When you say Revelation, you're talking about the book of Revelation, and it's singular, book of Revelation. Uh, Ian says, and, and what she's reading from is a transcript of a postgraduate seminar that Ian was running uh, for rewrite number, session number five, November 17, 2010. So this is being said many months before, almost a year before I, I go to Bad Dobron and say this to the Zappa public. And I, I'll have to tell you the environment. It's a tent. There are people at a bar behind us. There are people walking around. I don't know if there was more than two people listening. People were talking, engaging, and uh, it's interesting how they are so involved in what they're talking to. They, they don't seem concerned that this other thing is going on. They don't look over and say, why are those two guys sitting there in the middle of the tent talking? Who are they talking to? There's no curiosity. So uh, we even show in this video a post-information society. I'm there making this astounding uh, communication to the Zappa fans, and uh, you know, not too many are paying attention to it. So, there's a uh, is that a PR problem? Do I have to shoot somebody <laughs> to get the, get somebody's attention? <laughs> Bob, did some people ask you leave when you started off? Yes, when I, my people? insulting statement, I said, my opening statement was, never have I seen so many stupid people celebrating a stupid composer and having such a great time. Yay! <laughs> and, and, and then immediately I saw three guys in the back get up and walk out. And occasionally there's an occasional person after that, but those three guys walked out with a sense of incomprehension or being pissed off. You know, either one. They, they weren't going to put up with that kind of statement. But it was an incredible statement. I was actually complimenting them. I was saying, yeah, we're, they're proving here that stupid people can have a good time. <laughs> Never have seen so many stupid people celebrating such a stupid composer and having a great time at it. So I covered myself. I didn't. I sort of put in a contradictory emotion by saying, "Hey, you guys are having a good time. It's it's nice." But um, so in that context, this amazing statement, and uh, and Ben for the first time has to shut up for ten minutes. Man, was he gritty his teeth. Uh, that's how his facial expression looks. He may not be, but. Um, and, you know, he goes on later to disagree with me. He, I don't think – Ben doesn't get it. And uh, Kevin Currier wrote a book on Zappa called The Dangerous Kitchen, and he objects to uh, Ben's book, which is, I find, a, a really good, stimulating book. Uh, but, you know, I can tolerate all kinds of depth because I know so much. So uh, the average Zappa fan hates Ben's book, and they don't think it has anything to do with Zappa. But Ben's talking about Wyndham Lewis and James Joyce and Phineas Wake. So Kevin Currier said – Ben doesn't understand American culture. Growing up in England, they just don't get the subtleties that um, Zappa is talking about. So he objected to that part of Ben's book. And I said, well, the man you used to uh, explain Frank, who understood American culture and lived it, was Marshall McLuhan. And I said, I, I think I should do something. He goes, do it. 
Do it. It has got to be done. It's incredible. <laughs> we can knock off Ben. We, we must knock off Ben as the uh, uber intellectual guy. Come up with a better thing. And I forgot that I actually said that right in front of Ben. I said, Ben talks about the Frankfurt School and Theodore Adorno. I think McClellan is a better uh, explainer of Frank. And then I proceed to do it. But I said that right in front of him. So maybe that's why he looked pissed off. But um, it's actually interesting that we're supposed to do a joint panel, and he doesn't say anything. That's what's happened. The past 20 years, I'm the only guy who can talk. Nobody else can talk about what's going on intelligently or perceptively. And so no matter whatever I showed up, I'm the Donald Trump. Everybody shuts up, and Bob throws his <laughs> perceptive insults all around the room, and everybody doesn't, nobody says anything. Just let Bob do. So Ben was showing that there was no audience for me. Even he wouldn't interact with me. Uh, so, again, the monologue continues <laughs> until we met Roxy. And then Roxy actually can actually dialogue and actually knows more than I do in certain areas that prove my case, which is what Ben's complimenting her about. So congratulations to all of you. Ben for noticing it and Roxy for doing it and me for creating it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but, uh, uh, for me, it's, it's amazing how all these pieces of this big puzzle fall together and fit together. And because we have this tradition of grammarians explaining the Bible, trying to understand the book, trying to to understand what God is, and, and also in the laws of media, they they talk about how optics were very important because uh, the scientists wanted to understand what we were talking about, about the glory, about the light, and uh, these first things that made the creation, the word at the beginning was the word, and, and the light, were like the the motivation for all these people to go and try to understand this thing we call God. The light in the book. Yeah, in the book of Scripture, yeah. trying to read the light in the Word. And, uh, and uh, actually, we ended up in this situation of fragmentation in which science refuses to acknowledge the non-physical. And... and, and right. They're starting to to get into points like parallel worlds and and uh, the particles and into genetic in which they somehow to go further have to to recognize the non physical because otherwise there is no more progress and and this is what uh, McLuhan saw. Yeah. There is this new science performed. in which there is no more Edit. fragmentation. Everything is synesthetic, tactile, simultaneous. And uh, yeah, Sapa was uh, already a tactile, uh, post literate artist, and, and Bob is, is also. I'm a post literate tactile talker. <laughs> a little non-physical. Rob <laughs> A little non-physical. <laughs> a tactile talker. Um, uh, well, the thing is, there, we are expanding is. into not making any more paintings or music. It's, it's, it's a new environment. And, and it's funny how now that it's already the post-literate age. Uh, for example, the the West are defending the values of the enlightenment of the people that wanted to have all the knowledge in an encyclopedia, a collection of books, and, right. and are fighting against the, the one-book people. It's like the manuscript a, people. Call them manuscripts. Yes. The Muslims are <laughs> devoted to a manuscript culture. Yes, it's the, the, um, the retrieval of the crusade and uh, yes. But Julian always, he talked many times about uh, the new crusade. And he would say the crew, like the crew in a plane or in a ship yeah. and crusade. And uh, it's funny how the day in which the Templars 
order was dissolved was uh, Friday the 13th. It was the same date as the Paris attacks and uh, the dissolution of the Templars was um, called by the King of France. I think it was Philippe Le Quatrième, yeah. the fourth. <laughs> and uh, right. it's, it's, uh, it's very interesting how these things it's are like a retrieval of, of this uh, situation where now oh, the possibility and the new environment coming forth and uh, people trying to okay, make sense this, of what solving the, the <laughs> thing, the environment they know. Yeah, uh, no, I think John Delay. Do you hear me a bit on delay, Roxy? No. 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 So you hear me as I'm speaking. When I'm trying to interrupt you, you don't, you uh, hear me trying to interrupt you. Yeah, she's just on a roll. No, but I, I don't stop. <laughs> no, that's all right. <laughs> yeah, no, that's okay. I, I'm trying to let you go, uh, but sometimes uh, I have an idea, then you'll bring in another interesting idea, and I'll forget the previous one like I'm doing now, but I think I just remembered it. The, I don't know if you heard a couple months ago, the Everine said there are 600-year cycles. That's the basic yes. cycle in the universe, 600 years. Well, the Templars were wiped out in 1307. And 600 years later, it comes up to 1907, 1908, 10. That's when Wyndham Lewis comes back to London. But it's now uh, 100 years after that. But I'm saying the 600-year uh, the, um, cycle is from the massacre of the Templars on Friday the 13th, and then you have uh, the Paris thing. And it, it is a, an operation happening in Paris in 1307. You know, it's the same country. So maybe the 600-year cycle um, is applicable here to your pattern, Roxy, because it may not be actually 1307. Ian says our calendars are all screwed up and not accurate at all. So it may be actually 600 years from a couple of weeks ago and back 600 years to whenever that was in the 1300s or 1200s approximately, whatever it was, could have been more precisely than the numbers indicate. You know, 1307 and 2007 is 700 years. Anyways, uh, it's interesting. It's 600 yes, and, years. And also, uh, the President Hollande, uh, yeah. was like an homage to the victims of the uh, attacks. And he said, La musique est insupportable terroriste. The, the music is insupportable to the terrorists, and, and, and they, they make a big deal that they attacked their culture, and this uh, concert hall that is 200 years old. So, uh, what did you? I found it. Did you say you, you're saying the, the I, music? I uh, music is, musical, is not musical. Music is music, terrorism. Is that what you? Is that what he said? Music is terrorism. I don't no, think he said no, that. that but, uh, no, what, I didn't get what you said. Cannot stand the music. It's Paris cannot stand the music. Yeah, that uh, it's like uh, it's an attack of, on on the culture, on the music. Of music? Are you saying on music? Yes. Uh, yeah. the, he said that, like uh, they're attacking the the values of the. Encyclopedias, the Enlightenment. And, uh, they okay, make well, here's something that's not real. said. These, these, that guy, you know, the guy, one of the terrorists, and his girlfriend was the, uh, was the one that they blew up a couple days later. Um, there's the young kids. How about the fact that those fucking guys were on Prozac? We say American snipers, hey, listen to this, Carol, American snipers, American high school terrorists, are on Prozac and, and drugs like that. What if these guys were on Prozac? No one ever would think of that. They, they just think they're just a manic bunch of barbarians from another world. But maybe they're on uh, meds and they didn't take their meds that day and they went nuts. What do you think uh, of that? No, they're on religious Spots. drugs. Well, uh, there, there was an article in, in the German press that um, maybe combination. they are on a, on a drug called Captagon. Uh, it's a, it's um, amphetamine. Oh, and, they, so um, they did name a drug. They did name a drug. Yes, uh, they used it in, in combat um, to combat. be, uh, yeah, to 
to be able to become braver to be braver and to have the energy to combat for longer periods and, and they're in this state of aggression it's very exciting right right like speed it's called cap tap on uh, like Right, but it's like speed in the 60s. Uh, musicians would take speed to be touring. So, Carol, is that one with fluoride in it? Do you know how no, to... it's, it's, um, it is an amphetamine, but also a theophylline, which is, sort of pumps up the lungs. So it's a double drug, and who knows what a double drug will do, but no fluoride <clears throat> in it, but it's still pretty um, mm, stimulating. And dangerous? Huh? Would you say dangerous? Would you give it to somebody? Well, you know, a lot of women uh, used, used to take amphetamine speed to uh, lose weight. Mm. You know, it makes you very hyper. So, that, yeah, that's interesting that there is. There yeah, was a medical a- aspect to it. Right. And um, did the guy, they showed this guy, he, he, he said he stood around and watched, and then he went back to Afghanistan and then, or went someplace, and then he came back in. But I think later, he got killed, right? He eventually got caught. No, they're still looking for him, Bob. They're still looking the for him. The main one they show with the long name, yes. you know, many A's and B's in it. They haven't got him, eh? No, they're still looking for him. Right. And, and the woman who got blown up was his wife or girlfriend or something. Did you know that? Yes, that's what they're claiming. Yeah. But yeah. Even they're in also- Wiki, they're... Sorry, Bert. Even in Wiki, they talk about this drug, uh, Captagon, as being a drug playing a central role in the Syrian civil war. In Syria? It's made in Syria, yeah. Wow. Oh, wow. Wow. So this is well known in in Berlin journalism, right? You you, you read this several times, Roxy? Yes, it's everywhere. And, um, so there, even, even uh, a successful terrorist, you got to be on medication. Yeah. <laughs> it's a prerequisite. Yeah, it's a tough profession. That, you know, it uh, can't be healthy. That's what uh, yeah, well, um, Park expanded the uh, definition of what is an artist by McLuhan. He said the artist has to bring balance into this new situation that causes yes. discomfort because they are the only ones that can see before everybody else what's coming. And with the work of art, people start to to see and understand and, and it sort of changes the, the sensibility of the yes. group. And it's a type of medicine, uh, like uh, a type of massage. A type and, uh, of what? Yeah, massage and medicine. Yeah. Yeah. The new it's food. Reiki. Yeah, the, the knowledge of the, 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 the science. You look at a book of Finning its Wake, and it's exactly what Marshall says. The artist is aware of new changes in our sensory ratios long before anybody else does because they're tuning in at least um, semi-consciously into the effects of the new environment. Back when he's writing, you know, in the 20s and 30s, he's writing Finning its Wake, which looks like a chaotic book. But it wasn't even a book. He was showing digital culture, the world of Instagram and email and uh, instant communication, which would show up 100 years later. He actually painted what was coming. I mean, that's a pretty amazing technical achievement that someone to yes. paint the future. I mean, and the book can only be understood now. Um, so um, Zappa in music is somebody that they didn't know what he was doing. And he was expressing the, the present hypertactility and, and maybe ion. He's predicting the ionic. Now, uh, Roxy posted this incredible video I'd never seen before of Zappa conducting in Paris in December 15, 1970, and showing his technique real close up. It's really good footage. It's on, uh, on the, uh, it's on the, you're a fellow musician on the stage watching Frank direct you. And the way he moves his hands around. So, uh, I coined this phrase inspired by Frank, hand signals for the blind. I made a play called hand signals for the blind in the, in the early 80s. And um, I had the play, it was sort of like discussing the different, what I call holy offices, McLuhan, 
beat her, everybody. And uh, I, at the end of it, the punchline is Zappa gets recognized as the most relevant present-day holy office. So I give the Oscar to uh, Zappa. And as I read these screenplays, it's justified. Um, one main point is that he's using an instrument, the electric guitar, consciously as a, a composing tool, but he's using an instrument that is the instrument of the day. If you want to get to the masses, you've got to use what yes. they can do and uh, what they are, are into. And, and McLuhan couldn't play the guitar. LaRouche doesn't play the guitar. That's the advantage Frank has. He's right there in the, the present, the invisible present, and sculpting it with his guitar abilities. And he's, he's pretty well the best guitarist that we've ever heard. Not everybody agrees with that statement because they have different ideas of what a guitarist would do. But the fact that Zappa doesn't rehearse doesn't play and practice and then every couple of years goes out and then does this incredible guitar which is based on talking in the moment conversationally that's how he's playing he's doing guitar as conversation so he didn't have to rehearse musical technique because he was going to have to um, play what he's talking in his mind that's why you wouldn't rehearse it right he has to talk it's like right now i don't know what i'm going to say next but based on what you say that'll evoke something so the environment of the concert of the audience in a particular day determine the kind of conversation Frank was going to do through his music, through his guitar. Improvisation. Oh, that's Improvisation. Pretty, yeah. It's impro and, and referring back to program pre-planned stuff. He, he was juggling yeah. both. You, you know, the signals that the guys followed orders on certain parts, and then there was other areas where they could improvise. But he didn't favor one or the other. Yes, and uh, I, I was listening to one of remember the name, I never remember names, but um, <laughs> he would say part of the job of being in, in the mothers of inventions is that you have to entertain Zappa. And he will promote yeah. any type of idea that you will have to make the performance entertaining. But right. the, they had to entertain the conductor, actually. They were not <laughs> really thinking about the the audience, <laughs> and uh, he said, when when you wow. have a silence, you have to come up with something because he will not allow you to just stand there and count <laughs> the bars you are not going to yeah. play. You have to do something. You have to make something funny, act, dance to some movement, whatever, and then be there yeah. on time and do what you have to do, and also yeah. be there if he makes a sign or something and, and you have to perform a solo or whatever and uh, I found that very interesting and another thing he said is uh, he would also like this part of this type of entertainment um, they had to make quotes of things they knew from their classical jazz or from Bob, or, yeah, they had to make quotes and, and, and insert them as uh, jokes, as very sophisticated types of joy, jokes. Right. And Frank would recognize, for example, oh, he's playing Holst or Stravinsky, or, and, right. and he will find that very funny, that uh, they were putting all these quotes, like you say, they're, they're speaking. Yes. And, and they're um, quoting. I've never seen that said. What interview is that in? Where did you read that? Or did he say it on the recording? There is a documentary called Freak Out. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's in there, right? Yeah. All right. Yes. I again. think it's in there. Yeah, I mean, he's training them to be comprehensive like himself. To, um, and this is what Carolyn Gordon talks about, the remix culture. They must remix what they know and apply it in a new situation or the cultural references that they can uh, make fun of or supplement or praise. I mean, uh, he was turning them into mini Zappas. So that's what he was doing. <laughs> yes, and for example, there, there is this cadence. It's called the Alleluia cadence that is used for religious music for ending, yeah. like to say Alleluia. And uh, yeah. he will allow this type of, of uh, formulas only as jokes, you know, right. like, okay, you're, you're doing this uh, formula, but it's a joke. 
but he, he will not allow the musicians to to just use these formulas to to play they they have to to go beyond explore possibilities of their instruments uh, all in in all ways in, in the melody in the rhythm in the sound textures what they could produce and um, was this particular yeah, to the uh, was this particular only Roxana was this particular only to the mother's invention or all of Frank's bands which you were describing all, all the bands all, all the bands <laughs> wow yeah. wow it's high quality and dream maybe not so the mother's invention uh, he eventually dropped them because they weren't skillful enough to do the new demands that the 70s were bringing in that's part of the reason uh, he broke them up is that he had new complexities and they couldn't read music and they weren't as good as the later musicians that came, you know. And so I don't know if he demanded them others. There's some of it. I mean, he did have Roy Estrada do doo-wop. He was a doo-wop singer, so he'd make fun of that. But as he got more and more amazing musicians, uh, he could draw on their training, on their background. I mean, the first guys in the mothers were um, working-class guys who... Um, didn't have much education, just were good singers and musicians, Jimmy Carl Black and uh, Roy Estrada. So they had no musical training, but they had the pop culture down of the world that Frank came out of, you know, doo-wop and R&B. So they Gee. could play off and improvise on that. But once um, Frank had better instruments and more complex compositions, he required more, more training in his musicians. And, and the other thing was he by liked the, music, all types of music, and he was not into oh this is classic, this is jazz, this is this, and this is that. Right. He he liked any type of music, I think. Well, I just read where he explains um, he saw the R and B guys when he was young having great fun. He saw some classic musicians having great fun, and so he said, "What's the difference? The the key is to have fun. If you're having fun, then you're a valid creation. You know." and uh, not some boring, uh, dogmatic thing. So the classical guys were equal to the R&B as long as they were having fun. Um, that was another point. Oh, yeah, here's something that people don't know, is that another factor that got musicians in the band is their name. Uh, so <laughs> Frank, had a neighbor, had a, Frank had a neighbor uh, in Lancaster when he was in high school named Denny Wally. And Denny Wally was a musician, so he knew Frank since they were teens. But it wasn't until many years later that Denny Wally got to play in Frank's band. But the reason Denny Wally, one reason he would get in there, the, the subliminal uh, puppetry that Frank was doing is that he wanted to make fun of David Wally, who wrote the first book on Zappa and had a falling out with Frank. So Denny Wally gets in the band because it evokes the uh, the whole drama with Dennett, David Wally. All right? Same last name. The the sergeant, the cop in Cucamonga that busted uh, Frank uh, for that fake bullshit porno tape was a guy named Sergeant Willis. Well, that's why Ike Willis got in the wow. band. <laughs> wow. Is that incredible? And there's a couple That's other incredible. examples I don't have right in my mind. That's what he was doing. He, in other words, there was, it's like Finney's Wake. There's a lot of biographical stuff in Finney's Wake, but you can't, you have to really know Joyce's life to find it and see it. But it's only one level. It's like having your chemical body in there. And then you have your TV body, which would be making fun of musical fads, like the Beatles. And then you have your chip body, which would be this digital tactility of hyper or whatever, uh, maybe electronic stuff. Uh, the different bodies are in Frank's work as they are in, uh, in, in Finney's Wake. And so the story of Frank's life and his own synchronicity in his life of names showing up again would be a pattern that he would include. And you would have a, an advantage over someone else if you had a name that Frank had already encountered in his life. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's like these, uh, the, the things at the end of the movies or TV programs, if somebody... Critics, yeah. It's uh, similar to a real person. It's just a coincidence. Right. You, what about at the end of the movie? You mean the credits? Something yeah, the credits sometimes they, they put this, this um, <laughs> sign, like any similarity to a real-life character yeah. is a coincidence. 
Yeah, I don't think Frank says that at the end of his movies. There's lots of similarities to real and living people that he intends. So it's, it's like that. Frank... Yeah, it's like his, like, his like, each song, like, each like, album was like a collage. Okay, first of all, what what are you saying, uh, Roxy? <laughs> Sorry, no, I just said uh, he he liked to play with that, like uh, in two hundred motels, the band is his band and Ringo is Zappa. Yes, Ringo, that's right. And then what were you saying, Bert? I would say he, it seems like. With, what you just laid in there that uh, about Wally and Lewis, I mean or Willis, is that it's almost like his song, each album or each part was like a collage of so many different elements that he wanted to project onto the audience yeah, or anyone. He, it's a collage reading. of levels. It's a collage yeah. <laughs> of levels, which can reference to multisensory synesthesia, to technical environments, to sociological patterns. Countries like yeah. Lewis in this book, um, Tar, came out in like 1918. The characters represent countries, and he was and he was showing uh, how World War One happened by the clash of the Russian and the French and the German and the British. And so he would show that clash among the artists in this novel, and the artist is set before World War One, right? So each person, each character represented a a, a corporate entity. A, uh, a nation, a tribe. So um, he that's really, part of modernism. He was, really was a general, a, a strategic. He's very strategic. I mean, just to put that little quirk on someone who wrote a bad article about him to uh, <laughs> inviting the guy into the band is just like a, a left hook, you know. Ah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Like, like Frank, Frank had incredibly talented people auditioning to be in his band. All kinds of people wanted to play with Frank. It was like an honor. It would be great to have on your resume. And also, you could get known. If you got in the band and travel around for a couple of years, you'd be seen. So, um, but Frank says, I don't care about your talent. You have to have a sense of humor. You have to have some eccentricity. And he didn't say it. And you've got to have the right name. <laughs> you know, it's, it's like to help you. You know, because there were lots of good singers probably competing with Ike Willis, but he had the name. And so he got picked. And uh, then Ike, I'm not saying Ike, you know, was not worthy of being in the band. It was only because of his name. He was uh, very talented anyways, but he had that extra little accident of nature, the accident of language. Um, I mean, look, look at the name Zappa. What, what is a word that dominates the 60s? Everybody over as the 60s unfold, they all talk about being zapped. Zap, you know, that, that became part of the language in the global theater. Everybody's being zapped. And here's this guy with the name Zappa who, who, who did zapping <laughs> kind of music. <laughs> he, had the, he had the dilemma himself or the stigma. And we have the apps after Zappa. Oh, yeah, good point. After Z, the last letter in the alphabet, then you have the apps. And then you have the PA, which is anthropomorphic physical, backwards. Actually, it's not backwards. It's just you go in the opposite direction. You, uh, it's a uh, anodyne. What do you call those things? Uh, anagrams that go back. B-O-B is one of these. Enneagrams, yes. The term. Ana what? Enneagram. Enneagram. No, no, that's good. Enneagramma. This is... Oh. Is it a Anagramma. Be acronym? <laughs> Anagramma might be it, but it's not the word I'm thinking of. There's a simpler word. Um, uh, just a minute. Uh, Bert, talk to Roxy. I've got to do something. Okay. <laughs> she is, uh, so. And uh, I think it's, it's really amazing how artists are prophetic, like uh, Nostradamus, because in a way they knew how to use the laws of media, the tetra-management, and this, how Bob was sent to infiltrate McLuhan and, and Zappa, and, yeah. and uh, also, for example, uh, when we were listening to the audience that, that week, Bob was so yeah. prophetic, <laughs> because it's, it's a way of, of seeing the new ground that is coming. Yeah, and maybe we, we can explain this 
idea of the ground in, in the Gestalt theory. There is this figure, is what is in the foreground, and, and the background is the ground. It's like in a painting. You have the character, for example, in a portrait, and that's the figure, and behind is the background, the ground. And uh, McLuhan went to explore the ground of media, and he said it's not important what the content is. The ground is what is affecting us, and it's affecting the yes. environment. And, I, I uh, enjoyed I enjoyed Bob's statement. He he said in that uh, with the Zappa alley that Frank Zappa is like the modern took the modern version of what McLuhan was doing because he really presented a lot of uh, a lot of material that was shake that was presenting the figures of what was going on at the time in the 60s and 70s and it's, it shows why he was outlawed on the on the so-called uh, popular media landscape because he was very very he presented a lot of teaching tools for those who you know, we're going with the. It was like an anti-environment. He was more of an anti-environment, just put it that way. Yes, and, and uh, that's part of his style uh, in his yeah. songs. He presents the familiar satire as figure. You know, he has these jokes and this yeah. uh, type of uh, language you see in the radio, TV, and movies. <laughs> that's a figure, and behind. The ground is this complex music, yeah. and the people are digesting this uh, figure on the ground without being aware of the food they're getting. So he will go. He will play with both um, figure and ground to to make his music. And, uh, I, I, I true, think is, he's a genius. Is it also true that he makes totally different pieces of work and somehow programmed it, that it all came out to, to some some form of harmony? Is that true? Well, that's that's what uh, Bob is talking about when he's talking about the synchrony. Yes, because he was mixing all sound landscapes not only from from all medias, from environment, from the musical traditions, all music and genres, but also his own music, he right. would remix and repaste and uh, to create uh, very complex, uh, to be innovative, he, that, that was one of his techniques. He will mix things or, for example, he will take the, the bass of a song and put it with another song uh, or yeah, the rhythm okay, yes. or different tracks. He will, the different tracks that were in different tonalities or in different rhythms. And then he will translate that, to the, transcribe it in a score, and that will be a new, a new thing, uh, much more complex. Was that part of his synclav research? Was that part of his synclav research? Well, uh, that, uh, the synclavier yeah. was an extension of that because it made it easier. At the beginning, he would just, for example, cut and paste with these tapes, like yeah. in the concrete music, or mix different tracks. Oh. Of, for example, something he did in the studio with something he did in, in a concert. Uh, different solos, and not only of the same song, different, complete different songs. So he was uh, getting a remix, a replay of uh, much more complex. Damn. In all in all aspects, but he was yeah. always surprised that instead of being chaotic <laughs> and, and dissonant and it was musical, and, and that, that was his surprise because he said this is a type of alien synchronicity that he could not explain how come things in different tonalities, different rhythms, 
will sound so good and and, and uh, yeah. with the Sinclair he had the opportunity to experiment faster and it was easier because he said he doesn't have to pay the musicians for rehearsals he has all these <laughs> These instruments, these virtual instruments in his um, library of electronic yeah. and samples. And he, he can program all these things. He doesn't have to write the score. He will just put them in and, and he will be able to cut and paste and, and remix and reverse, do all these things we are so familiar now with uh, computers. Uh, and he said, uh, I just need electricity. These musicians never get tired. <laughs> they don't have to rehearse. And, and they, they can do very complex things in tune yeah. and in, in the right tempo. Yeah, I Bert, that, that was a very good explanation by Roxy. Um, yeah. You know, xenochrony means, xeno means strange. So strange synchronization would happen when he didn't intend it. He'd take something from one scene, one harmonic climate, mixed up with an obviously not resonant uh, another harmonic cl climate. Then he'd be surprised to see patterns of complementarity or whatever his standard was. And so it would synchronize. And he was impressed with that. So, and he was trying not to have synchronicity. <laughs> it's like when Ion spoke through so would say the, the track, the track of a solo from one song and put it in a completely different song. Right. It sound great. But it, <laughs> that's right. Now listen to this. So when when uh, Ben talked to Zappa through Ion, uh, Ben was very reluctant. But the main point Ion was saying that Frank was constantly making music that would upset people. He wanted to upset people. He hated it if it became popular. So the very fact that he was looking to create dissonance in a way is shown in this theory of xenarchony. He was trying to create dissonance, and then uh, he wouldn't want it to synchronize, and it would. It strangely would synchronize. So he called that xenarchony, strange synchrony. Mm. Uh, and that's what um, I, I you asked the right it's question. The perfect, the perfect way to, to use technology to make something new, because what, what can you do that is new in music? So yeah. he will go and and, and um, by chance find find things out that he will not uh, uh, do if he was trying to do that uh, aware like uh, he's feeding this machine with information and and, and now we have programs that um, can do all, all types of. Uh, variations of a team, you, you can make all types of, um, for example, baroque music or classical and this, and you just enter some information and the computer programs different variations, or you can enter a, a melody and, and the computer makes the harmony, and you can make a, different types of uh, alterations of, of what the machine is proposing. But he was already doing that with his in clavier. He, he will, but that he did also with his musicians. He will just give some ingredients and then mm -hmm. they had to cook something with that. And he will put these ingredients in the, the machine or from his tapes and then he will mix them and, and have a new recipe, a new, a new song. He was the last great composer, really. I mean, just you sharing that, it's a sign that he really, he used all the different, I mean, he was class, self-taught classically, but then he got into the electronic music and then saw or experienced so much, and he just threw it all in there. Because that, um, the uh, Civilization Phase 3 is amazing, if you listen to it again. I mean, if you listen to it, listen to it. It's, it's, he makes so much in there that you could, each time you listen to it, just like listening to Ion, you, could, you hear something else, just the whole uh, mix. It's amazing. 
Yes, and, and it's like Kayan, he, he has these very serious things going on, very experimental, yeah, but yeah. <laughs> then you hear the lyrics and they're all funny. Yeah. So okay, there, there guys, here's this, something. Yeah, go ahead. There is this I, I see that very ironic, the, the satire and the humor yes. into, yeah. into all of his work. <laughs> He's always trying to trick you up or set you up or make you aware of a shift. That's what Ian's always doing, too, uh, going along, setting you up, and all of a sudden uh, he's praising you, and all of a sudden he turns on you and points out what you're really <laughs> screwing up with. But I found the, the quote on, we're only for the money. So he's making this in 67. He's not going to get the sink lever here for another 15, 20 years. And um, he's already... It's like he invented the Sinclair Vier. What he was working out in the 60s uh, was the idea of something that then could be made by humans later is responding to Zappa's vision. Um, so it says on the, on the album cover, it says, All the music heard on this album was composed, arranged, and scientifically mutilated by Frank Zappa. <laughs> and in brackets... <laughs> In brackets, with the exception of a little bit of surf music, close bracket. Then he says, this is what I'm going to ask Roxy Bo. None of the sounds are generated le electronically. They are all the product of electronically altering the sounds of normal instruments. So what's the difference mm -hmm. there? Sounds are, what's a generation uh, sound yes. by electronically? What, what's that? Yes, because mm -hmm. you can program a synthesizer to sound like a violin, for example. Yeah, but people people who who really know about music and instruments can see the the difference. It's like a, a, you have in these organs, you have flute and strings and whatever that are supposed to be those instruments, but you can hear immediately this is not the real thing. It's it's a, a, an artificial sound generation instrument trying to be the instrument. And the, the, the thing with the instruments is when you play, for example, a violin, you have different types of attacking the instrument. For, for example, play legato or staccato, and you can do many different types of, of things as you play. And, and in the electronic instrument, all notes sound the same. So that's one of the of the things that many people were criticizing about electronic music that they were trying to imitate the acoustic orchestra. But I think that's not the point with the electronic music. Is to to go on and explore other sounds. But uh, um, I think that was also part of selling the synthesizers and the organs to have these libraries that were supposed to be orchestra sounds or pianos. And uh, you have now, the Sinclair already had digital recording, that's the sampler. So you have a, a digital recording of a, an acoustic instrument, or there are new technologies of synthesis. You have the waveform of a instrument, and you can, it's like a digital recording. You have like the, the ground of the sound of the timber, and then you can alter some of the paramet parameters or Values, parameters, to, parameters. Yeah. yeah, to to make them change, to edit these fabric sounds or fabric libraries. But um, people who who work with the acoustic instruments and electronic instruments see can hear the difference immediately. This is. Um, this is uh, from a sound library, or this is a real orchestra. Right, so listen to this. When he says, none of the sounds are generated electronically, 
that's what the first instruments would do. They would make an orchestra happen by generating them electronically, right? They try to match an orchestra. So he, he says none of the sounds uh, are are electronic. Generated are electronically. I, I suppose. No, he says are he generated electronically. What does that mean? What's it mean to be generate a sound electronically? Yeah, to, you have the synthesizer or the sampler. Okay, right. And you, you make the instrument. You have many different values, parameters to program an instrument. Uh, we call them patches. Right, and you're doing and it to stimulate. You want to fool people that they're listening to an orchestra. You make it sound like an orchestra. That's not what he's doing. He's saying the sounds are the product of electronically altering the sounds of normal instruments. So mm. they're not generated uh, electronically. He, I think, no, he, he will make recording with real musicians. And then you can have, for example, a filter in a guitar like a wah-wah or a reverb. Yeah for the voice or different types of electronic manipulations that you can do in the studio with the effects. So the instruments were real, real musicians, but they were altered with the uh, Right, so what, what you effects. heard in the end on the, on the LP was not what the musicians made. He would alter what the musicians made. Now, most people would say, wow, you can't, uh, how are you going to perform that in a live audience, you know, a live concert? Like the, the bands had to sound like what the album sounded like. But Frank's making the, the guys not able to sound in live concerts what was done in the studio. See, most people would not do that. He did what you shouldn't do. He was fucking with the music. Yes, but um, I think we went to develop the... We know that these are two different environments. Uh, for example... Francois Bell, one of my teachers. Yeah. Yeah. He he was the director of the group that researched musical in Paris. He he made very complex compositions with many 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 tracks, and he said um, the performance of that piece was the composer mixing live the different tracks. Uh, and that was his his concept of of performing electronic music. You you remix live, and right. you mute or add uh, effects, or it's like a type of very sophisticated DJ. Right now, would he then make okay. it into an album? Would he then record that and make an album of it? Yes, but um, one thing is the album because that's only one interpretation. Right. And another right. will be in the concert every time it's different. And uh, hmm. Sapa knew, you well, have that's... the studio environment, the clavier, but uh, the live concert is another environment, and he would do other things. Maybe he has, like, a basic uh, musical idea. But um, that was the, the problem, for example, his song was talking about when when they were trying to make a repertoire, there is so many different versions of each song that it was hard to decide which solo, which which version they should learn and play. And, and in some of the songs, he, he will do the, the solo from this version and then take the bass from another version, but... It, the music of Zappa is not like a final song forever. Right. Every time he plays... Are you talking about Zappa or your your professor? Are you talking about your mentor no, or now, Zappa? No, I'm talking about Zappa because... Right. Okay. He, for yes, him, he would change every he, night. He was just trying to, to reproduce what he did in the studio. He knew it's another environment. And even, even every night when, when they have... The, like two concerts a day or different concerts uh, during a week, the musicians will complain that there were things being changed and the things yeah. they learned were never the same. Yeah, yeah. 
They always had to keep. So like Carolyn Guerin's book says, it's not the final product that we're looking for. It's this endless process of tactile interplay with the environment he's engaging, either the live concert or the studio. That's the art, the ability to interact and stay involved, not yes, uh, producing some finished it's product. It's a replay. Everything is a replay in a remix, and it's, it's the, how we engage in conversation. We need to replay patterns. We need to replay experiences okay. or whatever. Right. Now, he says... Um, after that statement, none of the sounds are generated electronically. They are all the product of electronically altering the sounds of normal instruments. Then he says, the orchestral segments were conducted by Sid Sharp under the supervision of the composer. Then he says, this whole monstrosity, there's your monster, this whole monstrosity was conceived and executed. He's calling the album monstrosity. was conceived and executed by Frank Zappa as a result of some unpleasant premonitions, August through September 1967. So, uh, these unpleasant premonitions. Then he says, all premonitions continuing to come true. <laughs> and then he says, is this phase one of Lumpy Gravy? Now, he was, I think he was intending on having Lumpy Gravy come out first, but there was contractual different uh, companies were putting it out. And so, it got all bogged down, took another year to get out. So, it came out, I think, after We're Only for the Money. So, I have to check that. So, that... On World for the Money, I think it says, is this phase one of Lumpy Gravy? So the interplay between Lumpy Gravy and, and World Only for the Money is, uh, is united by the electronic altering. That's what's in common. So, um, yes, so the, I, I think it's very interesting because um, um, it's not only the music being affected by the electronic environment. It's the whole environment, the whole society, the whole, the whole, the whole yeah. that is affected by the electronic. That's zone. Egyptian. That's Egyptian. Yeah. And, you know, all the kids who would come across Frank uh, and just hear the entertainment part of it, they had no idea of what I'm going to talk about and what um, he was doing with the uh, technology. It's, he really was an invisible environment. Um, he was known for a guy who ate shit on stage, which he never did, but that's what circulated. <laughs> this guy, he's such a far out city that he actually, uh, somebody shit on stage and Frank went over and ate it. And, um, that's the, the orphan legend. Yeah, he, right, and, and he begins his autobiography, I think, with this story. Um, he says, that legend uh, is not true. The only time he ever ate shit was at a buffet at a uh, Holiday Inn in uh, some place in Arkansas. That's the only time he ever ate shit. <laughs> so now I'm going to explain to you what is the continuity. Why is he a satellite conductor? So um, in the early 60s when he starts practicing and rehearsing in Paul Buff's studio in Cucamonga, he eventually buys it in August 64 when he gets some uh, money for uh, a movie he scored. I think it's Run Home Slow, uh, which was uh, made by a high school teacher of his. And they were friends, so Frank did the music, and it took a while for the guy, I guess, to complete it or to get yeah. out there to make some money on it. So Frank got some money from it. Or I'm um, thinking he got a... Um, Access to equipment. Okay, let's, 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 I'm not trying here to be accurate. It's the uh, idea. Um, so what happened is he uh, eventually got the money to buy the studio. But before August 64, when he bought the studio, he was hanging out with Paul Buff for a couple of years and learning uh, his very complex. He had very avant-garde, uh, advanced studio. So he's learning all this uh, neat stuff that would serve him well. At one point, he buys a bunch of props sold, you know, in Hollywood. And he's able to make a rocket ship in, in the studio. There's an area where he puts together a rocket ship. Now, what's happening in that period, 62, 63, 64, is the American Mercury program, I think it was called, uh, they were just starting yeah. to, um, you know, catch up to the Russians and have John Glenn go around the planet a couple times or something. Uh, so they're doing early uh, tentative um, experiments with their rocketry. So 
here's this, it's a figure. The, the American population knows that Kennedy's laid out the space dream of getting to the moon by the end of the decade. So it's a figure of um, what McLuhan would call industrial kinetic space, you know, jumping on some place and having a goal and trying to get there while missing the simultaneous travel that people were experiencing under TV conditions, live TV conditions or on the radio. They were transporting themselves all over the place electronically um, through radio. So they didn't need a rocket. So to get an old can, tin can, and set it up and land someplace was a pretty 19th century project. So Frank, um, I call him a satellite conductor. So you go back to what he was he do what was he doing when he first got access to a studio, he mimes a satellite conductor and he writes a screenplay about what he's doing. So you have this um, uh, rocket set up in his, in his lab there, in the studio, and he's going to write a play called Captain Beefheart Meets the Grunt People. So I'm going to go through it and show you um, different aspects, conceptual continuity, overlappings with Ion and us, and uh, whatever other things I note. Um, so it begins, this is the, uh, it's dated, um, see at the end it says the date of this uh, completion of this screenplay, August 20th, 1964. If it was one more day, August 21st, it would have been Reverend Stang's birthday. Um, I'm not sure, maybe Arthur Coker's birthday is August 20th, but... Um, um, there it is, August 20th, 1964. Uh, he had just bought the studio, I think, in August 64. So he just got acquired the studio. Buff moves out, and now he's inspired to do what he was go as a creator. He's going to make a movie. Not necessarily going to make an album. He's going to make a movie. So I went. I read it in detail, you know, every line, and I ticked off points. So we talked about. Um, the repeating theme of uh, somebody who worked for the government, some kind of project, maybe secret, getting fired, and they're pissed off. So on the first page of Captain Beefheart Meets the Grunt People, it says um, there's this desert town uh, called Happy Valley, elevation 37 feet, population 2. And that's uh, <laughs> Billy Sweeney and his, ne his nephew, um, what's his nephew's name, is Cecil. And uh, so Billy and Cecil are occupying a kind of place where Charles Manson hung out. And, you know, he hung out in Death Valley and occupied the Spawn Ranch. So it's interesting. It's kind of a uh, bleak scene. It was a town, but 10 years ago it was uh, all of a sudden suffered the government taking away the big contract that employed the people in the little town. And then everybody went away. And only Billy Sweeney, who I think was the janitor at the, uh, at the, whatever the industry was, and Cecil is his retarded nephew. So um, zipping through uh, what I tick off little things, um, they say that the government took the big contract away and gave it to a machine shot in Chuckalogie, Alabama. Gave it to a machine. And it's shot. Like, did the machine get shot? What is that about? It's like he gave the contract to the Android meme, to some uh, non-human <laughs> scenario. Took the contract away and gave it to a machine shot in Chuckalogi, Alabama. A movie? Was it for a movie shot? Things are a lot, and it says, things are a lot quieter down there now in Happy Valley. Now, remember, Zappa in 1970, according to Barry Miles, has a sign on his basement uh, studio before he gets the big high-tech studio 10 years later. Um, he has uh, a sign saying Dr. Zircon secret lab in Happy Valley, something like that. I could actually look it up. It's got Dr. Zircon, it's got lab, and it's got Happy Valley. But he'd already written a screenplay six years before based in Happy Valley. So it's autobiographical. There's an autobiographical level here. So moving along, um, it says Captain Beefheart is the host. He is um, narrating the story, and he says, this is Billy Sweeney, and it's just as he appeared on that happy day 22 years ago when he first started work at the plant. So there's your 22 right there. So that means 1942? That's when the World War II began. 
1941, early 42, so 42 and 22 would be 1964. So there's the 22, and I'm just going to flip along here. The next thing is Beefheart himself has a machine. Uh, it's called the watch all machine. So Beefheart has some kind of secret hideout in the mountains, and he can watch everything. So that's sort of like Captain Beefheart. Uh, and it says, um, uh, talking about, um, let's see, does Beefheart describe himself there? Um, he talks about Billy Sweeney applying himself. What he did when he got laid off, uh, he went sort of, Billy went sort of funny in the head. No matter what, he planned to work his way to the top. And so even though the environment for him to go to the top was uh, disappeared, he couldn't be stopped. Not even the government could stop him. So when he got, the day he got laid off, he became a systematic plan of self-improvement. First, he tore the cover off a book of matches and sent away for a course in space science. He studied diligently, applying itself with fierce determination to each little lesson as it came in the mail. And when he flunked, he kept right on trying. He kept flunking the mail course. But he kept on trying, working his way to the lofty goal he'd set him for himself. A goal you won't believe when I tell you, says Captain Beefheart. Then he says, let's make it up to my secret mountain retreat where I keep the files on this stuff, kids. And then he, uh, he, he dematerializes and rematerializes in the secret uh, mountain retreat. So there's Captain Beefheart, Autumn being this mysterious person that Ion said he was in actuality. So Frank is, is like, in a way, he's like a strange non-physical situation is um, dropped in his lap. He's got this lab. He has a friend who's a strange character, like, like a mini Ion, and he can do all these fantastic non-physical things. And, and he's just describing the movie uh, about his buddy, Beefheart, dealing with uh, the environment in Southern California. So Beefheart says to the kids, I didn't lose any of you going through the dimension warp, did I? Real swell. And then he continues his narration. Now then, in order to understand this complex man, Billy Sweeney, and the unusual situation in which he is involved, I feel it would be best at this time to consult the watch-all machine. And he pushes a big red button, and a dossier marked Sweeney pops out of, the, out of a convenient slot. Uh, we suddenly swish pan to a medium shot of Sue, that's Don Van Vliet, Don Vliet, he added Van later. Don Vliet's mother, Sue, is a character in here. Uh, suddenly swish pan to a medium shot of Sue scolding from the doorway. Now, um, she's always yelling at Don. Don's a totally spoiled kid. And all he does when he gets yelled at is he just demands for her to get, a, get him a Pepsi. So this, this comes out in the script. So, so Frank is literally describing his buddy uh, as a character using biographical information. So, um, let's see, Sue yells at uh, Beefheart, Donnie, how many times have I told you about bringing your imaginary playmates in the house? So the parent thinks that Don is uh, fantasizing everything. Beefheart says, damn it, Sue, I'll bring, him I'll bring him in here if I want to. I told you to stay out of my room anyway. So Sue says, is that any way to talk to your mother? Now is it? And he says, shut up and get me a Pepsi. So she goes and gets him a Pepsi. So that's just a little background. So then it says here, the remainder of this dialogue is accompanied visually by a series of shots of the machine. That would be the watch all machine. Cut to the rhythm of the speeches. Hear that, Roxy? Cut. The scene is cut to the rhythm of the speeches. Yes. Of the yes. talk. That's uh, what we recognize when he's playing. He has this rhythm yeah. of a speech. That he's yeah. miming, you know, electronically yeah. amplified music. So he says the remainder of this dialogue is accompanied visually by a series of shots of the machine, and the shots are cut to the rhythm of the speeches, occasionally punctuated by the watch all machine effects loop. So there he is spelling out what he's, how he composes. Um, let's see what else. Oh yeah, uh, the father complains that Don stinks. And he never washes in his socks or in his bedroom, and they're stinking out the place. And he says, and you ought to tell Don for me, he says to his wife, that his little room smells like a camel who's been eating peanut butter sandwiches. Okay? Now, when Gail reports uh, in one of these books on Zappa, her first night with Frank in, like, uh, well, August 64, August 66, two years later, 
right around the time Lenny Bruce dies, um, she says that Frank was the most, you know, ill-kempt, slovenly dressed guy she'd ever met. He smelled, but especially his his mustache area around his mouth smelled of peanut butter because he used to live on peanut butter when he had no money. So here's Frank saying that beef heart smells of peanut butter. So he must have known, this is two years before Gail notices, he must have known that he smelled like that, but he projects it on Don. So that's a cute little autobiographical thing. Um, are you with me, guys? You still here? Yes. Right? <laughs> yes, yes. 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 I, I certainly can't out. bring that letter enough. Uh, you're, I can't make out when you're on speakerphone. What'd you say? <laughs> yes, I felt like eating a peanut butter sandwich. <laughs> oh, is that it really? Before I said that? No, as you're saying. Uh, now you will. Fresh. Now you will. No. Yeah. Okay, in case you make a sound, so I know you're still there. Because uh, if I get disconnected, I can go on for ten minutes before I knew it. Um, okay. So I, I uh, if one of the I'm just listening. That's all right. Yeah, you can mute yourself, but every now and then come in. So under sound, uh, at a certain point in the script, it says dynamo hum. Now, dynamo hum is an important part of the Uncle Meat play presented in the 1969 album uh, called Uncle Meat in the booklet. Dynamo hum. And he also did a song called dynamo hum. So he's got dynamo hum there in 1964. He doesn't say anything about it, just that there is environmental uh, effects around... um, uh, Billy's, uh, where Billy keeps his rocket, his launch room. It has a dynamo hum sound. See, so as you build up an awareness of all these different uh, aspects and images in Frank's work, you see that his album covers were showing you a, a fragment of the big album, of the whole thing, of the whole environment. And so uh, you'll see dynamo hum said here, and then it'll show up later uh, as a, mm-hmm. another use but it is part of the whole, you're looking at a huge, like an elephant, and one album will give you the leg, another album will give you the neck, another album will give you the trunk, another album will give you the ears, you know, and once you know all the stuff, you see that his album titles are all the aspects of the same scene, where a guy has a rocket, and he's going to compete with the government and get to the moon first. This is this one, this old janitor is determined to make his own rocket and get to the moon. Now, that's pretty lofty ambition, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but maybe he's working now, why? on that. The Zap is. Yeah, well, we're going to get to that. So I'll say that. There's more to say, but I want to say a few more samples and then get to the next big statement. So you know that this guy's pissed off, and he wants to uh, – Name, get to the moon and claim it for himself. Fuck the government. Um, uh, and, and in this movie, it says, rock and roll fills the hollow room. The, the hollow room. He listens. Billy listens for a moment and resumes his deodorizing. So you have this rock and roll environment. The transistor radio environment is always being pointed out in this situation. The ground of transistor radio to whatever the figure activities are as figure. Um, that's, so Beefheart says, uh, yes, kids, you're right again. Billy has been saving Cecil for the final test. Now, what he's going to do is he's going to stuff Cecil in the rocket and send them to the moon. Uh, but first, he has to test the Van Allen belt. He has to see if a person can sur- a human can survive uh, the Van Allen belt. He said he st- Cecil. He has nothing to do but care for these horses, and he tries to offer. Uh, horse rides to kids, but there's nobody in the area, so he doesn't get any uh, any business, uh, you know, having horse rides. So every now and then he loses a horse. He doesn't know what happened. Well, it turns out Billy stole the horse, put it in his rocket ship, set it up there, and uh, see if he died. And and two horses did die uh, going through the Van Allen radiation belt. So it didn't look too good for humans. Um, and it says. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> three times Billy launched his proud ship, and three times it returned with a dead pony in it. It seems they always perish going through the Van Allen radiation belt. Billy has learned all he can from the ponies. A stage has been reached now where a pony just won't do. Billy needs a human. And so Beefheart says, yes, kids, you're right again. Billy has been saving Cecil for the final test. Cecil is still in the dark about the whole thing, of course. After all, he's got his mind on the business and the business of his own non-horse ride business. 
and the terrible loneliness of his life in Happy Valley. So um, in Gravity's Rainbow, uh, the punchline is this Nazi rocket manager is putting the, a little kid in, uh, I think a sexually abused kid first, into a rocket and, and testing it. So Pynchon, who becomes a big fan of Zappa, what he develops uh, in a 1973 novel, Zappa lays out 10 years before. Uh, the idea of stuffing somebody uh, without their approval, or yeah, without their approval in a rocket. So I don't know. If, I don't think Pynchon would know about Frank's screenplay. It didn't get out much. So, but it's just an interesting parallel. So um, it's almost like what is this new environment leads to the hor- horrible scenario of what would be the worst thing is if they stuffed you, Bert, in the rocket ship and sent you out there, and you weren't sure you'd get back. That, that would be a, a nightmare for kids, right? be put into one yeah. of these uh, NASA spaceships uh, without your approval. And uh, it says, kids, you realize it's been 10 years since Cecil has seen or talked to anyone except Billy. 10 years of isolation. Do you have any idea what that can do to a man? It's almost a, a satire Frank. He's not really isolated, but he is spending a lot of time by himself at the studio. Uh, but Billy Swinney fits more of Frank's uh, project. Okay, so moving along to the next, um, uh, this, okay, so Larry shows up. You'll hear on Sheik Your Booty, one of the, some of the musicians talking, it just is a little sound bite between songs, and, and they say something like, yeah, it's been completely different ever since Larry left, or we don't know what happened to Larry, we don't know if he's having any fun. So there's this comment on Larry. In 1979, you go back 15 years, turns out Larry is a loser who shows up and is, is obsessed with uh, um, horse pony rides because his father owns a ranch, works with horses, but won't let Larry uh, have rides on them because I think the reason was that Larry would get dirty and track horse manure into the home. So the father didn't tolerate Larry being near the ponies, even though it was his father's business. So Larry is frustrated. And he wants to have a pony ride. So he finds out Cecil's doing it in Happy Valley. So he shows up. Well, quickly, uh, uh, Cecil doesn't know this, but Bill, Billy decides to put Larry in the rocket ship, not, not Cecil. <laughs> He's the perfect guy. So you have this horrible murder scene going along in this silly environment where this guy is trying to create. So he's kind of showing the sacrifices science makes, the cruelty that science does that's not talked about, right, in doing their experiments, or some scientists. So, but Larry says, um, you wouldn't believe it, but I hate my father, and that's why I ran away. In a way, Larry is a, as a, partly Frank, because Frank has, as it comes out in his brother's book, you know, has real tension between Frank and his father. They really uh, struggle to remain, you know, a family. Uh, they're really bugged by each other. Um, so this thing about hating my father, and that's why I ran away, uh, gets Larry in trouble. So it could be an aspect of Frank in that character. So uh, another point is to sound filtered music from transistor radio. I don't know why it says filtered. Um, maybe it just means music coming from the transistor radio, but there's the hidden ground of the radio again, or transistor radio. And um, whipping along here, looking for the next ticked off point. Uh, if you have anything to say, um, Bert, you can speak, anything that comes to mind. Well, I, I was thinking how he had to be a rock star because rock is tactile. The the word rock and yes. roll uh, yes. meaning uh, engaging sex, and um, this is like a new type of homily, the new type of um, cultus. And um, in yes. the tetra, uh, Matlun is doing at the end of the laws of media. He says. The um, the rock star is, is uh, like a person one wears something like that. So maybe <laughs> you wear them as clothing. You mean? Yeah, he says the rock the rock sound bubble is not for listening to, but for wearing and participating in. Right. That's the. Uh, um, um, I thought you meant that we wear the rock star. Yeah, we wear the rock music. Um, we have. We, he's in the Tony Schwartz recordings. He he 
he says that. He says it's like foam rubber. The music presses up against you. And uh, you respond to it like as if you're a big sponge uh, pressing against, massaging your skin. Yeah, we um, yes, put the, yourself in a space bubble. He also talks about the artistic environment being the type of clothes that uh, surrounds you. Yes. Well, radio, he said radio provided a privacy bubble for the uh, kids at home. In the suburban homes, they'd want privacy, and uh, they put on the radio, and that would shut out the rest of the home sounds, and they'd do the homework with the radio on if they did the homework. And uh, it was a privacy bubble that radio created after it was superseded by television and computers and satellite. Like, it wasn't a privacy bubble Really, when it was the hidden ground in the 20s and 30s, it was a tribal ESP experience, uh, simultaneity. But when it got displaced by the new preference for TV, then the teenager uh, and rock and the rock and roll industry hijacked it for the space bubble, for the private identity, post-littered private identity of a, an acoustic space bubble, right? Your own little uh, private space. So that's a good yes, point and, to bring um, up. So, in a way, um, as McLuhan said, all medias are amplifying one of our senses, and, and the PA system, he puts in this tetrad, uh, the inflated persona for everyone to wear. So inflated persona? What's persona? Like an individual per persona. Right. Inflated so persona. Oh, that means that you're the content of the radio. So you get on, you know, you're Bob Hope, and you get on the radio, or Orson Welles, and you inflate yourself while putting on the whole world. Is that what it says? Uh, you inflate the persona. Well, I, I understand it. Like, for example, we are all wearing Bob when we listen to Bob, or we wear Zappa when we listen to Zappa. It's like we fuse yes. with the amplified You put persona. on the artist. You put on the medium, you wear the medium, and you're the content. What you, your experience that you bring to it is the content, but you're wearing the artist or the poem or the book or the radio as an environment, as clothing. But what is it, what did he say after persona? You inflate the persona, what did he say? For everyone to wear. Yes. The electric world allows you, uh, this wearing aspect is revealed under electric conditions. Nobody thought of wearing books, but the fact that everybody is inside the electric environment, it suddenly occurs to people, oh, geez, we're wearing this thing, sharing the same space. Then you project that back onto the history of media. Oh, people wore the alphabet, and they wore the book, and they wore uh, speech, but they didn't know that until they had a, a massive discarnate wearing session with radio environment. So it changed the perception of the past. And that perception came after the television came. Is that what you're saying, Bob? That that whole that yeah. wearing. Yeah. Well, once radio and TV, once radio and t electric simultaneous environments, beginning with radio, came in, it made people, uh, some people, maybe artists, notice that they're kind of wearing the whole population. It was like clothing. Then they said, "Oh yeah, that that's what we're doing." People were wearing books, you know, 200 years ago. People were wearing manuscripts. People were wearing speech. They uh, they go back through media through the epiphany that radio gave them. Yes, they and, and, and I find this, this idea very interesting, how we, we, would, we get addressed with the things we're engaging, like uh, Zappa music or his ideas is, is part of, of, of another type of clothing you're putting on these patterns, these yes. ideas in your other bodies. It's how you dress the other bodies, not the physical, but the, the others. The new organs. You're dressing, yeah. you're dressing, you're dressing, you're uh, dressing new extended ears, new extended mouths. Uh, in War and Peace in the Gold Village, McLuhan talks about fashion and calls it the Boer War. And it's spelled B-O-E-R. It's a pun on the war in South Africa, you know, at the end of the 19th century the colonials, you know, wiping out the natives, which Pynchon uses in his novels, uh, especially in Gravity's Rainbow, that scenario, the clash between the pre-literate tribal people and the uh, literate European countries. Uh, the Boer, but fashion, 
if you're not into fashion, it's a bore war. It's boring. Um, so um, it says Cecil and Larry are bouncing with joy uh, that they're going. They think that they're going to. Billy convinces Larry that this rocket ship is a new kind of pony, and the pony ride he's going to get <laughs> is uh, by getting inside this fucking weird thing that that's going to move. <laughs> So Cecil and Larry are bouncing with joy at the fact that Larry's going to get his pony ride. We can see Billy re-entering the lab through a secret door. He is wiping his hands on his coveralls and smiling. Now, are coveralls that kind of farmer bib and shoulder yes. straps? You know what I mean? All right? Yes. They're called coveralls. Yes. Well, Frank yes. has a picture of himself with coveralls on the 1969 album uh, uh, Uncle Meat in the booklet. So you're saying, what's he, why did he present himself as a farmer? Well, he's presenting himself as Billy Sweeney, you know, as a metaphor, which no one would know because they didn't have the transcript of the play. Uh, the play had been written five years before, but I just noticed that. He's wiping his hands on his coveralls and smiling. Okay. Um, so moving along quickly to the next ticked-off part. Uh a lot. The, the, the rocket ship is made of cardboard. Now, not only is it a preposterous project to beat the government to go to the moon, but you're going to do it by building a, a, a rocket ship out of cardboard. <laughs> <You know? laughs> we're basically taught, we're looking at a retarded, an apparently retarded person with a fantasy project. And you know, McLuhan said television brought in uh, people as content, started fantasizing. Uh, so here's this guy fantasizing under the TV situation. And um, Billy is explaining to uh, Larry and uh, Cecil, what's he saying? Uh, he says, ah, the world has no conception of my discovery. My children, this sleek space, or, or rather this slip, he started to say spaceship, and he stops himself. This sleek space, uh, 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 this spirited steed. Horse, right? The spirit of seed is not made out of metal, nor is it made out of two bigger ponies. It only looks like metal because of the rivets I painted on it. And Cecil says, not metal? And uh, Billy says, in the manner of a TV pitchman, no, cardboard. It's light, easy to work with. Metal and bigger ponies are definitely harder to manage. I simply take some old boxes, staple them together, and impregnate them with this liquid giving to the material an unbelievable strength and resistance to adverse environmental conditions. That's ionic. That's what we do. We impregnate with our new eye cell into certain things. So here's Frank picking up on an ionic invention. <laughs> hey, yeah, wouldn't you be sure, you guys are surprised if you saw our cold play, cold fusion machine, and you saw a look on the surface that was made out of fucking crude cardboard? <laughs> you go, what the fuck? <laughs> But um, so this is Billy doing Bob, you know, 50 years before, uh, saying that we impregnated with this cardboard, with this liquid, giving to the material an unbelievable strength and resistance to adverse environmental conditions. Now, somebody might say, well, science has done that since then, right? They probably have all kinds of stuff they inject into other stuff to make them stronger. Yeah, but it can be applied to us, too. Uh, and that's probably more applicable. So um, to this cheap rocket... And uh, he fools Cecil and Larry to be enthusiastic about it. Um, and this script is made up of 107 pages, and we're at page 41 already, so it's pretty neat. So um, oh, we're going on pretty fast if you're bored. Uh, in the instructions on the side, it says, this develops into a, what is this? The, he's talking about a uh, uh, youth band plowing through a crowd. Uh, what is this? Um, Oh, yeah. Uh, along this the last 10 pages, what's happened is they, they focus on a politician, Senator Gurry, who is, uh, the, is responsible for getting the, uh, the American spaceship on the moon. And he's got a, uh, an astronaut uh, called uh, Johnny Smith. And Johnny Smith is the all-American uh, uh, athlete kind of guy. He's described in the cast as a corn-fed astronaut, Johnny Smith. And Senator Gurney works for the government. You hear about Senator Gurney, Gurney in Absolutely Free in 67. Uh, Gurney is the name of the 
attorney who straps on uh, the 13-year-old in chocolate syrup, smothers her in chocolate syrup. I think his name is Gurney. I know the name Gurney, the attorney Gurney shows up. So the name Gurney was already happening in 1964. So, um, so Gurney is organizing uh, this uh, uh, official moon launch. Um, so, it's, so there's a big celebration as they get ready to launch it. And it says there's a band uh, continuing to march and play through a crowd. They're knocking down the crowd, mowing the crowd over, but they don't even care. And they just keep continuing marching and playing. The people with signs start whacking, signs supporting the launch, start whacking at the band for stepping on their feet. In retaliation, the youthful musicians play louder and, and empty their spit valves on the enemy's shoes. This develops into a minor riot as the crowd, still cheering, proceeds to be at proceeds to beat the youngsters about the head and shoulders, rendering all of them unconscious except the guitar player, who, swinging his instrument like a machete, beats a path to safety. Now, it's interesting. He, the guitar player survives. That's a metaphor for Frank using the guitar to beat off the stupid crowd. He can use the latest technology to become a really good guitar player. Everybody else using obsolete tools dies, but he, he gets to safety. So it's interesting how he singles out the... The guitar player is surviving the riot, um, but this huge well, riot. The, the, the one who who gets the new frequency, the guitar player. <laughs> yes. Is yes. A virus. Did you say virus? No. Fire. The survivor. <laughs> survivor, right? Sur so, survivor. So you have. So so Billy and C so Larry and Cecil. Um, so Larry goes out there and survives the radiation belt and comes back, and they're all happy. Shit, Larry survived it. So now they're going to make the official launch, and this time it's going to be Billy, Cecil, and Larry because Billy now thinks, okay, we can get through the Venezuelan belt. We sacrificed Larry. He survived it, so we can do it. So Billy heads, you know, launches himself, and they head for the moon, and Senator Gurney is having big celebrations uh, to, um, to uh, launch their thing like, almost like the same day. Uh, and it says, uh, it says, the minutes tick by as the final stages are reached in the countdown. A mere three hours now till Johnny Smith makes history in his sleek modern vessel, which I understand, this is a news, newscaster saying this, which I understand is called, and so appropriately, the spirit of Cape Smedley. So they're at um, Cape Smedley, where that's Cape Canaveral in reality, but uh, Cape Smedley. And I think the spirit of something was the name of Lindbergh's plane when he flew across the Atlantic Ocean in 1927 or so. So I think it's, um, or maybe it's a reference to the uh, name of the plane, the, uh, the Wright brothers, uh, when they created flight in 1904 or so. Um, the spirit of something might have been on their plane. So it, it's a historical reference. Actually, by the clock, it is two hours and 15 minutes till the lift up. But the tension is getting to be, wait, wait. We've just been handed a special bulletin, and uh, they don't give it to you right away. It's, ba it's back to um, Larry and Cecil. Uh, Bill Billy is sitting at the controls of the rocket ship, and Cecil and Larry have to stand during the whole trip holding on uh, like subway straps, holding on little straps, okay, bouncing about. So Billy is uh, keeping the aristocratic distance between him and his assistants. Then uh, Larry is saying, they're talking about uh, what happened, uh, what they go through. Because, oh, when they go through, when they go to the moon, they uh, start to distort. Larry and Cecil become confident, and Billy becomes a little kid. So they're distorted when they go through the, <laughs> the Van Allen belt, which is pretty interesting. Like, where did Zappa get that idea from? Is that known physics, that that's what happens? I don't know. Um, yes, and actually so, some of the conspiracy theorists say that's impossible to to go through this radiation. That right, right. You, you, you can't do a moon landing. It's impossible, that's what they say, right? So it happened in Nevada. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so um, you know what the Evergreens was said it? What happened is... Uh, they did go to the moon, but the footage the people saw on TV was uh, shot from Nevada someplace. So the TV show was not the actual moon, but the guys were on the moon, and they didn't want to take a chance of broadcasting some unforeseen disaster, 
so they wouldn't let the people see what the astronauts were actually experiencing. They couldn't take that risk, so they faked the content. So you see, so people who notice this and they've written books on it, look, this, the thing's got shadows. They can tell it's a fake set. They, they figure out and kind of prove it. Well, it doesn't mean they didn't go to the moon. It's just that they didn't show us what they did in going to the moon. So that's a pretty neat take. They, uh, they up say that bullshit. Yeah. Kovrig <laughs> made that um, shooting. Um, Who? Stanley Kubrick. Yeah, Kubrick. Kubrick. That's right. Yeah. They say Stanley Kubrick did it. Right. Um, so Larry's saying, uh, talking about the experience. Uh, yeah, let me see. Uh, what did they... I think they've landed. Um, let me just check. Yes, so they've landed, and they're reporting what they went through. And Larry says, well, I got this funny tingling in the back of my neck all of a sudden. And then, bloop, I saw a whole bunch of colors blinking on and off. I guess it was just on a little daydream or something. It's like the ending of Kubrick's 2001 where the guy goes into this weird psychedelic trip, you know, at the end of the movie. Well, Zappa anticipated this. Uh, he's saying Larry went through a bunch of... Uh, you know, psychic hallucinations, a whole bunch of colors blinking on and off. And he said, I guess I was just on a little daydream or something. So isn't that neat? Yeah. The, uh, yes, and uh, Frank, he, he calls his daughter Moon Unit. Moon Unit. Oh. I'm going to explain that. I'm going to explain that in a minute. Um, that's the next aspect of the, the big picture. So as a result... Um, of uh, where was that? Uh, but uh, I, I see this this cardboard rocket. He was sort of seeing the illusion, and the, um, yeah, of the of the how, actual space program, space race. Yes, and, and and also the hologram and Hollywood. Everything is, is glamour. Glamour is the illusion of. Elegant, but everything is illusion. Everything is fake. Everything is a prop. Right. Everything is cheapness. And, so the newscaster yes. says, uh, and Senator Gurney regrets to inform the public um, of this cancellation. They've canceled the rocket launch due to the presence in the atmosphere above Kate Smedley of some sort of alien rocket vehicle. So they're saying something was seen, and. Um, and he says, I repeat, due to this critical condition, the planned lunar landing mission has been temporarily postponed. So Senator uh, Gurney is totally pissed off that something has gone out there and forced them to cancel, and they're going to they're gonna try to figure out what the hell was that. So um, the race to the moon is on, and Billy has got the first jump. Um, let's see. Uh, okay. Billy says... Um, who was he saying this to? So Billy is saying to Cecil and Larry, we are about to embark on a perilous mission to outer space. Our destiny lies ahead. We shall conquer the moon. In the name of decency and all that is clean and good, in the name of Happy Valley, land of my youth, and all that it has stood for in the past, its inherent rural cleanliness and strength of spirit, the true spirit of our great land. For this we risk our lives now, as did our forefathers at Bunker Hill and Anzio and Mount Suribaki, all those places. For all this, we now depart for the moon. So I forgot to say that. That, um, that was his speech before they got in there and took off for the moon. Uh, so um, he's going to claim it for him in his neighborhood. Okay, so... Uh, Moving along now, looking for the next but, uh, I, I was thinking how this meme of the new frontier going yes. further is also the thing with the media. We were all, always trying to expand, to go further. And then with the visual bias, we thought it was going to the moon or going to space. But <laughs> the real expansion right. was to go to the non physical reconnect something. And the first phase of that was the electronic retrieval. Uh, and so the electronic retrieval and wiping over the guff, we're already traveling by TV um, before we go to the moon. And that, that's a, a key point McLuhan 
uses to make uh, fun of what's going on. Everybody's living in the rearview mirror, and they're, they're doing a, uh, an old 19th century replay with the rockets and ignoring a yeah, with, collective... Yeah, uh, with Bonanza, we think it's uh, going to conquer new territory. <laughs> in right. <desert. laughs> yeah, right. It's still going on. So, yeah, and the newscaster says, and... Um, they're talking about the launch of the Johnny Smith, the regular launch. Uh, and there he goes, folks, up through the troposphere, up through the stratosphere, up through the ionosphere, up, up, up. What a man, what a ship. I remember Ion, in one of the rewrites, laid out the seven spheres, the troposphere, the stratosphere, and the ionosphere. But there's the ionosphere right there. I mean, that's technically a scientific yeah. place, but... I project my own world into that word. No, that's a science. That's a science. That's right. Yes. He you can say the troposphere was the book. Yeah. The troposphere is the electric age. The stratosphere is the android meme. And the ionosphere is the hexatic uh, world we're into right now with the I cell. The troposphere is the electronic, analog, electric environment. Stratosphere is the digital environment. And the ionosphere is Dobstown. Okay. Um, <laughs> we're on page 62, moving along. Uh, he has this one of the sound effects. Suitable electronic lunar ballet music. <laughs> Suitable <laughs> electronic lunar ballet. All right. In uh, all this time, while Johnny Smith is going towards the moon, he's reminiscing about his own life. His, his youth. It's like he's seeing his life flash before him. Uh, he talks about me and my three buddies took off about 7 a.m. in a little 39 Studebaker. Frank is always talking about this 30, 39. He has a, a Chevy, I think, sometimes. And now a Studebaker. It's always 1939 um, uh, for some reason. Uh, he refers to that year in the car culture. Um, I think I uh, jumped ahead at one point where Johnny's talking about. It's, fu it's fun how Frank makes a parody on science in the uh, the whole yes. space program. It's funny. <laughs> yeah, he, he's not being fooled by the new technology. He's yeah. uh, ready to <laughs> just show how stupid it is. And uh, there's even more to this appropriate metaphor or, or appropriate strategy. Okay, so I guess it's, I haven't got to it yet. There's a statement by Johnny, which is interesting. Um, now, on the moon, there's a problem. The moon is already occupied by Celestia. And Celestia is this, uh, how is he described? <laughs> this this, this the woman. The spider woman. Uh, I, no, not the Spider Woman. Uh, Celestia, a queen from the moon with green skin. Now, green is my color on the chart. A queen from on the time note chart. A queen from the moon. So this is an odd mutation. Now she's scheming to take over Earth, but she's surprised when these humans <laughs> end up on her planet. <laughs> She didn't know where they came from. Uh, that, that was um, the same thing with the giant uh, last payday. Last yeah, the, the giant spider and the woman. Uh, what was yeah, well, that? Name? Uh, uh, Drachma. Yeah. Drachma. Queen of cosmic greed. Now, that's going to be hunting <laughs> tooth. That's, a, that's the same story ten years later, eight years later. And I'm going to explain why it's the same story. Um, so Celestia says she encounters... Um, uh, Billy, I guess. Who is this? Who is he talking to? Uh, yeah, she's talking. Wait a minute. Yeah, she's uh, she's meet. Cecil has land. They've landed. Successful landing. And now they have. To, she confronts the humans. So she tells them. We are the last tragic remnants of a perishing race, a love-starved race, more highly developed than your earth women in the mysterious feminine arts. And we have waited many time periods. Note that phrase, many time periods, not 
a lot of time, but time, timings, time spans. We have waited many time periods for a contact such as this. It seems as though our prayers have been answered. Come with us. We have prepared a feast. And Cecil goes, feast? Like eating? And uh, we uh, move through some other scenes with Senator Gurney and, and Johnny. Uh, and then, oh yeah, here's where Johnny says, he's remembering as a youth, he loved the, uh, the DJ named, named Howling Hogman. So that's a takeoff on Wolfman Jack, who used to broadcast out of Mexico, that Zappa would listen to in the 50s, I guess, early 60s. So Johnny remembers he loved this DJ called the Howling Hogman. That's what they used to call him. And he had a funny old voice, let me tell you. Good mercy. I used to sit there and laugh till I was blue in the face. Yuck, yuck, yuck. So he's a really corny, corny guy. Now here's Frank. In the sound column, he writes electronic rock and roll, not electric rock and roll, not just rock and roll. He says electronic rock and roll. This is 1964. What's electronic rock and roll in 1964? So, okay, carrying on. So, uh, Celestia falls in love with Billy, and she wants to fuck him, and she's trying to organize an orgy because she's got a bunch of other women <laughs> hanging around her, her, her team. <laughs> and she wants Larry and Cecil to fuck the other women, and she wants to fuck Billy. Because, as she said, she's love-starved. They haven't fucked anybody in years uh, stuck there on the moon uh, because their race got wiped out. But I'm missing the uh, still. Ah, here it is. So here's an interesting statement by Johnny. Uh, he says, I suppose that each and every one of us as Americans has had or has right now or will have at some time or another a favorite disc jockey. That's just said right out of the blue. What, what's that about? <laughs> <laughs> the guy is, uh, has he landed yet? Um, but yeah, it's like true he hasn't landed yet. Ready. Kids doesn't want to what? be rock star anymore nowadays. Yeah. Uh, everybody wants to be a DJ, not a musician. Yes, a DJ thing. or a Bill a Gates. Digital. They want to come up with an app and start a computer empire. Yes. But yes, they, they want to be a DJ. Uh, even I became a DJ. Look at me, always adapting to the fads. You can look at my life. And Bob was a trend monger all along. I mean, I did it without knowing I was doing it, but I ended up being yes, a great DJ. Uh, and I didn't know oh, that's what everyone wanted to be. I'm causing yeah. everybody wanting to be a DJ. That's what's going on. Yeah, there you go. That's I got it. there the evolution. <laughs> Zappa had to be a rock star, and you had to become a DJ. Yeah, that yeah. was the next step. I had, uh, I had to sample Frank. He's my content. Sample him and, and everybody remix else. It, remix him for your xenocracy. Right. That's right. So Johnny says, for some reason, I suppose that each and every one of us, as Americans, has had or has right now or will have at some time or another a favorite disc jockey. That's Frank pointing out the programmed environment, right? Which may not, might be, sound like an obvious thing to an engineer. What do you mean? Everybody knows that. But you have to look at the obvious and look at the figure ground meaning of it. It'll have relevance later. So that's why he says, the old howling hog man was my favorite, and still is for that matter. And I'll probably never outgrow my love for him and the music he plays. Back in the late 50s, um, Frank talks about how it was a, a serious statement among intellectuals that rock and roll was a fad. And Frank uh, realized early on that it wasn't a fucking fad. It was a new environment, and it's not going to go away. So he refers to that when he says he has this Johnny guy as a big insight. I'll probably never outgrow my love for him and the music the DJ plays. That, that leads to the nostalgia industry, you know, all these uh, – companies that recycle all the um, the old bands from the 56, 70s, 80s, 90s. You know, that's it's an important part of the person's being. It's like keeping a person it's alive. Like a, they have to see. Today I read there there's going to be a one-year-long festival in London because of um, the 40th anniversary of punk. <laughs> one <laughs> year have a punk. long. <laughs> Right, and that's really? because it's an important part of their biology. It has to be done, you know, because it's part of people's – it's like we're going to keep breathing. 
we must keep breathing. We, we like it here, and we're going to keep breathing. Well, you got to have, uh, you know, we've had punk, and we must keep it going. We, we can't stop it. The wars happen when somebody wipes out a whole technical setup and then erases people's memories, and then they bring in a new technology, a new civilization, which uh, uh, the Everyone said will be the final Armageddon. When we invent a technology that we know, when we implement it and press the button and it goes into action, we will forget everything we ever knew. Yes. And that will be the price you, you pay for this new technology. And the war will be whether to do that or not. I don't want to forget everything. You know, don't press that button. The other idiots, the drunks and cocaine freaks will say, fuck it, I don't care. I had a lousy life. I don't want to remember it. Press that fucking button. All right? So there's a spiritual battle right there. The what you say, Roxy? Yeah, the yeah, capsicum. The capsicum. Yeah, yeah. It's still, uh, okay. they can still sell some safety pins. So, yeah. <laughs> Still who market paid, there. So. Who, who did that? Who paid off the London mayor and the, and the government to allow something to go on for a year? You know, and maybe Prince Charles, <laughs> probably Prince Charles did it. The least likely guy. So, uh, so poor Johnny recognizes that he'll never outgrow his love for rock and roll, or that DJ. So, so then Johnny a little later says. Music expresses the heart and soul. So here's Frank putting in, talking about the environment. Music expresses the heart and soul of mankind, whether he be exalted or humble or rich or poor. Then he says, and my life has been lived clean with a lot of music in it. And Frank would say, well, you never heard any music. That's just uh, new life. That's just uh, music or ugly radio, whatever Frank would say. Because uh, Frank said nobody knew what music was, and even if it bit him on the ass. He says that in Time Magazine in October 69. So um, here he's pointing out that uh, a person uh, is now saying, yes, my chemical body has been lived cleanly, but I've got my electronic self, and that's expressed as my body has a lot of music in it. So it's just an odd statement, you know, in the middle of this corny drama of the space race, Frank is putting these statements in there. Uh, at one point when... Uh, he he says, I got my electronic self. Self, what did you say? say? Self? Yeah, what did you say? I, I said, um, he said, uh, my life has been lived clean and with a lot of music in it. In other words, he's talking about his listening experience. He's a consumer like all Americans in the 60s of, of pop radio. But why is uh, why would a guy be written? I don't know any other character has ever said that. Yeah, I've had a pretty good life, and I've had a lot of music in it. You ever said that yes. about yourself? Well, you have. You're a composer, but uh, Bert never said that about himself. No. It's like it is odd. In the middle. It, what? It is odd to put that in the middle of this. This. Yeah. Uh, scene. You have a lot of music in your life. It's an invisible environment. You, you take it as a cliché. It's a given. You don't make a point. You don't observe it. You don't make a statement about it. It's uh, part of the uh, cliché environment. So so you see my point, right? That's sort of odd. This yeah. is Johnny Apple, this all-American cornhead, corn-grown, <laughs> corn Midwest corn corny guy, corn-fed, he's saying, my life has been lived clean with a lot of music in it. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, is is that what uh, uh, Donald Trump's going to say when he when he accepts the uh, presidential mantle when he wins the election? He's going to say, "Yeah, it's been a great life. I had a lot of music in it, a lot of TV, a lot of video," which is a way of saying you still think your center, your chemical body is the focus of your being. What Johnny's really saying is that my physical body's been clean, and I had many other bodies made up of musical consumption. He's pointing to a multiple body experience, but said. Hey. Rearview mirror as if it's just the chemical body. So at one point when the uh, when the guys land land uh, yeah when Johnny Smith lands on the moon he lands after Cecil. Uh, it says rocket screaming in the sound rocket screaming in. That is the opening line in Gravity's Rainbow by Pynchon. Uh, a, ro- a screaming comes uh, heard across the sky. It's, it's a very poetic statement. So here's Frank. 
You know, and Frank's a manipulator. There's like a similarity between uh, Pynchon and Frank. They're both born around the same time, and they're both sort of de- dealing with 50s America and then t- promoting some release from it. And, uh, and they're both looking very interested in the history of the Nazis and what happened to the Nazis. If you look on the album cover for the Grand Wazoo, it shows... Uh, uh, whatever the guy's name, but Uncle Meat, the evil scientist. He shows his laboratory, and it has the book Arms of Krupp. It's got a bunch of books, and one of them is the history of, uh, of the German armaments industry, the Krupp family. So, uh, and someone else, uh, Barry Miles or somebody, noticed that Frank was reading the, the Rise and Fall of the Third Reich or something. He had a fascination for that period. But while he's saying on in his early albums, the Nazis are running your town, he, he almost predicted what May would find out. May Brussels, literal Nazis. So um, moving along, we're getting close to the end. Uh, you're enjoying this, right? Going through these yes. patterns. Um, they say uh, somebody calls, uses the word Bacino. So Billy says, what's this Bacino? She said Bacino, and she says, uh, Celestia, the moon queen, says, I guess they monitor your late-night TV shows. That's a line from an old Zsa, Zsa Gabor movie called Queen of Outer Space. So there's a, a media clip that is brought in, um, a phrase from a TV show that's brought up on the, uttered on the moon. It's, it's actually, oh, yeah. So while, while Celestia is trying to seduce Billy, all of a sudden, uh, they're shocked because the grunt people show up. Yeah, remember, this is called Cat and Beefheart versus the grunt people, and they're some kind of alien race. So the grunt people uh, take over and basically arrest everybody. And they go, with us you will come, cave-wise, our hideout to go, on the dark side of the moon. It says, moon, dark side. Ha, Bacino. And then Billy says, what, what's this Bacino? Because the second grunt uses the phrase. So Celestia says, I guess the grunts monitor your late night TV shows that's a line from the old Zsa Zsa Gabor movie Queen of Outer Space so a little little bit of mixed media thrown into the scenario uh, okay uh, uh, Fart is back home and he's um, listening uh, his mother and father are watching roller derby you know, entertaining uh, some TV content and Fart gets pissed off at them that they're um, when they start watching, a little later they start watching the moon landing, and he, he says, what are you fucking doing? Uh, we've, got, we've got something happening here on the moon. Now, Beefheart, through his watch all, can see uh, that um, something weird's going on on the moon. So uh, he's trying to get Sue and her, his father to listen, but they won't. They're too busy watching first roller derby and then the moon landing. No, sorry, not the moon landing. That's five years later in the, in the second script. So they're watching roller derby. Um, so uh, now another thing about beef art he used to have these rashes and if they got really bad he'd have to go hang out at some relative's house, house and lay low so that nobody saw him so Frank refers to that says beef art we see him digging away at an imaginary nerve rash under his skin imaginary nerve rash his eyes are rolling back slightly he is muttering unintelligible things about a bread man and the bread man was uh, his father. His father was a bread man. So there's a little uh, exposure of Beefheart's actual life, or Don Fleet's life, uh, with his rashes. Um, then it says, uh, the, king, the king of the grunts, he has a torture room. And the king squats on a throne raised above the level of the others. The room is dark and dismal. The stone walls ooze green slime, which glistens in the eerie illumination. Dense putrid vapors rise from orifices in the floor, hazing the scene. So you, in the 70s, there's a song called um, The Torture Never Stops. And this evil prince is torturing uh, people and other things in, uh, in the basement. And I think it has green slime walls. So the torture chamber is a key motif that starts off in 1964. And it's a putrid environment. Uh, that's how uh, the, uh, the evil uh, prince is doing it in Virginia uh, many years later in the later song. Okay, so we're almost finished here. 
Um, uh, Billy says, uh, he says, shucks, here I thought all the time that you and your little buddies lived up here. Well, you live and learn. This phrase, you and your little buddies, you hear Frank use that in another song or two. When he's mocking uh, fads, he says, you and your little buddies. So it's already got it here in the script. Uh, and this is a year before the mothers, the mothers of invention are formed. Um, So Johnny, he's now forced to deal with Billy. He meets Billy and Cecil and Larry. He says, uh, he says, wow, I'll be dot, dot, dot. Never in my wildest imaginings could I have foreseen anything of this magnitude. Here I am, back to back with a being from another world. He thinks Billy and Johnny have been captured by the king of the grunts, and they're tied up together back to back. And Johnny thinks Billy is an alien. Here I am, back to back with a being from another world. I mean, people up here on the moon, I could have figured. I had my suspicions about this place for a long time. But as far as the other, more distant worlds was concerned, well, I just never would have believed it. Say, maybe we can work a deal. You got the spaceship and I got the brains. Maybe together the both of us could escape. You ever hear of a place called Earth? Billy, Billy, marveling at Johnny's stupidity. Of course, you idiot. Can't you see that's where I'm from? Johnny says, you from there too? Hot dog. Now we're talking the same language. It's a good thing you didn't turn out to be one of them extraterrestrial beings. And Billy goes, is that so? Or is that so? No, it's a question. Is that so? So maybe Billy is extraterrestrial. I mean, he managed to take a cardboard fucking uh, vehicle to the moon with a special fucking liquid. <laughs> so he, he may be, maybe Francesco Zappa is not from here. Francesco Zappa has not just been around for hundreds of years. He's a, a being from another world. So um, moving along here. So finally, um, of course, in the, in the course of uh, encountering Celestia, there's a big spider. So they have to deal with this big spider, and um, it lives in the cave. There's this cave motif. Frank's always describing a cave in these screenplays and, and when he was interviewing the Rolling Stone in 68 he had himself photographed in front of a look like a cave and it was probably the secret tunnel to Harry Houdini's house from the log cabin but I'm not sure but he definitely had Frank presenting himself as a caveman um, the cage okay uh, so the first grunt the king opens the cage uh, which the first grunt didn't know about, and the king says, the cage with the giant spider in it, of course. And then he tells him to push this button, and there's an electrical crackle. And it gives, it gives the giant, this electrical crackle gives the giant spider a little electrical shock and makes him mad. Remember, it's usually best to starve the spider for a couple of weeks before using him on Earth people. So the king of grunts wants the, uh, the um, spider to eat uh, jo uh, Johnny, Billy, Cecil, and Larry, but uh, Celestia doesn't want that to happen. So we're moving along, coming close to the end of the script. Another case where Don, Captain Beefheart, is, is um, he walks along, he looks back over his shoulder occasionally at Sue, his mother. He's also scratching the nerve rash under his neck. Um, the swan, and then uh, Sue comes along and and. Uh, meets the, the spider who is crawling on ready to eat whoever it encounters. So she managed to take a swatter and hits the spider in the eye. And it says the eye, in reality a chicken egg injected with food coloring. The eye is crushed, releasing a quantity of multicolored goo. Now the spider is identified with the eye. Center margin structures that came in with the printing press uh, what was it uh, in the uh, box image of the universe of the solar system? You had the sun, and then that's the center, and then the planets are going around it like they're the uh, margins. So a center margin structure, a visual hierarchy comes in with the eye, and the spider, McLuhan has a picture of the spider uh, in War and Peace and Gold Village as a cartoon image of the uh, Kaiser, either World War I or World War II. This spider is reaching out over Europe. So the spider is a traditional image for visual space. Are you there? Any people getting yes. this? Okay. Yes. Uh, so 
Frank seems to be aware of that. The the eye is where you nail the if you kick out the eye, then the spider is uh, diminished. So Defar's mother smashes the uh, the spider's eye, and all is fine. Um, so the uh, Larry and Cecil are, are not sort of noticed, and they come along, and they eventually beat up and kill the king of the grunts. So everybody uh, is looking good. Um, the uh, Celestia is happy because she um, uh, Billy's paying attention to her. Um, no, actually, she dumped when she thought Billy was dead. She jumped on Cecil, so she's hanging out with Cecil, and, and she's saying, uh, "Well, maybe it, she says they've taken Billy away and killed him. My beloved one, he's gone forever. He was so kind, so tender, so mature." Cecil says, well, maybe he's not dead yet. Maybe he's only hurt a little bit and bleeding. Celestia says, he must be. No man could, no man, he must be dead. No man could survive the terrible grunt tortures. He's gone forever. But she stops crying and abruptly lunges on Cecil. But I have you to love me for eternity, the two of us, repopulating the moon. Come with me, you you beautiful earthling. Let us all return to the subterranean gardens and consummate our love feast. So uh, in the celebration of uh, that Billy and Johnny, they can get back to the earth. And um, uh, Celestia is still alive. The grunt people are dead. Uh, she inaugurates an orgy. So it says, um, Beefheart, whenever he induces himself, I didn't read this. I think I read it last week. I'm Captain Beefheart, and this is my loyal assistant, Sue. I'm magic, and I can make myself invisible and fly through time and space, another dimension. And that's how I got here. So, uh, yeah, Beefheart, um, he, get, he goes up to the moon and helps out. Well, that's led to Sue being the person who knocks out the uh, the uh, spider's eye. So basically, you got Billy, Cecil, and Larry land on the moon, meet Celestia, uh, and then Johnny shows up. Then they have to deal with the grunt people, uh, have a battle with them, and they beat, they win. And then they go and have an orgy. But uh, let's see. Um, uh, Beefheart offers to um, take a couple of people back with his interdimensional travel. Um, uh, Beefheart says, Our work here is done now, and we must be off to my secret mountain retreat to watch over good people everywhere and keep them safe from danger and harm and the forces of evil. And so in parting, may I say this, it's been a real pleasure to save you two fellows, and I know everything is going to work out fine for both of you. And so long for now, fellows, and God bless you. And he dematerializes. Well, um, uh, Billy and Johnny go join the orgy. And there's one last, uh, one last little interruption. Uh, yeah, the somebody is it the king, the king of the grunts, somebody. But Billy and Johnny are are, are um, still in trouble. But uh, Johnny pulls out a concealed forty-five and and he refers to a little reference manual and he thumbs through the book and reads aloud simultaneously shooting everything in the room. He, and Johnny says, it says here in the book, halt or I'll fire. Who goes there? Present arms. I, ne- I now declare this bridge open. So he's reading <laughs> some manual for a public <laughs> ceremony uh, to, to uh, guide him in shooting uh, whatever's left over in the executioner's room. Um, so Billy and Johnny are... Uh, you know, Larry and Cecil have gone off to the orgy, but now, a little later, Billy and Johnny get free. So it says, uh, Larry, uh, Johnny closes the book, blows the smoke away from his pistol, puts his arm around Billy, and leads him off screen. We hold for a dissolve on a nearby grunt. Johnny says, come on, old timer, this sort of thing always tends to upset me. So as the, as the credits are going up, you dissolve to um, the subterranean gardens. That's the uh, the place where Celestia has her orgy. So there's full blood orgies happening. And it says, the love feast is in full swing. We pan the scene, picking out interesting techniques here and there. We hold on Celestia, kissing Cecil's ear, as a strange figure passes in front of the camera. 
We pull back slightly and bring it into focus. It's Captain Beefheart. We zoom in as he winks and Beefheart beckoning to the audience. Come on, kids. What are you waiting for? So there it is in 1964 in clean America. Zappa in his movie is inviting the young kids at school to join an orgy. Now, that's pretty radical. That's pretty underground at that point, wouldn't you say? Are you guys muted? I have to wait a second. Or did you lose your bearings? Where are you guys? Oh, yeah. Uh, you're blocked, right? Hello. Bert? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh -oh. I dropped out a long time ago. But you had, did you have anything to say? Yes, I'm here. Did you have anything to say? Well, um, I don't remember anymore, but um, it's quite funny because uh, today okay, well, when we were making the the video, we were yeah. making a video. We, we saw this Captain Vifard thing. What was that? Uh, what did we see? Yeah, the, the, there was a light in front of the screen. And oh, yeah, 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 this the apparition. Right, this apparition appeared right there yeah, on the screen. Captain Beefheart. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now I'm looking at, um, did Bill, no, uh, Bert should be here. I guess he just got knocked off and he'll get back on. Um, typing up a storm uh, at the uh, on the chat line, we might get to that. But, now here's my, I want Bert to hear this. Uh, what, um what can I say? Where are you, Bert? Uh, I, I was also thinking about what he said. Music expresses the heart and the soul. I mean, now that we know what we know, we know music cannot express the heart or the soul. Right. And uh, I was thinking, what does music really express? Um, it's, it's the most harmonious version of social mortar. It connects people. Social mortar is language is there to connect people, like non-physical. And um, the language is a little more complex than pure non-physical. But uh, music is the uh, the best achievement of social mortar. It's not doesn't lead to salvation, but it is the uh, perfection of of human communication. Wouldn't that be the role of it? Uh, or I was thinking maybe it was like. A the first type of abstraction, like we want to develop the phonetic alphabet with giving this phonemes a symbol, a letter, yeah. uh, uh, and music, uh, and, and this was the first abstraction, but maybe music was the first type of um, abstract language, that's something we could communicate with without uh, mortar without words yeah without without semantics semantic uh verbal interruption verbal confusion it's it's pure language pure social mortar it's social mortar and i had said that i had said that music is part of mortar it's not um the communication that people well that i am projects on uh transcension Yes, and I was thinking effort? what type yeah, of creations we want to have when the, the senses are no longer separated and, and we have this synesthetic perception and we can see well, the Ian, sound I, and hear the right, light. Well, Ian gave us it. Right, Ian told us. He said uh, when you have an orgasm, your whole body will ripple. Your whole skin will ripple. <laughs> That's what people will be doing. So that would be their real rock and roll. Yes. The oh, and I wanted to say the rock and roll. Having... Right. Uh, and McLuhan said uh, Joyce had stone and water in every line. Stone is rock, roll is water. So rock and roll is the basic dialectic between uh, water and stone. Uh, it's spinning and ease in, in not Listen, in and, and you were saying at the beginning we are the stone the rolling stone yeah help where no zap a song help i'm a rock <laughs> where's my roll but uh uh did i say we're a stone did i say that something like that <laughs> yeah that, that. we are now 
the magnesium or oh, stone yes. or something. Like that. Yeah, once what well, once we I said we are mineral. You know, we're not even human. There's no chemical body. Everything's been wiped out. Yes, we are. We are just a, a slab of dirt. <laughs> or the rolling dirt. stones. <laughs> rolling stones. That's right. So, Bert, any comment before I give the big summation? Do you hear here? me? Do you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Oh, I, I thought I was muted. I thought I was muted. No. Um, no, I unmuted as soon as you showed up. Oh, I didn't hear. It. Um, the music. The mu- Ion said music is part of mortar, but also McLuhan yes. said that music is uh, speech slowed down. So is yes. that what Ion's referring to, that music's part of mortar? But we're moving to with um, payday more of a complex or a collage of speech, music, or actually including everything. Yes, yeah, synesthesia. Yeah. That's why people start having anomalies. There's actually a synesthesia effect of uh, ion. And they start mixing up their, their brains and, and senses get addled like on LSD. And uh, they start having interesting experiences. So is that, is, is, so I, what ion, what the big picture, what ion's doing is they're changing our um, corpus callosum, perhaps? They're, they're changing so the whole physical body, the cellular structure, so that you are not going to be made up of what medical anatomy says you're made up of. You're not going to be following those biological rules. And the more adept you are, you'll be able to adopt any form. Yeah. That's what's fun about this, this um, before you go to recap of Zappa, is because from what I'm gathering, it, it's... It's like a, like a large collage of all the experiences that most people have had involving music. And then if you include uh, McLuhan with the print and the alphabet, Zappa covers it all. That's why I, I, I agree yeah. with you and Rock Banner that he is the, he's the last great composer because he included everything. A lot of people, just like yeah. most of the Zappa fans, will just look at Zappa as a musician. But what you're presenting right. and laying out here... The dude was really a lot larger than just a musician. I mean, he's a, like you said, a, um, compo- uh, what, do you, what do you call it? The, uh, you should have had a word for it. Um, satellite conductor. He's a satellite conductor. Satellite conductor. conductor. Satellite conductor. Yes. <laughs> yeah. You know, two points. Remember when uh, Michael Blake Reed, you know, channeling the Evergreens, when I talked to Frank through him and the Evergreens, when he came out of it, he says, holy shit, I was inside Frank's brain. It was huge. He had many projects going. I've never been in anybody else's brain. This is what Michael's hallucinating oh. in his dream state when, when he's out, and un, you know, unconscious, but he's dreaming. And he dreamed of being inside Frank's brain. I could probably read the transcript. Uh, you know, we have it here somewhere. Um, but uh, that's interesting, right? Yeah. He, he, right. He, he, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, because we yeah, know dreams but, are part of little trouble. I mean, beg your pardon. Maybe we do that. Dreams are not the uh, dream; it's real trouble. That's right. Yeah, he yeah. actually went somewhere. Uh, and maybe Zappa was this uh, you know, five hundred year old guy, and brain was expanding. He used to talk about uh, Doc, Uncle Meat would uh, expand the brain cells of ruminant jets, uh, and it would show by their noses getting bigger. I think that's what it was. He, the, the extra, he talks about extra cells. Holy shit. That's the uh, 144,000 double helix strands <laughs> in the nose. <laughs> I have to get the, the notes to that and read it ex- precisely. But so... My- so um, but no, Michael Blake Reed. He said he was in. He felt he was in. Yeah, in Zappa's his, brain. Inside Zappa's brain. He said, "I never was in anybody else's brain." You know, people talk to people, and Michael's dreaming about the person. He never dreamt of the person and experienced the inside of the brain. He said there was all kinds of projects, and I think he says, "Why didn't you?" He asked. Uh, oh yeah, in the dream, he asked Frank, "Why?" Why didn't you, uh, you do all these other projects? 
And uh, Frank says, um, well, it's because of the name. I, I had uh, a lot of bad association with my name. People didn't want to work with me or something. And then uh, Michael said, he said to him, well, why don't you change your name? And Frank said, yeah, I had thought of that. And then it petered out. But there was a conversation. Michael was just curious. So you got all these other things you can do. And the other thing is you got Frank. He's not only he's not only the last musician. He's making the last grand humanist gesture. He's running for president. That's the final yeah. art form, <laughs> which, which happens in the movie The World's Greatest Sinner. He's acting out what uh, Tim Carey presented in World's Greatest Sinner. You know, this insurance salesman gets bored. He, uh, he, Elvis is happening in the late 50s, so he says, mm, I'm going to do that. So he, he makes up a, a rock band and acts you know, totally crazy on the stage, way crazier than, than Elvis, epileptic fits and everything, and he becomes very popular. And then he... Um, he forms a religion, and then he seduces 14-year-olds and, uh, and old women and gets the old women to give him his, their wills and testaments. And uh, so he builds up that empire, and I'm not sure if he, if he becomes president, but eventually he uh, decides to uh, go after God. He challenges God. And then I talked about that. That ends up in a disaster, I think. Uh, but he was the world's greatest sinner, and he goes from, you know, working stiff to uh, an entertainer to a politician, and Frank was doing the same thing. And, you know, Dr. Zircon, we're going to find out, is a, a term for the devil. So here's Frank calling himself uh, uh, Dr. Zircon. So, uh, and you remember, he, his brother, his brother uh, Frank, when he was like late teens, early 20s, he made told his pact. brother that he'd made a pact with the devil. So, uh, and I, that's acted out in the song Titties and Beer uh, with uh, Terry Bozio on drums. Uh, okay, now here's what Frank's doing. Uh, he recognizes that um, the satellite environment will turn the planet into a concentration camp. That's like the worst projections of what's going to happen to the global village. Now, he's coming up with his, on his own, maybe because... Being a, an intelligent artist or genius, he's picking up the implications of the new environment just like McLuhan did. So if you have a, a pretty open, perceptive mind, you'll come up with the same ideas as you observe the planet in the 60s. So, mm. But here's the interesting thing is that, Frank, he's not worried about a world government in the, uh, in the concentration camp. He's saying it will be run from the moon which is what Beefheart, no, no, Beefheart, Beter said, you know, 13 years later. So you have this battle for the moon. That's the leverage point. You know, Archimedes says, give me a place to stand and I can move the world. <laughs> so Frank says, okay, you have this space race, you have these crummy politicians, these jerks, and they're fighting secretly to buy the moon, to own the moon, to control the planet from the moon. So that's why he calls his daughter Moon Unit, Right? It's a, it's a mm. political statement. And, uh, and he writes a song called Concentration Moon. And he, in Time Magazine, he talks about the Uncle Meat movie being about the hippies gathered up and put in a concentration camp, in that case, in the Grand Canyon. And they're saved by monster movies, or by monsters from the monster movies. And um, you have here, uh, in this first screenplay, it's a battle for the moon. And... Uh, they find this monster, the, the cosmic queen uh, Celestia on there, and she wants to take over the planet. So it's, you have this simple image of a woman uh, who's a greed queen and uh, is, uh, wants to uh, be the owner of the uh, Earth as a concentration camp from the moon. Um, well, maybe, maybe the a, control is not from the moon, but from other types of satellites. You know? Yes. Yeah, it could be, but they seem to, and, and, and Frank will, re, will, will repeat this in Hunchen Toot in 1972. In 1969, he uh, now has the money to make the movie, and he gets Grace Slick to be in it, and Jim Morrison. They don't make the movie, but he uh, takes the script from 1964, and he changes a bit, because now it's not Cape Smedley. There's an actual landing on the moon happening in the summer of 69, and this transcript is, is signed September 13th, 1969. So it's two months after uh, 
yeah, a month and a half or a month and three quarters after the actual landing on McLuhan's birthday, July 20th, 21st, 1969. So he's dealing with the facts um, of uh, an actual moon landing, where in 64 he's projecting it and the senator's in charge of it. But all this story about Senator Gurney and Johnny, the corn-fed astronaut, is excluded from the, from the 1969 version screenplay because he Frank just has footage of the Apollo landing he just uses uh, footage of uh, what's available by 1969 so it's just a general government mission to get on the moon and Billy is uh, like in the previous script he's planning and does the same thing as happened in the first script of taking over the planet but there's another dimension added and this is what's extraordinary um, let me see are you still there Bert yes yeah. Okay. So, um, so McLuhan is saying the global village is going to turn into a global theater. We're going to see Frank update the concentration camp theme with the global theater later. Uh, but in '69, he's talking about um, concentration moon, a monster which could save us, could turn against us, and then there's this other weird monster, the spider. And uh, that can be a problem, too. Remember, there is a spider in Huntington, I think we talked about it a little while ago. So he's, he's, he's obsessed with um, the effects of the satellite environment. That's why I call him a satellite conductor. And I called him that, you know, 20 years ago in Up the Earth Andy, but I hadn't read these scripts to make it a good reason. So that's an example of me intuiting the right imagery. You know what I mean? The right statement. Yeah. Yeah. I, I prophetically came up with it, and now I know why I should have come up with it. So, um, so it ends with an orgy, and there's Frank, you know, educating the high school and telling the kids to start having orgies. Now that's before the sexual revolution of the mid '60s, just before it. But by the late '60s, the sexual, so-called journalistically sexual revolution has happened, so it's not a, a, an issue. Um, for Frank to uh, make part of his programming in classroom, right? It's obsolete. It happened anyway. So, yes, but like, so the um, right wingers say, Bodriya ask, what are you doing after the orgy? It's, it's not yeah. the meat sack orgy, but the orgy with your all six bodies. That That's we are right. In. That's what they don't know. <laughs> the, uh, Bodriar didn't know that. But the, the other point about Zappa is, what? Um, oh, yeah, the right wing, when he gets on crossfire in the 80s, people like Pat, yeah. who's that guy who ran for Buchanan, Buchanan Pat Buchanan and those guys, uh, he's a spokesman for the right wing. He, he says, well, Frank, you, the revolution, the sexual revolution you started, they, they think Frank started, and in a way he did. <laughs> yeah. He was the first guy in pop culture to be out there blatantly advertising the groupies and celebrating groupies in rock and all that. In other sexual aspects, he was seen as a sexual anarchist. Um, he celebrated, even though he's married, he celebrated uh, having groupies. Um, let's see. No, but so, he, he had this um, open polygamy or honest polygamy concept. That's right. He had a couple of his girlfriends live with him while he was married to Gail. He, he was in this really? environment, and that was the thing, like... He was honest about he it. He was, yeah, he, he was, was in this environment about of rock, because, you mean? Uh, yes, of the groupies. And, yeah, he was and, honest about and, it. Uh, That's right. Um, and, let me uh, see, what else was going to Even in, a, in an interview, he says uh, his wife had to get um, the drugs to heal some types of uh, sexual infections or well, she, yeah, he. Uh, that's what she says when she first uh, met him. He was filled with crabs. He said. He said that uh, Frank. Uh, she said that you know the, before she met him, he had all these groupies around him and a, a prostitute. Too, and she said that Frank and her his girlfriends, you know, spread the crap or crabs all over Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> that's what they were doing. So so many so many people in Frank's orgy scene were were uh, infected. The love I didn't of Celeste. Which yeah, the philosophy of Celestia, constantly trying to get an orgy going. Um, 
so what I think there was another aspect so he the moon the concentration camp you see when he quits the, the mothers and he gets attention in October 69 he's in Time magazine he says the concentration camp is run by a, a, a Colonel Sanders doll you know the Kentucky Fried Chicken guy a little doll in the glove compartment of a Volkswagen that's a little more surrealistic than than um, some politician like Senator Gurney running the camp or uh, a queen of green skin running the camp. So um, he's using uh, his movies to lay out other scenarios. Uh, is there anything? And it's interesting um, how uh, he has uh, Beefheart being this guy who's uh, monitoring everything, is interdimensional, and he's <laughs> inviting the kids. He materializes. To yeah, 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 yeah. These are, I mean, you could say this is some kind of science fiction, but, and done yeah. in other things, but there's something different about this, uh, because Frank is what he but, is. Uh, I call it Ion. We could write something about you, the same, like, here's this yes, uh, art this, uh, I scientist. Know. I'm a, I'm an artist scientist. I've got crabs. I've got fucking <laughs> syphilis. <laughs> Diarrhea. I'm a fucking walking pollution. With these non physical things. Yeah. I got uh, my spider of destiny is fucking eye on. That's my monster. I <laughs> <laughs> got this fucking monster that can wipe out anything. They call fusion to conquer yeah. planet X. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. I hadn't actually made that clarify. Frank is literally writing the biography, Bob, because I told him to, because I had said I was fucking controlling Frank, as is presented in 1967 in my diaries. I have the meeting of all of them at uh, Stanley's in the village, in East Village, where Board used to be a bartender. And, uh, His master plan, plan written by angels master... in tiny charts. Yes. Yes, the discarnate angels, that Frank and Beefheart are acting out the angelic plan. Um, now, I want to go to the second one, the five years later, and this is incredible. I don't have to review. It's the same scenario, um, uh, and there are a couple of footnotes uh, we can do until I get you to the incredible punchline. Um, let's see. Get to the that. I know I ticked off a few things at the end. Uh, did he upgrade the plot like he did uh, with the uh, 64 and 69 version? With the one you get ready well, to read? Well, this is. I'm. I'm I'm going to, I'm looking at the 69 version, and it's upgraded. Oh, okay. It's changed, it's, it's a, ba I didn't have to, I read it all through, and I didn't have to uh, change anything, or I didn't, I couldn't even annotate new things, because it was the same script, until you get to the end. So it's exactly mm. the same thing, and it, he doesn't, you, you no longer have Johnny, the corn-fed astronaut, uh, working for the uh, government, Senator Gurney. That's gone. Uh, and uh, so Billy is competing against, Cape Canaveral. He's calling it no longer Cape Smedley. It's Cape Canaveral now. You know, it's, it's the actual what NASA was doing from the actual place. Uh, but I was see. thinking, uh, science fiction is nothing compared to the real art science nonfiction of what right. things are, according to Ion. It's like we are fallen gods going back to a place of power and all this. I mean, it's it's beyond any science fiction when we think about it. That's right, and uh, even McLuhan said that Finning his wake was science fiction, and most science fiction was puny. But and the science fictionists didn't know that Finning's wake and Wyndham Lewis were science fiction. So uh, it's Cape Kennedy now, the Cape Kennedy Apollo launch. Is that Cape Canaveral was? I know that was a term. That Cape Kennedy is what they called it later. Uh, after no, I think he's just Cape playing Canaveral. with the words. Yeah, maybe. No, no, I think it was that. Cape Canaveral, and then Kennedy got assassinated, and they changed it. Let me just check that. Um, hmm. Yeah, because when the twist came out, 
McLuhan went on TV and he called it the Cape Canaveral caper. So McLuhan was even saying there's something fishy going on at Cape Canaveral. He called it a caper. These guys getting these budgets to do 19th century research by physically going <laughs> to the moon. <laughs> okay, Cape Canaveral. Uh, hmm. It says Cape. Can you guys don't know the term Cape Canaveral? Yes, yes, I know that's, that. That's the I only just, one I know. I, I, I think that uh, it is the Kennedy, Kennedy Space Kennedy. Center, though. Oh, yeah. It says Cape Canaveral is a cape in Brewerd in Brevard County, Florida, near the center of the state's Atlantic coast, known as Cape Kennedy from 1963 to 73. It lies east of Merritt Island, separated from it by the Banana River. It is part of a region known as the Space Coast and is the site of the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. Since many U.S. spacecraft are launched from both the station and the Kennedy Space Center on Merritt Island, the terms Cape Canaveral, Canaveral, or the Cape have become metonyms that refer to both as the launch site of spacecraft. In homage to its spacefaring heritage, the Florida Public Service Commission allocated Area Code 321 to the Cape Canaveral, Air, 321, right, 321 countdown, to the Cape Canaveral yeah area. Other features of the Cape include the Cape Canaveral Lighthouse and Port Canaveral, one of the busiest cruise ports in the world. The city of Cape Canaveral lies just south of the Port Canaveral District. Mosquito Lagoon, the Indian River, Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge, and Canaveral, Canaveral National Seashore are also features of this area. So it does, it, it stopped being Cape Kennedy after 73. So uh, uh, don't know what happened after that. Uh, okay, so it's now Cape Kennedy Apollo moon launch. Okay, so let's move along here. Um, exact same scenario, Beefheart's traveling around interdimensionally. He takes his mother to the moon, and they've got to contend with uh, the captivity by, of, by the grunts uh, of Billy and Cecil and Larry. And, then, <laughs> <laughs> and there's the spiders there. And same line, the eye, Sue swats the target, the eye, in reality, a chicken egg injected with food coloring is crushed, releasing a quantity of multicolored goo that there. Um, so the first tick off is uh, page 84 of a script that's only 92 pages. Uh, let me just check page, 50. I thought there was something on page 55. No, not the page for drive. So, at the end, and it's going to be an exciting ending, guys. Um, <laughs> a happy ending. Mm, okay, <laughs> Celestia. Well, and now a, she, a, I don't a recall. Sappy ending. What? A sappy ending. You predict a zappy, a zappy ending or a sappy? Yeah. <laughs> Sappy like Sapa, Sappy and Okay, so five years later, there's a new element. Uh, Celestia has a secret uh, trapdoor, and is a purple secret trapdoor. Now, Zappa has a lot of his environment at his home in purple. Uh, the purple secret trapdoor with the diamond-studded handle. And when the Apollo moon landing guys land on the moon, it describes them wandering around the moon, and they don't notice the the cave and the secret uh, uh, trapdoor where this whole drama with Billy, Cecil, Larry, and Beefheart, and Celestia, and the grunts is happening. It says, um, let's see, Cecil and Larry with the girls, uh, but Cecil decides not to join the orgy. In this one, he, where does he say that? Yeah, so, Celestia falls in love with Celestia because she thinks Billy's dead. We did that. And she wants to repopulate the moon. And Celestia says, come with me, you beautiful earthling. Come, let's all return to the subterranean gardens and consummate our love feast. But now, here's where it's different. Cecil says quietly, you guys just go on without me for now. I don't feel right, and maybe if I feel better in a little while, I'll make it over to the party. I'm really concerned about Uncle Billy, though he hasn't found Billy yet. 
So Celestia fondles Cecil. Celestia, in brackets, obviously horny, and she says, but Earthling, our love feast, don't you want to go to our real lunar, don't you want to go to a real lunar love feast? Meanwhile, the other girls, uh, you know, friends, employees of, of Celestia, sorry, uh, are kissing and mauling Larry, who really likes it a lot. The other girls kiss and maul Larry, who really likes it a lot. It's the juvenile simplicity sometimes in, in what he writes, jokingly, satirically. Uh, so um, the other girls squeal and writhe at the mere thought of this lunar love fest or love feast. And then Celestia says, cool it, girls. Earthling, oh, earthling, my beloved earthling, don't you want me? Cecil, in brackets, not too convincingly goes, you know I want you, green girl. Why don't you give me a little map to the party or something? He says that not too convincingly, according to the script. So then Billy is in trouble. Uh, he thinks he's going to be killed. But... Um, Let's see, two, Beefheart and Sue come in. Uh, Beefheart says, I know I hear someone yelling. Sue says, the, uh, that asthmatic wheeze, I know that. I hear it too. It must be a janitor. So it says, all the girls are waving goodbye to Cecil, still mauling Larry, who is trying to wave, but is somewhat helpless in the clutches of the horny maidens. Uh, Cecil waves as they vanish in the distance. As soon, oh, before we do that, it says, remember, Celestia tells, Celestia tells Cecil, the purple secret trapdoor with the diamond studded handle. Then just keep going till he hit the crystal pool with the fra fragrantly scented oxygen producing giant subterranean ferns. Okay, um, just going back to where the astronauts, it describes the astronauts missing the trapdoor. Is that very far back? Uh, let's see. Okay. Still looking for it. Yeah, it's, um, I don't know if I'm going to find it. The point is that the, the purple door is indicated earlier in the script because Celestia is watching the regular Apollo moon landing from the secret door cave. Um, so I can't find it, but it's earlier. So now we come to the dramatic ending. So Celestia tells Cecil how to find the, the party. And then it says, Cecil waves as they vanish in the distance. As soon as Cecil is sure they are gone, he rips off the rubber mask he's been wearing all through the movie. The fiend beneath the mask is an unpleasant little man about 43 years old with a dingy blonde crew cut. He looks like an FBI agent. He tosses the mask aside and starts toward the unconscious king of the grunts. So Cecil's has been this dumb, dumb pony kid, right? All through the movie, this dumb assistant yeah. to Billy. All of a sudden, he's a fucking FBI agent. Okay, so that's page 84. <laughs> <laughs> and this shocking turn of events, and we got 92 pages. So for the next eight pages, here's what happens. Um, he's, he's now called Cecil Slash Agent. Cecil Slash Agent grabs the Grunt King by his hair and kicks him viciously in the groin. The Cecil Agent, you know, you know the, the FBI agent guy goes, where's the old man? The Grunt King, bleeding from the mouth. Uh, the Cecil Agent's pissed off. And he, he employs some Marine Corps interrogation tactics. And he says to, to the Grunt King, you want me to deal you a fatal stroke to the nose? Karate? Huh? You want me to hit your nose bone and make, make it go up into your brain and make you die? The Grunt King, semi-conscious, goes, uh. Now, back in the execution chamber where Billy is trapped, he hears the mumblings and footsteps of Beefheart and Sue as they find their way into the chamber. His eyes are closed in fear. He does not know who or what is approaching. In the previous script, five years before, he's tied up with Johnny. But there's no Johnny in, uh, in the 1969 script. So it's just been Billy by himself captured, ready to be killed in the torture thing. Uh, but things have happened that interrupted that happening. But now, some funny 
somebody's entering entering the chamber again. He's really paranoid. So Billy, devoid of all hopes, goes, oh, no, this is it. Oh, heavenly creator, deliver me in my hour of torment, in my final. But then Sue yells, we're here to save you. Beefheart and Sue dash up to Billy. Um, and Beefheart smugly says, that's right, Billy, I'm Captain Beefheart, and this is my loyal assistant, Sue. I'm magic, and I can make myself invisible and fly through time and space and other dimensions, and that's how I got here. I can take... It's actually saying more than the time and space and other dimensions. I don't know if that was other dimensions was part of the previous one. I can take other people along with me if I want to. And that's how she got here. I bet you're awfully glad. Now, in the early months with Ion, we've heard that little plan that Ion laid on me. That we're going to go up <laughs> in the Grand Malay and jump off the fucking hotel and go to other worlds. And not like the Mayans get stuck in other worlds or not return. We're going to return. All right, that was my first assignment. I didn't tell, <laughs> I didn't tell anybody that for years. I kept that one secret. Uh, and, uh, are we going to a cave? No, I don't know where we're going. We're going into other worlds, led by because, me. Because uh, Sapa always has, has this cave. That's right, that's the hollow entrance to the other world. Uh, he does say back in 64, I'm magic and I can make myself invisible. I'm magic and make myself visible and fly through time and space and other dimensions. Oh, okay, so he says that back in 64. So no new addition there. Okay, so they, uh, they save Billy. Now, the Cecil slash agent, he's looking for Billy and he's throttling the old king of the grunts. The king is looking very wasted and beaten up. Cecil slash agent, unbelievably vicious. Where is he, you communist son of a bitch? The grunt, the grunt king gesturing toward the door. He's, uh, he, he's in the execution chamber over there, uh, gasp. And the grunt king dies. So now Beefheart says, gesturing proudly, our work is done here now, and we must be off to my secret mountain retreat to watch over good people everywhere and keep them safe from danger and harm and the forces of evil. And so in parting, may I say this, it sure as heck has been real beautiful and quite an experience making it up to here to the moon to save you, Billy. And I think everything's going to work out just fine for you in the future, and I wish you all the best of luck. So long for now, old timer, and God bless you. So Beefheart and Sue dematerialize. Now, that's what happened in the previous script, but then Beefheart secretly goes to the orgy rather than back home, right? So uh, let's see. Is that what he says exactly? What he says at the end when they save Billy. Yeah, work is done here. Um, and so in part, I say it's been a real pleasure to save you two fellows. But it's no longer two fellows. So he says, and so uh, it sure as heck, he doesn't say heck in the first year, first one. It sure as heck has been real beautiful. He doesn't say that. And quite an experience making up here to the moon to save you, Billy. In 64, he says, it's been a real pleasure to save you two fellows, and I know everything. So he adds this bit about it's been real beautiful and quite an experience. That's sort of like hippie talk, which is now in the media five years later, you know, saying things are beautiful. And um, everything's going to work out just fine for you. And, um, and so long for now, fellows. But in 69, he says, so long for now, old timer, and God bless you. He says, God bless you in 64 also. Okay. So we know Beefheart uh, ends up at the orgy, and that's sort of a happy ending, right? And they're just in, uh, hoping the high school kids come to the orgy. <laughs> but now, here is Cecil has been fooling us all along, and now Beefheart is heading off to the secret retreat, and I'm saying, hmm, he'll just end up at the orgy. Uh, and then it says, a medium shot, Billy showing door and background. Billy is completely confused. Beefheart and Sue said they came to save him, but, but now he's still shackled to the torture rack. They didn't, they didn't get him off the torture rack. He hears the door from the Grunt King's throne room creak open and strains to look over his shoulder to see who it is. He sort of thinks it's Captain Beefheart coming back, but it turns out to be Cecil slash Agent. So he enters the room and says, is that you, Sweeney? Billy startled. Yes, of course. I'm Billy Sweeney, king of the moon. Is there anything I can do for you? The Cecil agent. Are you guys still there for this climax? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. For the climax. 
<laughs> Cecil agent approaches quietly. An air of mysterious doom pervades. We hear Cecil's footsteps and Billy's labored breathing. Cecil confronts Billy. Billy goes, who are you? And Cecil says, matter of factly, it's all over, Sweeney. We've been checking you out for quite some time now. Remember, this is the, uh, the government who did the official uh, space um, landing, and they're pissed off that Billy got there first. Billy, who's confused, says, what? I don't get it. Who are you? Now, Cecil Agent is staring psychotically into the camera. Cecil Agent, in brackets, cold and sinister, says, the United States government, the United States government does not like dreamers. They are dangerous. They cause confusion. Now, in 69, uh, Zapp is interviewed in Circus Magazine, and I think it's in there, it's like the first time you see it. He says, we make an environment... Uh, special for dreamers and is not hostile to dreamers. So we make, Zappa saying, we make an, there's the programming, we make an environment. Can you see, you know, Oprah saying, not, I'm here to help change the world, make it a better place. No, does Oprah go, we're here making an environment to program you into a better situation. Well, that's what Frank says. We are making an environment for all those dreamers that uh, the rest of the world is hostile towards. So, so right that summer he's saying it, in, uh, in 1969, and then he's going to write this in the script. The United States government does not like dreamers. They are dangerous. They cause confusion, ferment, and sometimes even happiness. You dare to dream the great American... <laughs> you dare to dream the great American dream. The one where you start on the bottom and work your way to the... <laughs> what? The great American dream. Yeah, Dean, yeah, dream, yes. Dream. The great uh, now, remember... In, in, in 64, Billy is a janitor, but he plans to work his way up to the top of the, of the factory he's working for. But then the government takes away the contract, and Billy's pissed, but it's not going to stop him going to the top. He just changes his, his vehicle, and he makes a moonshot so he can get to the top via the moon, which is a, a modern update, Frank, seeing as the effects of the satellite environment. You don't want to take over the world. You want to take over the moon. Now, what are you saying, the great uh, uh, American Dean? What did you say? Yes, like your last name, Dr. Oh, Dean. Dean. Not my last name, Carol's last name, uh, but her Dr. fake Dean. last name. Remember, remember, her real last Dr. name is not Dean. That's name, named after Garrett. Uh, you <laughs> dare to dream the great American dream, the one wh where you start on the bottom and work your way to the top. You want to match wits with the system, the system in capital letters. You challenge its supreme authority in capital letters, its supreme authority. Defied its universal mediocrity. Billy Sweeney defied it in big letters its universal mediocrity. All because you were a dreamer, a dreamer in capital letters. The great American dream is phased out and permanently canceled. On behalf of the government of the United States of America, the business community, all organized religion, mass media, and the armed forces, I perform this execution. Billy is, it says, Billy is terrified. Close up on Billy. He's terrified. The Cecil agent shoots Billy five times in the chest and stomach with an Army 45 while Billy stares in disbelief directly into the camera. Spo smoke from the shots enter frame. Billy bleeds from mouth and nose as his head falls to one side. Billy dies. Hardly a happy ending, Roxy. Billy's fucking dead. That didn't happen in 1964. Damn. Now, here's, here's the connecting link. You go to the Uncle Meat booklet put out the same time as the script being is written, and there's a picture of an artichoke, but it has Frank Zappa's face on it. And it says, I've just been killed by the government because I knew too much. Frank, or a Frank <laughs> simulation, or a reference to Frank, is uh, being, uh, has been killed. That's the level of Frank that's Billy Sweeney, right? Is that the world is becoming quite paranoid, I guess, for Frank by 69. He's nervous. He thinks he's going to be uh, killed. So he has it himself act out in that movie. Uh, he didn't have that in 64. It wasn't that doom-filled. Like he says in the page before, uh, Cecil agent approaches quietly. An air of mysterious doom pervades. We hear Cecil's footsteps and... Billy's labored breathing. Cecil confronts Billy. So now, very sad. I bawled for two hours when I read this. Uh, 
Billy was killed. I, I, I couldn't take it. <laughs> I, almost, I almost committed suicide. It was a horrible ending. I didn't see it coming. <laughs> I had fantasies of more orgies. But um, it says, <laughs> the Cecil agent, I forgot to finish the sentence. He says, on behalf of the government, look who he lists. The government of the United States of America, the business community, all organized religion, mass media, and the armed forces. That's five quadrants, five sections. I perform this execution, dot, 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 to keep the free world safe from scum like you and even the moon. <laughs> so we're going to keep the, the, the moon free. I think that's the way. To keep the free world safe from scum like you and even the moon. I guess even keep the moon safe. So Billy the scum fucker dies. So then you have um, a medium shot of Cecil agent with Billy slumped in the background. Then the Cecil agent says, this is a recording. And you freeze Uh-oh. frame. And so Uh-oh. Cecil is a fucking recording. Freeze frame <laughs> and dissolve to uh, beef art in the watch all room. Beaver's not at the orgy. He's gone back to the secret mountain reclusive place center. Um, and he has, uh, says, we see an extreme close-up of the dossier, Mark Sweeney, shown earlier in the film. We pulled, remember he, he showed that to somebody. We pull back to a medium close-up of Beefheart as he holds the dossier, studies his cover briefly, finally reinserting it into the slot in the watch all machine. So this beef art, this beef art doesn't care about Sweeney, or he doesn't know, but he's watching everything. I think he should know. He pushes a button. The machine swallows the dossier, and the view screen lights up. On the screen, <clears throat> we see the frozen Cecil slash agent posed in front of the lifeless Sweeney. Beef art looks at his wrist, wristwatch, takes a drink of Pepsi, and pushes another button marked auto-destruct. So beef art doesn't even care that Sweeney's dead. Uh, the sound effect, the sound effects in the environment around Beefheart. I mean, he's supposed to be in a secret. Well, maybe he's not in a secret retreat. He's just he's at his home because his parents. It says Roller Derby, Roller Derby on TV in the living room. Sue and Glenn cheering and raving their favorites. Glenn farts. Sue tells him to stop it. Glenn says he can't help it when he gets excited and he farts again. So that's the uh, what's happening. Uh, Around beef art. What does he say? What does he call it? He uh, Secret Mountain Retreat is what he calls it. Okay, so maybe because beef art has many worlds, he can have the retreat right in his bedroom, right? He's in a different world the parents aren't aware of. So then it has a medium shot frozen on Cecil Agent with Billy slumped in the background. Cecil slash Agent's face, his face melts exposing wires, worms, little clocks, and motors. It's kind of like the cover of Burnt Winnie Sandwich, which comes out in 1970. Uh, There's this surrealistic collage. So his face exposes, as it melts, exposes wires, worms, little clocks, and motors. His clothes fall away. His arms come off, and oil leaks out of the stumps. The remainder of his fuselage bursts into flames. So what do you think of that? What an ending for the government agent. (laughs) <laughs> so I guess he, <laughs> it, he, even it's even like the pictures get nailed. It's what? like a Bob uh, entry, a diary entry. Is like Bob is in this secret island, naked, controlling yes. people from his Skype. <laughs> That's right. That's right. I'm <laughs> controlling <laughs> people through my Skype. <laughs> So it and says, doing this, uh, uh, obscure radio program on an obscure. <laughs> That's right. I won the Secret Council of 10 in 1988 by having an obscure com- election in my obscure radio show on CKLN. Yeah. yeah. Holy Opal. You already dissolved the golf. And now yes, I control the new golf. Anything, no new golf will be rebuilt without my say so. I, I'm like Billy Sweeney. He went for the moon. I fucking own the golf. I went for the real stuff. I bought and took majority shareholder of the golf. <laughs> so it says 
B parts in his watch all. That's watch hyphen A L L. In his watch all room, he's surveilling everything. It says B fart turns away from the watch all view screen, which shows a burning Cecil agent visibly dying. B fart goes to his closet and well, not dying, just dismant. He's a machine. He goes to his closet and, after fumbling through some clothes, whips out a costume that looks just like the original Cecil garb that Cecil agent the machine was wearing. He strips, now Beefheart strips to his underpants. That is when we notice a peculiar line around the base of his neck. Beefheart's neck is a line. He dresses himself in the new costume and rips off the rubber mask he's been wearing all through the film, revealing the fact that Captain Beefheart was the real Cecil all along. <laughs> <laughs> What an ending. So everything drastic is happening in the last scene. Uh, so it turns out Beefheart was wearing, uh, that Cecil was wearing a Captain Beefheart costume. Um, in the sound environment, more farts and roller derby and excited participation in the living room. So Glenn and Sue don't even notice that they don't even have a kid. The kid is a fake kid, and it's really Cecil. So Cecil... It's, it's now called um, Beefheart slash Cecil. The other one was Cecil slash Agent. So Beefheart slash Cecil t- tidies up a bit, scratches his head vigorously in brackets to get the circulation going from wearing the mask, holds his shoulders back, takes a deep breath, and dematerializes, leaving us with a view of the smoldering Cecil slash Agent on the view screen. And we dissolve to the lunar surface. And let's see... Uh, this, this script has not, we got, we're on page 90, only got three pages left. Dissolve to the lunar surface, night, and there's stock footage. Oh, yeah, here's where the, uh, I was looking for the astronauts. The Apollo astronauts cavort gaily with their scientific gear and bound past the stiff plastic American flag. So you have the stock footage of the guys uh, on, the, on the moon. Uh, and then it says special effect. Uh, the jostling real-life camera on the moon will pan to a nearby crater. It says real life, in quotes. The jostling real-life camera on the moon will pan to a nearby crater. Freeze frame on crater. I guess this is the camera that the astronauts took. Oxbury Inn. Is that a film term to Oxbury Inn? Oxbury Inn, secret purple trap door with diamond-studded handle, which is just closing. The American moon men do not see this. Their, quote, real-life technical monologue continues over this effect. So he's implying this is a fake moving, move, moon landing? The jostling real-life camera on the moon will pan to a nearby crater, and then you see uh, somebody going into the secret door. And then it says the, the, their, the American moon men do not see this. Their real-life, in quotes, technical monologue continues over this effect. I guess they're talking uh, the way... Uh, People saw it in the greatest educational classroom setting ever, McLuhan said. The, the big hidden ground of the moon shot, <coughs> the moon landing, was the fact the whole world watched it in a televised classroom. It was the greatest educational program ever, said McLuhan. Their real-life technical monologue continues. So I guess that's just him talking technically uh, that they faked in uh, Nevada, right, according to the Evergreens. Right. So there's this black cave. Now, it shows Beefheart Cecil closing secret trap door. Beefheart slash Cecil materializes with his hand on the latch of the secret trap door. He closes it, dusts himself off, and walks through the tunnel in the direction of a warm, glowing light and voices with hot joy in them. So he walks toward the orgy. Walks through the tunnel in the direction of a warm, glowing light and voices, I like this, with hot joy in them. Ever seen voices described that way? Hot joy in them? <laughs> Hot joy in them. <laughs> uh, sound. Hatch, clank. I guess the door, clank, and distant orgy. That's the sound background. Then on page 91 it says, Wide shot of orgy with Beefheart Cecil entering. All the green girls and Larry are nude, carousing shamelessly about the subterranean garden. Staging should be sexy, but so here's the instructions. Staging should be sexy, but reasonably wholesome, verging on naive. Beefheart Cecil enters, already stripping his clothes off. Remember, in the previous one, he just winked, and we didn't know if he took his clothes off. But here he is. Celestia, 
who's in love with Cecil, sees him, goes hotly, Earthling, oh, Earthling, you've come to me at last. Larry says, hiya, Cecil. Beefheart says, uh, Beefheart Cecil says, hiya, Larry, let's jump him. And uh, Beefheart Cecil has all his clothes off now. He and Larry ravage the flock of lovelies with depraved teenage abandon. So they gang bang all the girls, the green girls. <laughs> Beefheart <laughs> Cecil applies. <laughs> and that means he's ignoring. No, no, he's including Celestia. Beefheart, now this would be. Uh, the actual Don Vliet might be playing this guy. Who do we have? Um, in the script, Celestia is Grace Slick. Did I tell you this? So Grace Slick of the Jefferson Airplane is Celestia. The King of the Grunts is Don Preston, one of the longtime members of the Mother's Invention. Uh, Gorgonzola and some of the Grunts, they're called, they got names, Gorgonzola, Strinzel. They're members of Beef Arts Band, Rocket Morton and Zoothorn Rollo and Victor Hayden. And there's something called the Orcs, uh, played by Jeff Rochelle. I looked that up. That's some kind of fantasy, science fiction literature out of Doctor Who or something. You ever heard of the Orcs? They're, they're yeah. part of some children's show or something or science fiction bullshit. I don't know. Anyways, Orcs is played by one guy. Uh, Billy Sweeney is played by Bob Guy. Uh, I remember that guy. He... He was at the, oh, that's me, Bob Guy. Holy fuck. I didn't realize that. <laughs> Bob Guy. <laughs> Bob Guy. They don't know Bob's last name. They just call him Guy. He's a Bob Guy. It's just Bob, Dobbs, Marshall. Never <laughs> yeah, what the Bob. fuck he is. Bob, Bob guy. guy, Billy Sweeney. Now, there is an actual Bob Guy who made some recordings, I think, at, at the uh, Cucamonga studio. I'm not sure, but... I think that's an embed for me. Guess who plays um, uh, Beefheart's father? Howlin' Wolf, for fuck's sake. Who Beefheart, <laughs> Beefheart always sounded like Howlin' Wolf, so, it, so I guess he was Howlin' Wolf's son. So that's a nice joke by Zappa. The father is played by Howlin' Wolf, and, <laughs> and Captain Beefheart's played by Don, and Sue's played by Sue. So, so Beefheart, now, Beefheart was Cecil. Uh, and Cecil is Jeffrey Cotton, another member of the of the uh, beef art band. So it's, um, we don't know which guy is uh, beef art Cecil. It looked like beef art. So Don played that part, but then in the end it's now uh, Jeffrey Cotton. All right. And Bob Guy got killed. That's not good. Okay. So, uh, so now here's beef art and Larry ravaging the flock of lovelies with depraved teenage abandon. Beefheart Cecil applies most of his energy to Celestia. They make out and everything. The sound is uh, hot pants rock and roll music. Hot pants is, I thought, like 71, 72, but maybe in L.A. they've already got hot pants. Hot pants rock and roll music. The orgy sequence builds in intensity. Quick flashes of the dreary work on the lunar surface. So it flashes back to the Apollo astronauts. And they're doing dreary work, oblivious to the orgy. There's a plastic flag. Nixon's phone message to the moon. That's pretty boring. And interior shots from Beefheart's living room, complete with farts and roller derby, are all intercut with the stylized freak scene in the subterranean garden. So this mixture of the mainstream bullshit Nevada fake moon landing with boring phone calls from Nixon interspersed with the orgy in the subterranean garden. And the credits start to play over this crazed montage. As the last credit slide fades away, we see Beefheart Cecil locked in a passionate embrace with Celestia. We can't see their buns, but we know what they're up to. So we can't see their <laughs> bum screwing. <laughs> but we know what they're up to. Larry is passionately kissing and fondling the tits of a lovely green maiden. We zoom into an astonishing extra close-up of Larry's thumb as it depresses the maiden's left nipple. So we have we show we see Larry's thumb working working the maiden's left nipple. Freeze frame. Oxberry in fluorescent tattoo forming a neon crescent above Erolia. So on the nipple, a neon crescent is forming. Oxberry in fluorescent tattoo, a tattoo forming a neon crescent above areola, and it says auto-destruct. 
we saw that happen to um, DFAR blew up the uh, Cecil Cecil agent. Meanwhile, Celestia, she's, she's passionately saying, Earthling, oh, my beloved, dearest Earthling, hold me, kiss me, thrill me. And then there's a sound. It's an ob obnoxious buzzer. Unfreeze frame past the auto-destruct sign on the nipple. And Larry continues to fondle. Celestia is continuing to be worked over by Beefheart, or Beefheart Cecil, and she goes, My dearest darling, my earthling, all these years of hot longing and waiting for. Then there's a close-up close of Celestia and Beefheart Cecil. Her eyes are closed as she kisses Beefheart Cecil's cheek, which is melting away, exposing <laughs> wires and worms, etc. <laughs> Holy shit, Cecil's a fucking organic robotoid. She continues to kiss this mess obliviously as the film does its final fade-out. She doesn't even care that she's kissing a melting robot. <laughs> <laughs> and Celestia is saying, uh, she, is, she was saying, all these years of hot longing waiting for an earthling such as you, together we'll start anew, a beautiful life for both of us among the stars in the heavens, love and peace and kindness and hot thrills nightly. And then it fades out with Celestia all happy that she's going to repopulate the moon and bee farts melting away as a robot. The end. Now, how's that for a shocking ending? You know what it means? <laughs> I, I didn't say happy ending. What did you say? Did you say happy ending? I said that's a happy ending. Yeah, what a fucking ending. So yeah, it's, tell me uh, what it means. The metaphor of the yeah. making love. That's right. Now, this is 1969. Frank is writing about Beater's organic robotoids 10 years before Beater goes into it. Remember, President Carter's an organic robotoid. All kinds of people are replaced in 79 in the battles between the Bolsheviks and the Rockefellers and the Rothschilds and the Zionists. So here's Frank. Uh, Five years, from 64 to 69. Remember he said uh, in the liner notes to the We're Only for the Money in 67, he said he had some awful premonitions, right? And, they were, and the premonitions yeah. were going to continue. So Zappa, mm. being the monster man he is, he could see through everything. Everything looked so fake and ridiculous. The hippie counterculture was stupid. The elections were stupid, everything. And he decided that the machines would take it over. And so the title is Captain Beefheart versus the Grunt People. It's one organic robotoid android meme fighting another part of the android meme. Am I wrong? Isn't this pretty astounding? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. That's another sign of Frank Zappa showing hidden ground. Yes. I mean, it's... Uh, <laughs> Uh, pretty amazing. And now we we're going to get to them or us. What happens in the in the big book? I wonder. What is, um, should we uh, take a break and play a song? Yes. I Wait, you want to hear something. a Zappa song? Yes. Yes. Ooh, something funny. I'll play. Okay. Did I play? Did you hear the music in the first couple hours, uh, Roxy? No, I was sleeping. Right. So. Uh, because I knew you were coming later, I didn't uh, wake you up. For the beginning. So uh, you slept in. So I played um, Briefcase Boogie, Brown Moses, and Wistful Wit a Fistful, three songs from Thingfish. So I'm going to play um, oh. the fourth song, Drop Dead. It's near the end of the movie. Rhonda and Harry, the <laughs> yuppie couple that, that went to the play. Good copy or having... Drop Dead. <laughs> what did you say? What was the first one? Get happy or drop dead. Yes, get happy or drop dead, right. Now, let's see. Uh, there's all kinds of typing going on. We'll have to deal with that later. Um, so this goes on, I think, for uh, seven minutes. So this is a long thing. When you get to the last third, about the 520 mark, listen closely to what Rhonda says. Um, okay, so, uh, what? Rhonda is an inflatable sex doll. 
Uh, you're looking up something? No, I'm saying Rhonda is... Uh, well, how do you know? <laughs> I read it somewhere. It's okay. A, she's well, a, actually... She played a sex doll, just like uh, the other guys were robots. The Rhonda character is a sex doll. No, it's more complicated. There is Rhonda and Harry, but there's also an artificial Rhonda. And Harry is a boy. And this is not the sex doll Rhonda. This is the real Rhonda. I'm pretty sure. But we'll, we'll review that when we go through the book. So uh, have I got everything up, ready to go? Yeah. Oh. Yes, now I've got that blocked. Do I, do I need to unblock that? Can you hear me, guys? What's going on? Oh, wait a minute. Sounds like Bob's talk. You, can you guys hear me? <laughs> no. Yes. We are, okay. We are in another planet. <laughs> I just want to read you what you missed. With brown... Uh, <laughs> What? I'm going to read you what you missed. So, it's, so um, Rhonda said we were wearing little transmitters, little receivers in their severe terminal buns. Their hairstyle was buns. We even had room left over in there for all of our most favorite little embroidered, delicate, secretly feminine, childlike, helpless, pathetic, sentimental, totally useless, personal girl things that smell like the stuff they put in the toilet paper. And then you heard it came back in. At this point, and she goes, you played golf, you watched football, you drank beer, we evolved. We only look like Wanda's and Rhonda's. We are superb, Harry. We are sublime. We are perfect in every way. So I will now start up. That's about where we were. Uh, we are Iron Man. Back. Yes, right. Flor forcelings. Or maybe not. Forcelings. Iron Man's might be better. Um, okay, so we got that here. Uh... The dead pack up there. The second. All right. Um, th this this fucking Bill's network can't take the intensity. Um, you guys can hear me. Yes. We are okay. the ones with the strength. We <laughs> yes, are <laughs> the completion. We are the people who are not you. <laughs> <laughs> so, what can we, uh, as she says, um, you are the all-American cocksucker using the Harry went homo, uh, gay or something, or... I think he fell in love with one of the Mammy Nun dolls. Um, jizzing all over your leather cocksucker costume after beating the snot out of yourself with a rubber Mammy. Uh, yeah, he beat the Mammy on himself. <laughs> I simply can't respect you, Harry. You are no good. Go ahead. Smell the pen. Go on. I'm wiping it, Harry. There you go. During this, the lights have dimmed, leaving Rhonda in a spotlight. Harry crawls into the spotlight circle and assumes the traditional pose of the RCA dog, you know, the record player dog, yeah. begging to sniff the pen. Rhonda moves it higher and higher, torturing him. His nose finally reaches it. Francesco stands nearby, fetishing Abdullah, and one of the uh, little mammies. The track for No Not Now is played backwards. The first words are meant to be Harry's reaction to the odor of the writing utensil. Then it says, not really Harry's voice. He says, Epsom sauce, backwards. Then Thingfish comes in. So hopefully... This will be heard. Yeah. 
Ground control. <laughs> Kate Kennedy. We're lost in space. I hear you. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> Why can't I hear anything? What did yeah. I do wrong? Hello. We hear you, Bob, but it's like you're in the background. You're not online. I know. Uh, there is a dimensional <laughs> problem. <laughs> Get me a Pepsi or something. <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to I, I start the song over again. It's a good song. It's a good song. Yeah, it's worth this is the sound of the dynamo hum. Yes. Here is the... <laughs> this is how a dynamo hum. Bob, your voice is still in the background. You don't hear everything. What? You hear your voice, but it's like you're in the background. It's not like you're online. Oh, yeah, because I'm using the other mic. Yeah, don't worry about he's, it. He's fucking some green girl in the moon. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Stop masturbating. I'm You're on duty. <laughs> I'm duty on Harry's chest. Okay, so let's, let's resume. Okay. Then. I'm going to mute you guys. This is the sound of the moon ballet. Electronic <laughs> moon ballet from Mumbai, India. Adorned with the laughing of birds. Oh, yeah. Oh, Bob, yeah. we don't hear all your words. Uh, we can't hear all your words. Hey, stop okay. the love, please. <laughs> Come back. I figured, I figured out what's going on here. Um, okay, mute that. Bring up that. Put that down there. Okay. Uh, and then turn me off. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. That All right. Electronic you know what happened? Roll. You know what happened? I'm, I'm re th this is in the book. And I'm reading the lyrics in the book. It fucking ended because the song ended. I thought I, I thought we were going to hear the whole rest of the play. I forgot we were just hearing the song. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, the reason it stopped is the song stops, and and then so I've got to read you the script. Well, we'll do that when we get there. We got to go back to the beginning. But I was expecting the whole book would be musicalized, but no, no. We just heard the song, and then it stopped. And then there's a script here, but that's not audible, right? Unless I – no, it's not audible. Okay, so uh, was that funny enough? Was, you wanted a funny song? Was that good enough for you? Did, did, you, hear, did you hear that whole yes. women's lib scenario, the women's yes. conspiracy? While you became lawyers and accountants and read Playboy and bought a pipe – there's a direct attack on me – bought a subgenius pipe – we planned and dreamed and fucked our briefcases while you weren't looking. Yes, Harry, that's right. And we've actually been able to reproduce ourselves that way for years, Harry. But you never knew, did you, you worm? This would be um, that thing, somebody's list, Emily's list. You know what that is, uh, Bert, Emily's list? Uh, that was the in the boomers. news a couple months ago. Yeah, uh, all the boomer geez. women who got into politics and got some executive positions, they all – formed a tribe and started electing politicians, female politicians. So it's the, the tribe of women, Emily's List. They're very influential, so supposedly now. You know what I mean? They have some kind of power in the obsolete institutions while the uh, CIA continues its surveillance. Uh, and so this is describing that. And Frank is predicting this. I don't think – when did Emily's List form? Let's just check that for a minute. What year did Emily's List – uh, Emily's list. Eighty-five. Our history. 
They're pro-choice democratic women. A network, an evolution, a movement. Look at this. Emily's List, the largest national resource for women in politics, was created by Ellen Malcolm in 1985. They were influenced by Frank. They, this came out in 1984, <laughs> and, they, and they read it. So that's what we got to do. We got to form a secret Damn. society. <laughs> and it, it's, it, it's designed to fund campaigns for pro choice democratic women and strate strategically torchlight the balance of power in our government. The name Emily's List was an acronym for Early Money is Like Yeast, i.e., it makes the, ro the dough rise. It, that's the pun that Ian's always <laughs> using. Jesus Christ, as Ian's been quoting uh, the Union of Feminists. This saying is a reference to a convention of political fundraising that receiving major donations early in the race is helpful in attracting other later donors. Early money is like yeast. Now we know Emily is more than a slogan. She's a candidate, a voter, an operative, a member. If you've sought out this website because you want to ignite progressive change in your community, Emily is probably you. And as catalysts of change, we've changed too. Today's Emily list goes beyond fundraising with a strategic approach to recruiting uh, yeah, they went beyond fundraising now to recruiting candidates, winning elections, and mobilizing voters. We are a driving force behind many of the campaign victories that bring the progressive decision-making power of pro-choice Democratic women to office. Um, in 1985, 25 women, Rolo Dexes in hand, gathered in Eleanor Malcolm's basement to send letters to their friends about a network they were forming to raise money for pro-choice Democratic women candidates. So there's a picture of Emily. Or Ellen, Ellen Malcolm. So this is what um, Frank inspired a year before. Uh, she <laughs> said, Rhonda says, we had special atomic glasses made by women optometrists who promised never to tell. We learned how to hide secret stuff wrapped up in the middle of those severe terminal buns we wear. Little transmitters, Harry, little receivers. Oh, don't pretend to be surprised, Harry. We even had room left over in there for all of our most favorite little embroidered, delicate, secretly feminine, childlike, helpless, pathetic, sentimental, totally useless, personal girl things that smell like the stuff they put in the toilet paper. You played golf. You watched football. You drank beer. We evolved. We only look like Wanda's and Rhonda's. We are superb, Harry. We are sublime. We are perfect in every way. And you? What are you? You're the little all-American cocksucker, jizzing all over your leather cocksucker costume after beating the snot out of yourself with a rubber mammy. I simply can't respect you, Harry. You are no good. Go ahead. Smell the pen. Go on. I'm wiping it, Harry. There you go. And so during this, the lights have dimmed, leaving Rhonda in a spotlight. Harry crawls into the spotlight circle and assumes the traditional pose of the RCA dog, begging to sniff the pen. Rhonda moves it higher and higher, torturing him. His nose finally reaches it. Francesco Zappa stands nearby, fetishing Abdullah. And the track for No Not Now played backwards happens. And the first words are meant to be Harry's reaction to the odor of the writing utensil. I guess it smells like ebon sauce to him. Ebbs and dust. So that leads to the last three pages, but we'll, we'll leave that for when we get there. Um, would you like another Zappa music? Yes, I, I was reading about sure. Rhonda. Yeah. Uh, yeah. She evolves from the younger Rhonda is like a rubber sex doll. Um, and, yeah, right. And when she's older, she becomes a feminist, uh, fascist, right. and uh, Harry becomes homosexual as a result of the women's liberation movement. So that's yeah, why that's, she's that's what happened. insulting this little man. Yes, yeah, so he's been fucking everything in the theater and she's been outraged uh, throughout most of it, so she's pissed off. Um, and I think that's the last scene of them. That's the last you hear of them because it goes over to, oh, no, there's a little more Ronda. No, no. Yes, a little more Ronda. And then it's Francesco and uh, other important people like the President of the United States, Ronald Reagan. They end the thing. So um, what, do we, what do we do? So we're going, you're, are you guys ready to hear about Hunch and Toot? Are you ready to go to the next script? Yeah. It won't take us long. <laughs> You're getting the point here that you have a concentration moon. 
Concentration. I should play that. Let's play Concentration Moon, uh, that song. Okay, so that would be over here. Album by artist. We're only for the money. Scrolling down. But I was thinking um, all these um, hybrids of robotic. Um, he's actually seeing all, all the things you're saying about the Android name and all this human yes. invented technology. Exactly. That's what I'm impressed with. Um, um, is we're going to see that in the next, after Hutchinson in the book. It's pretty amazing uh, what he lays out. Um, we're going to yeah, and, and it's funny about. because the, this uh, living technology behave as bad as humans. <laughs> they do all this. Yeah. yeah. You should think. Okay, so I'm going to play Concentration Moon. Um, yeah, make sure everything's. Uh, this is from We're Only for the Money, so this was written in '67 or recorded in '67, released in '68. Bring that goes there, and I think this is it. No, I didn't hear the sound. Mm -hmm. Nothing is. How <laughs> did <laughs> Bob was? Uh, just a second. What's going on? What happened? <laughs> so, you can't hear it? No. No. There has Nothing been at all. Came through. I blocked He's something. Sorry, I'm glad you spoke up. Air. The moonbeams are oh. sabotaging. <laughs> you, you heard a, a minute and 19 seconds of the song, and you didn't hear it. I heard it. So let's start over again. I must have clicked on... That stupid mic, that one. I forgot to unmute mute that one. Okay, we're going to do it over again. Concentration Moon. Okay, listen to the lyrics. No playing. <laughs> Not playing. What the fuck do I have to do here? Sound is in headphone position. Volume is up. What are we doing wrong? Oh, maybe it has to be on Soundflower. Oh, because it's coming from my system. Uh, I figured it out. Okay. <laughs> 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 I forgot this is not on Bill's template. Beats Coming from my computer. Against the yeah. Yeah, I'm muting you too. Uh, email me if you fucking can't hear it. <laughs> okay. Here we go. Oh, no, we have to move it back. Then again, I'm not going to mute you. It'll probably screw up, so I better hear you screaming. Okay, I unmuted you. <laughs> if it go <laughs> Come on now, let's be polite. Let's be polite and listen to this. I'll compromise. Okay, 
Concentration Moon. Wish I was back in the alley. Listen to this. Hello. 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 Oh. I, I can be heard. What was that last song? What was that last song with that uh, Fuzz and Wah Wah? Le- um. That's called Deathless Horsey. A horse that doesn't die. Whoa. Deathless horsey. <laughs> that was the pony sent to the space that was dying. Well, that's right. That's right. Deathless. You know, he, it, when he did the theater piece at Garrick Theater in the spring and summer of 67, it was called Absolutely Free, colon, Pigs and Repugnant. So the pigs are, you'll see, an important thing, thingamajig. And then he has um, a lot about ponies. Uh, in the content of Lumpy Gravy. So pigs and repugnant or pigs and ponies, that's the dialectic. And ponies goes way back to Cecil running the uh, ponies ride in 64 in Cat Beef versus the Grunt People. So this punny pig dialectic. So Deathless Horsey is from 1981, Shut Up and Play Your Guitar, a series, three albums that Frank put out with just nothing but Zappa, Instrumentals, guitar instrumentals. So that was one of them. So um, let's see uh, if there's anything interesting uttered in the chat line before we go to Hunch and Toot. Um, Utney, uh, we did that. Eric Utney. Minimax says, um, Trump is a truth teller because not financially dependent. We did that. Trump is Arnold Schwarzenegger. Still looking, catching up. So my foster daughter, when I said we can't use the word God, creator, divine, and then she said, how can creator be limited? I said something, and she said, expected you would say that, but if we are speaking in words, what are the best words to describe ascended post-humans? L-Truth says, smotelings. (laughs) <laughs> Eliza says, or the Smoters. And then they start bragging. There, Bob, we came up with the new name for gods, the Smoters. <laughs> Laughing my ass off. So they're going nuts over their own creativity. Which has only had one syllable. Now somebody starts objecting to it. And then, then the new title, Post-Humanism Smoters. Oh, no, it's going to get longer than that. The post-humanism smoters of hypertexting. Then L Truth said, "This is good music here." Madeline goes, "Yeah, this is great." Madeline, I thought angels were the smoters. L Truth, yeah, Liza, we can't take angels' function from them, can we? Madeline, thou shalt not kill. Got a single, got a sick an angel on them, says Madeline. Minimax goes, "Smotlings, yes." He votes for that. Madeline laughs. E Truth laughs. Minimax goes, Attention heirs. Attention heirs. Minimax, ascended post humans. Yeah, we don't do the smoting. We order the angels to do it. But NVR in anger. Someone 224 goes, Hoops. And then Eliza says, I'm trying to come up with a good name for the post god. So put it in your suggestions. L Truth says, Oh, no, 224 starts flirting with the foster daughter. Empress, I got a brand new clothesline. L Truth says blank. Sarah says, let's play word association. Someone says, such a cool song. Sarah, little Sarah says, Zappa, what do you think of? And she says, okay, now, Yemen, Yemen, and you think. Then Sarah, little Sarah says, I wonder if they... 
the dis I wonder if they the dissonant ambient funk was recorded separately from the dialogue. So they're talking about some stuff we were playing a long time ago. So we're up to date on that. We can go back into our bubble and uh, explain everything. So are you guys ready for Hunch and Toot? Hunch and Toot, yes. Yes. That was the horny spider, right? Yeah. That, what? What about the spider? Hunch and Toot. The, the Hunch and Toot was the horny spider. The giant that. spider. Yeah. yeah. In the cast of characters, it says, um, we got Drachma, Queen of Cosmic Greed, an evil seven-and-a-half-foot space girl, so we're back on the moon, who lives on a mysterious unknown planet, well, not the moon, but similar, and who obviously has a sinister plan to conquer the very Earth itself. So is this, is this Frank afraid of women's lib or something? He keeps projecting <laughs> these women that want to take over the planet, <laughs> these monster women. And Hunson Toot is the giant spider, and she is Drachma's miserable hyper-negroid Harmonica virtuoso <laughs> love slave. Harmonica virtu virtuoso. Dirk is a shifty earthling con man of the future and part-time religious fanatic who leads a group of mutant alpha meditators known as the Forcelings and also plays Yay! a little trumpet. <laughs> yes, you've identified. <laughs> My leader. Yes. <laughs> okay, so did I read you the details of um, the setup? The instrumentation? I think I read some of it, right? Mm, I don't remember that. Mm. Okay, so Hunch and Toot's costume headgear will provide concealment for wireless mic number one, which is received and processed through the first ring modulator to make his voice deeper and gruffer before it is broadcast through the PA. Drachma's costume breastplate will contain a sort of cosmic telephone operator's microphone holder for wireless mic number two to be processed through phaser one, for vocals, and or the balance modulator for dialogue. The balance modulator, or Moog frequency shifter, has a stereo output which will enable Drachman's voice to ascend and pitch on the right side of the theater and descend and pitch, descend and pitch on the left side simultaneously, providing a suitably mysterious effect which is easily controlled. I remember reading that. The orchestra is subject to mixing and processing through the two voltage control filters, the two envelope generators, the two voltage controlled amplifiers, the four channel tape delay, in brackets, Sony quad one quarter inch machine, and the EMT reverb. Sectional outputs may be governed by keying from other voices or instruments via the keypexes. The keypexes will be used to eliminate noises, shuffling, mumbling, waiting, coughing, etc., from the chorus mics, the three wireless mics, the narrative mic, and the brass section mics. This device automatically turns the volume down on a given audio channel when there is not sufficient information coming through to trigger it. This will greatly relieve mixing problems. The device can also be used to turn other instruments or voices on or off in relation to a specific pulse. The bass drum could key the intermittent entrances of a held chord in the brass. Um, yes, you read that I remember now, but it's very interesting to, to listen again. He's giving all these uh, technical specifications for the characters to create um, like different types of filtering and, and paneling to create these mm, surround yeah. effects, which I, he's, I he's found very more of the technical, the technical harmonic climates, and he's got new technology to do with. So he's like really into the inventions that have come in over the last few years. At that point, he's really spotlighting uh, the new advances in the studio stuff. In the and right? That's what you uh, Expanding each character with uh, different types of sound processing to... Yeah, he's trying to show yeah. the, tip, the TV body and chip body in the characters. He's making these wow. technological apparatuses be part of uh, their being. Um, he says, the synthesizer section, one ARP, one mini Moog, is used as an instrumental voice or voices and for sound effects purposes. The ARP output is taken stereo direct into the board. The mini Moog output is a mono direct feed to a quad pan pot on the master board. The player monitors himself on a small amp. 
The guitarist will require a stereo direct from a pair of acoustic studio amps. The bass is received from an acoustic studio amp. In brackets, after the guitarist, he had electric six, electric 12, electric mandolin, and transducerized acoustic six. The drums, snare drum, bass drum, three tom-toms, hi-hat, ride, crash, rivet, and tiny cymbals, plus four cowbells and tambourine, are to be received in quad and mic'd in this manner. One bass drum mic, one snare hi-hat mic, one mic each tom-tom, one overhead mic favoring the cowbells. The bass drum front head should be removed as well as the bottom tom-tom heads. The overhead and tom-tom mic should all be keypacks tightly and reconstituted with the EMT in deep mode or its equivalent. The player can monitor the whole mix via headphones. Also required full lighting plus strobes, one red, red, one blue, one green, and a large screen for rear projection over the orchestra. Um, the right side of the stage is I, the I, earth during the force. Hmm? I find this very interesting because um, this is another aspect we haven't talked about, uh, technical yeah. specifications that go with um, playing live or you know his his um, setting was very complex because he had um, a lot of people on stage and yeah. sometimes he was playing in big venues and and um, there are a lot of uh, things that uh, get complicated when when you have to amplify for the musicians in the stage and for the audience and right. um, when you have this surround type of environment because you you get some feedbacks and yeah. you have um, all types of interference and noises and and uh, because he was such a perfectionist i mean the the um, the sound checks he i suppose he will he, he will do for a long time to check that each instrument is sounding good and then that if they move on the stage there is no sometimes for example from the speakers from the monitors on the stage do get the sound of radio waves so you have to move mm. them and all these type of things right so it's very interesting In to to see all the considerations that the, he put into his music, yeah. into the performance uh, of the theatricals, of the PA, all these different types of effects to enhance. When you what he when you worked uh, in the nightclubs, when you worked in nightclubs in Mexico City, you had to build the set and take it down. The other guys are too stoned. Did you organize the? Um, soundboard you yourself hmm. well it depends because um, usually you played with one or two bands and you had to go and make the sound check in the evening and uh, you have to when you when you play after somebody else you have to set up very fast and sometimes you yeah. do a checkup, but the things are different when you are actually playing. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you have to have a, a good um, engineer. Sometimes in the clubs or in the places where you're playing, there's somebody who knows the equipment and it's always there, so he knows more or less right. what to do. But that's not always the case. And... Um, and yeah, sometimes it was um, very stressful because the musicians are more concerned with the groupies than with the equipment. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Larry, and, yeah. You know, Larry especially. Larry is always with the groupies. <laughs> with the orgy Three. after the <laughs> yeah, concert. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, Yes, it's it's. Uh, but uh, but I, but you I you, you can understand he, partly what he's talking about here. Yes, I understand everything he's talking about, and I find it very interesting because he, he's, for example, the the mock synthesizer was a mono synthesizer. It's an analog type of synthesizer, and the 
harp it was like a new type of synthesizer at the time, and that already has a stereo, so that, that was maybe polyphonic too, because before most synthesizers were monophonic, and that's why he says it only needs one output. The song has to be stereo. And um, I remember something in, in 1968, the first commercial record of electronic music was actually this switch on Bach by Wendy Carlos. Yes, I remember that. Uh, yeah, and it's it's interesting that the first electronic record that became a hit, it was on the hit parade and they sold like 15,000 copies of that, mm. was uh, Bach music. Yeah, so that's also like, like um, marking some something, some yeah. change. Yeah, and uh, it was uh, uh, a really hard thing to do with that type of synthesizer. They had to to make like a collage of of what they were playing because you don't have the polyphonic type of sequencers we have now. They they will have to do parts of the tracks and of the music and then put them all together and at the end have this um, illusion that everything is played at once all together but it was really a lot of work to to do that and, and to reproduce orchestral sounds with synthesizers hmm. and um, that record um, really make electronic music popular because mm. that record made uh, like something a new technology be very known by a wider public you know, like this type of science fiction instruments but um, that was something that my mentor Antonio Rosek was always criticizing that in most science um, fiction movies they have orchestras. It's like instead of having really avant-garde electronic music, and only this uh, Forbidden Planet. That was the first movie with um, complete electronic music, mm. and it's also about a monster and a cave and all these types of things. Yeah. The likes. Right. Yeah. But um, yeah, I just remember that when he's talking about the. Mog synthesizer hmm. or Mog, I don't know how to okay. say it. Let's um, play this a little bit. Uh, what do I have on when uh, uh, that? So you take that off. So I'll play a bit of Switched On Bach since it was a historical. Yes, Bach made electronic music popular. What about that? Wow. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> wow. It is. So this is switched on Brandenburg Concerto number three. Well, uh, we get the idea. <laughs> yeah. But uh, we can... I mean, uh, yeah, we can really see what they thought was like a orchestra sound, artificial instrument. I mean, for us, it doesn't sound like an orchestra. It really sounds right. like a Game Boy. Right. Like a video and game. So that music. is, um, that electrically altered, well, what did Frank say? Electronically altered normal instruments. No, this is electric. And, and Generated. Yeah, yeah. Trying to simulate the sound, simulate the original. Who was the composer of that? Hey, right. uh, that's uh, Frankie Rick Carlos from Bach. But um, the yeah, the the one that made it. It's um, he used to be a man, so it's like a supper oh, <laughs> screen right? movie. 
Yeah, uh, he, his name was Walter Carlos, and and the girlfriend became lesbian, and he uh, operated himself and became Wendy Carlos. So it's so like he, a he was girlfriend. Story. Right, so that he <laughs> yes, could be with I his don't girlfriend. know what happened. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yes, I, I remember somebody told me that story. Like, wow. Right. Like, so Wendy Carlos, uh, as a kid, that was she was a big deal for you. Uh, as a kid, hearing about this woman, or may not be a guy back then, right? So well, yes, what did you guys it was hear? sort of a, of a novelty of um, people right. being trans, transgender and transsexual and all these other types of. Uh, Identities we have under the electric environment. Right. Looking up like, the wiki entry. You uh, can not only be quadrophenic, but actually change your mid body to another gender. Right. Um, gender transition. Carlos became, Walter Carlos became aware of her gender dysphoria at an early age. He told Playboy magazine. I was about five or six. I remember being convinced I was a little girl, much preferring long hair and girls' clothes and not knowing why my parents didn't see it clearly. In 1962, age 22, when she moved to New York City to attend graduate school at Columbia University, she came into contact for the first time with information about transgender gender issues, including the work of Harry Benjamin. In early 68, she began hormone treatments and soon began living full-time as a woman. In her whole Earth Catalog review of synthesizers in 1971, Carlos asked to be credited simply as W. Carlos. After the financial success of switched on Bach, Carlos was finally able to undergo sex reassignment surgery in May 72. Carlos chose to announce herself as the featured interview in May 79's Playboy magazine, picking Playboy because, quote, the magazine has always been concerned with liberation and I'm anxious to liberate myself. She has since come to regret the interview, has created a short list of the cruel page on her website, Shortlist of the Cruel, and gave Playboy's editors three black leaf awards, meaning arrogant, selfish prig with a genuine sadistic streak. Carlos prefers not to discuss her transition and has, and has asked that her privacy regarding the subject be respected. In 1998, she sued the songwriter artist Momus for $22 million dollars for his satirical song, Walter Carlos, which appeared on the album The Little Red Songbook, released in 98, which suggested that if Wendy could go back in time, she could marry Walter. The case was settled out of court, with Momus agreeing to remove the song from subsequent editions of the CD and owing $30,000 in legal fees. So she didn't get the $22 million. So we go to her website, look at the... <laughs> she wanted 22 yeah. <laughs> <All right. laughs> yeah. Um, so clicking on her official site, let's see her cruel list. It's not obvious. Warnings. But many many electronic music composers say the first. The electronic music record they heard is actually that switch on back. Right. Well, I can't find the. Maybe she doesn't post it anymore. Okay, so let's um, let's go into. Uh, did we finish that? Why did we get on to switch on back? What made you remind you of? Oh, all this technical stop talk that Frank's doing. Um, just the, just the fact that the, I, I find it very interesting that uh, when Bach was alive, the first uh, electricity experiments were going on, and somehow the first uh, real popular record is Bach music again, right. or uh, electronic music record. Is, is Bach. So I think maybe from the non-physical point of view that's like marking something. Yes, yeah. Bach started it. 
Then that, that, got yeah, me. because that was in in '68, and and that was uh, Ray returned to his in '67. Yes. Yeah. Hmm. So January, we have our our yeah. our, our theories. Our what? Our theories? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so uh, let's, um, so I'll just read you the percussion. The percussion, including electro vibes, transducerized marimba, transducerized timpani, bells, bells, chimes, and various drums, gongs, and noisemakers. The percussion, they're all fed to the main board and returned to their section in a mono-monitor mix. The transducerized marimba is a special purpose apparatus that will provide individual pickups for each marimba bar. These pickups, when fed to a resistor chain, would make it possible for any passages covering the full range of the instrument to zip around the audience in a quad orbit, aside from making the instrument more valuable as an orchestral voice due to improved audibility. The multi-keyboards, Hammond organ, grand piano, tack piano, electric harpsichord, Wurlitzer, Fender Rhodes with ring modulator, these are taken direct when purely electronic and transducerized when acoustic, with the exception of the Hammond. The Leslie on the Hammond is to be mic'd in quad and isolated from the other instruments, enabling assorted mysterious ethereal effects to be generated in an audience surround mode. Audience surround in quotes. The Hammond output is also taken direct. The keyboard player monitors his own amp. So that's pretty uh, knowledgeable. I mean, he was trying to create a complex environment, sound environment. Do you know what the Leslie yes, I mean, is? Uh, yeah, there are all types of organs, these electric keyboards and electric organs. Because mm. I think um, when they had these um, technologies to generate electronic sound, one way of marketing this new technology was to to have these controllers, these keywords, like organ looking or because there there were other types of controllers, like the termine or um, many other different types. But um, the industry preferred to to do something that was familiar, like organs, organs that uh, maybe had um, a pitch bent, or sometimes of uh, sometimes um, some filters and some special effects that could alter this. Uh, and you had like a different types of instruments, like bells and strings, besides the typical organ and what they call pianos or keyboards that that mm. really sound like electronic piano and keyboards and uh, some of these instruments are now called some people have them in their sound libraries like the Hammond organ or some type of special like um, the Leslie all these uh, Keyboards. Yeah, I was just going to ask you about the Leslie. What is the Leslie? Yeah. I, I think what what type of keyboard, but uh, maybe maybe it's a, it's, a, it's a microphone. Let me see. <laughs> yeah, it says the Leslie isolated backstage will be received via four mics. It will not only broadcast the Hammond organ, but will be equipped with a feed from the mix board making it possible with careful scheduling to use it as a modifying device for vocals and instruments. Because it is being mic'd in quad, material fed through it, when finally broadcast into the theater, will appear to swirl ethereally or hang in space over the audience, the rate of travel being easily controlled by the keyboard player using the speed switch on the Hammond. The receive from the four Leslie mics should be mm -hmm. tightly keypexed and reconstituted through the EMT to avoid any unpleasant mechanical noises when not in use. I uh, know I'm, I'm looking, wow. the Leslie was um, <laughs> a type of speaker that um, 
could also uh, use for some type of effect because uh, it has some some software in which you could affect the audio side now. Mm. <laughs> okay, so um, we read a lot of Hunch and Toot last time. We started off, um, the narrator says, there has been a certain amount of scientific speculation recently regarding the possibility that civilization as we know it is perhaps not the first pinnacle of evolutionary achievement to be witnessed on the face of our wretched little planet. In layman's terms, then, perhaps it has all happened before. Perhaps it has happened several times before. Not exactly the same as now, of course, but it most certainly could have happened. And if by chance it didn't happen already, mathematical science has proven that the odds are at least 50-50 that something is bound to happen sooner or later. So remember we went through this and we're laughing about the equivalent Earth, sort of ionic concepts. Yeah. Equivalent, equivalent this, equivalent that. So um, it begins with uh, drachma lounging, singing time is money, but space is a long, long time. And um, so she's on the couch. That's the supposed beginning, I guess, of the universe. And uh, she's trying to uh, get uh, the giant spider to get intimate with her. And um, so there's a lot of pleading to hunch and toot. Um, she says, yes, my erotically wriggling spider of destiny, take me to your reeking cranny or cave and caress me violently with your horrible scratchy feelers. And while we consummate our perverse rendezvous, I'll explain to you the fantastic details of the work I must do. So she's there trying to get things going for herself with the only other thing around, person or object. Then Dirk shows up with the four slings. And he's a human, and he uh, he uh, plays around with her, teases her, um, wears dramas there, singing and playing. So this is uh, this is the repeat of the um, solar object that has um, anti-Earthling. Um, forces, and then a, a human shows up to confront them. So let's see. And so way on page 45, and so having stated his case to the invaders from Earth, that would be uh, Dirk. Um, wait a minute. No, the Hunch and Toot is stating his case. Um, there ain't nothing to it. So he wants a uh, a spider mama. He wants a someone to <laughs> tangle his legs around. And says, <laughs> Hunch and Toot squeals away on its fetid little harmonica, dancing his special dance, demonstrating to the forcelings various possible methods of giant spider inflicted grievous personal injury causing them to dash around the planet in a state of frenzied terror. At the point where Hunch and Toot feels he has given them a proper scare, he and the orchestra pauses to announce, I'm going to back to my apartment. So the way Zappa writes in 10 years later in Thingfish, um, that Obon Obonics, what's that word? Bobonics. Ebonics. Ebonics, yeah, Ebonics. Uh, kind of stuff. <laughs> I don't know if this actually is. He's writing in this um, black slang back then, long before Thingfish. Is I going back to my apartment and whip it till you religious folks come up with something hot and hairy I can identify with. And so having stated his case to the invaders from Earth, the pathetic misunderstood giant spider trundles back into his cave. And not was heard by this busy little multiple appendages whipping it, I guess masturbating while honor only sofa drachma queen of cosmic greed pines away for the love of her insect that reminds me i played you a song uh from we're only for the money called harry you're a beast 
which is the the complaint that uh, she's gritting her teeth her teeth and not into the sex. But there's Harry. Forgot about Harry back in '67. So Harry shows up 20 years later. Well, 15 years later in uh, in the Them or Us book. <laughs> So, um, uh, so they're just pining away, and uh, let's see. I know that Dirk thinks that he can fool the spider and fool um, Drachma, and he attempts it, and I think she catches him. Um, here's one. The four slings have linked their fantastic minds together for the performance of a special secret intergalactic alpha therapeutic cadenza. Here it is. Listen to this. Wow. Conversing to each other. Right. What's a cadenza? It's, it's like um, uh, you have a sequence of chords. Yeah. For example, to to create, um, for example, an ending or to go from one tonality to another tonality. It's like this sequence of chords. It's called cadenza. <laughs> okay. So th this is a special secret intergalactic alpha therapeutic cadenza that the four things do with their linking of their minds. Then it says conversing to each other on the instruments. There's the conversing. Assisted by ingenious stage lighting techniques. The, eth the essence of the Earthling's bold counterplot is revealed. It includes, among other things, a bizarre sacrificial maneuver by which Dirk must win the confidence of the evil space girl by means of his animal magnetism. But many hours ago, I was talking about the conversation between instruments. instruments that's what Zappa has here. Conversing to each other on the instruments. Assisted by ingenious stage lighting techniques, the essence of the Earthling's bold counterplot is revealed. So... Um, but here's also the, so, the idea that music is therapeutic. That, um, yeah. Right. Sapa always saw his music as um, part of the therapy to heal humanity. Right. Um, so Dirk is trying to seduce Drachma, and um, he gets pretty far. But then he blows it. Um, he agrees to do something with her, but on condition that she calls off her invasion of the earth. That's when she gets really mad at him. So then she tries to get Hunchin to to, uh, to eat Dirk and the rest of them. But Hunchin Toot starts scheming on his own, and he doesn't uh, attack and eat um, Dirk. But he has another plan, and he's kind of ignoring uh, Drachma's pleas to uh, get rid of these humans. So where would we? So uh, Dirk eventually does a psychiatric analysis of Hunchatoon to figure out his problem. And his problem <laughs> is, <laughs> is uh, let's see, where is it said? So Dirk promised the spider of destiny, Hunchatu, that he'd get some spider mama for him. So he had gone off to the cave, hung out there. Then something disturbed him. He came out. And he said, oh, by the way, you got my spider mama, motherfucker? Dirk <laughs> says, no, I got something better. Assuredly, he says, I got something better. And... Uh, Hunchin Toot says, shit, ain't nothing better than no spider pussy boy. Why are you lying to me like that? Dirk says, look here, brother. Would I lie to a giant spider such as yourself at a time like this? I am telling you, I got it. Now, what is it you go for in a spider mama? Look here, brother. That's a phrase from some other song. Um, Hunchin Toot, legs, legs, nothing but them legs. So he wants a lot of legs. A lot of appendages on the female spider. Um, <laughs> and then Dirk says, right, and that's why I'm telling you, I got something that may change your life. But before we go into that, where's the, he analyzes uh, 
uh, Hassan Tut explains his his hang up. Psychological problems. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I could find it. Uh, what is it? <laughs> it's like uh, we should do that with Lucifer. Like, what's your big problem? You yeah. can sit at the right <laughs> of the Lord. I mean, let's talk about your psychological. Yeah. What did your parents do to you? What yeah. happened when you were in school that traumatized you? <laughs> Uh, still looking for well I don't know if I can find it so ah here here's something um, oh yeah right where I got to that's why I'm telling you I got something that may change your life Hansen says what's that Dirk, speaking clinically, let's make a systematic analysis of what the deal is with you. From my own vast experience as one of the greatest minds of our time, I've been able to trace the evolution and structural development of your hang-up as it relates in general terms to the enormous species spider mamma. And let me tell you right now, the trouble with you, the trouble with you is, buddy, you have a multiple appendage fixation. <laughs> <Rachma>. <laughs> A multiple appendix fixation. So Drachma on the couch being ignored in a very loud whisper says, Don't listen to him, Hunch and Toot, telling him not to listen to listen to Dirk. Dirk unperturbed continues. Now there are two possible solutions to your hang up. Hunch and Toot, no shit. How'd the first one go? Dirk smugly says, I'm glad you asked. Listen, there is something very close to us right now, squirming, breathing heavily, tormented by lustful desires in desperate need of some kind of perverse thrill, and it's got more legs than you ever saw before. Hunting Toot, in a calculating attitude, says, No shit, a lot of legs, huh? Dirk, cheerfully, yes, indeedy. Hunting Toot, shrewdly, <laughs> within easy walking distance? Dirk, l beaming proudly, just a mere few, few feet away. Hunting Toot, hopefully, and it fuck good? Dirk, tactfully, <laughs> well... <laughs> Let me put tactfully. it to you this way. If it, tactfully. T-A-C-T-F-L-L-Y. Not tactfully. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, let me, put it to, let me put it to you this way. If it don't fuck good, it eats. Can you dig it? <laughs> if, it if it don't fuck good, it eats. Hunting to thoughtfully. Hmm. Shit, Earth boy, you all right. Why don't you just go on and show this many-legged fucking thing to me right now? Right now, R-A-T-N-O-W. Dirk, proudly. <laughs> there you go, Spider-Man. It's all... No. There you go. No. There you go, Spider-Man. It's all yours. Go ahead. Fuck the many-legged thing you see before you. Hushin Toot says, uh, look here. I know you all might mean well, but uh, get them lights off. That thing I seen squirming out there caused me to lose one of the best giant spider hard-ons I ever done sprung. So he lost uh, <laughs> a big hard -on. Inspiration. <laughs> yeah. Is, is this, a, this is supposed to be on Broadway. Dirk, consoling him, <laughs> says, well, per, perhaps it's best because by your rejection of this many-legged temptation, a faint glimmer of hope has appeared, leading me to steadfastly believe that your hang-up can be cured. Institute, not convinced. What are you talking about, Earth Boy? Dirk, triumphantly, Simply this, with the aid and assistance of the devout membership of my new and exciting, spectacular, fantastic, non-sectarian, universal, whole wheat religion, all the skills, all the technical know-how, all the warm personal concern of our benevolent foundation will be brought into full force in order to rid you once and for all of the things that have caused your hang-up from in front. Now we're on page 73, and there are 81 pages. Uh, narrator, and so with an exhilarating religious fervor, the forcelings, you know, that work for Dirk, or the cult members, the forcelings come to the assistance of the distraught Hunch and Toot, relieving him of the very cause of his deep-seated emotional problem, as symbolized by his wriggling little spring-loaded appendages, plunging headlong in no um, cause and 
relieving him of the very cause of his deep-seated emotional problem. And then I guess he plunges headlong into the abyss of his insexual distress in order to liberate him in much the same manner their dismal competitors had attempted for countless centuries on earth. So who are these dismal competitors? Acting in the sincere belief that they, the forcelings, after so many inept bunglings by those other benevolent foundations, would finally get it right. We return you now to outer space for the results of their labors. So um, what happened there? Plunging headlong to the abyss of his, uh, another in order to liberate him in much the same manner their, their dismal competitors had attempted for countless centuries on earth. So there's the ionic idea of uh, not being so keen on helping your neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, the, they believed and therefore engaged in inept bunglings by those other benevolent foundations. But the, uh, the Ionettes, or what are they called? The, the Sportlings, the Forcelings. Forcelings. They, uh, they finally got it right. So, Dirk is saying, well, how do you feel, my man? A little bit better, huh? Any scar tissue? Saying that to Hunchentoot. Hunchentoot stretching and trying on his new biped stance. Hmm, shit, Earth boy, this here is all right. Say, wait a minute, just one little minute. I see something looking good to me. Shit. Say, darling, what's your favorite form of recreation? Dirk, apparently <laughs> unconcerned with the space girl and the insect, addressing the assembled mutants. So Gert, Dirk then addresses his tribe. Well, guys and gals, we did it. We actually did it, didn't we? We sure did, Dirk, say the forcelings. Unchintu is shouting, hey, Earth dude, when are you all going home? Dirk, looking around for a watch. Uh, I'll tell you in a minute. Must have dropped my watch during the big ceremony. Then Unchintu craftily, no shit, maybe I can help you all out. Don't you move a pound, long lady. I'm going to be right back. Look here, brother. Look here. Motherfucking price tag still on them. And they all run in, so he went off to <laughs> complain about something to one of the staff. And they all run in like a champ. 21 jewels keep in perfect time. How much bread have they given you for this? For this? And Dirk says, say, what's this? What's this? A Harnelton? Prison jeweled movement? No, precision jeweled movement. Hush and toot, very convincingly. And that motherfucker can be yours to have and to hold for a measly old $200 bill. You get at least that much from around here. This is a, a union host, ain't it? You get at least that much around here. This is a union host, ain't it? Dirt, glaze. I've never seen a Harnelton such as this. Forcing number one, seriously. Come on, Dirk. Forcing number two, seriously also. Yeah, we got to get back to the earth. The Harnelton, says Dirk. I must have the Harnelton. So what happens is Hunchin 2 proceeds to uh, uh, hypnotize Dirk. Uh, he says the, the, his, his uh, forest links are trying to wake Dirk up. It's not working. And Hunchin 2 says, why don't you all just get the fuck out of my way? For you lose some equilibrium, boy. Before you lose some equilibrium, boy, this here the world of high finance. So uh, it says, Hutchin Toot, still dangling the watch with one hand, reaches over with his other and pokes Forcelink number two first in the right eye, then in the left, finally pulling the ping-pong balls over both eyes in a quick tic-tac-toe movement. Drachma sleezes overly from the coach to Hutchin Toot's side, so she starts hanging out with Hutchin Toot. That's Gale, as Dracula. Um, Hunchin' Toot says, you know, I ain't going to lie to you, baby. I done told you I was going to make both us rich and famous, and you especially, darling, along with a complete all-expenses-paid motherfucking vacation. Dirk, delirious, the Harnelton, I must have the Harnelton. Hunchin' Toot, continuing, and I'm going to take care of all that good stuff right now. Hey, Earth Dude, when are you all going home? Dirk, in brackets, still delirious, groping for the watch. I can't seem to... Can't find my watch. Must have dropped it during the pause. I believe I can detect from your highly coordinated movement a flaming desire to acquire. Now, who's saying that? Just a second. Oh, okay. So, Dirk can't find the watch. Uh, must have dropped it during the confusion. So then Hutchinson says, 
I believe I can detect from your highly coordinated movements a flaming desire to acquire this fine quality timepiece. I've been dangling front your eyes here. And this motherfucker gone be yours in all its gleaming glory. Not for no $200 bill, not for no $100 bill, not for no $50 bill, and not for no spare change neither. Only this thing this magnificent motherfucker going to cost you is a piece of your mind. And what I mean, brother, is when I put this watch in your hand, you and me and my old lady, along with them silly motherfuckers over there, we all going to be going through time and space back to your silly ass planet. And we all gone, we all going to clean up on them lame motherfuckers down there. Now, get your ass ready, because you all going to think us over, think us over, as soon as I whip up this little time machine on you, you're going to whip up a time machine, <laughs> and the the um, thinking us over, I guess that's some kind of traveling that the Hudson Toot can do. Um, so <laughs> Dirk says, after hearing all that, he's still hypnotized. His mumbling can just barely be heard over the catastrophe around him. He goes, I've got it, I, I've got it, got it now. It's mine. The Harlton is mine. Hans and Tooth starts singing and dancing. I might have been a slave for the rest of my life, laying in the cave with the spider mama wife, hunching and a tootin on a raggedy old bed with a spider mama leg round the back of my head. But now them legs don't bother me none, because you can see what a job that religion done done. Got a mohair suit. And that all I gone need, and that's all I gonna need. Just pimping all night for the goddess agreed. So it says, um, uh, Hunch and Toot dances over the stage right, gesturing for the audience to make a purchase from the ten foot replica prophylactic <laughs> vendor. <laughs> Hunting Toot ex escorts Drachma back to the couch, which has been draped with a green velvet cover during the blackout. She sprawls lewdly across the sofa, picks up a small hand mirror, and applies lipstick. Hunting Toot marks the screen control panel, causing a slide to flash on. This slide, two big words, fuck greed. <laughs> <laughs> fuck it's greed. A, it's very interesting because in, in his freakout list, Sapa has a um, hypnotist yes, as yes. one of his main influences, and um, I think he's he's playing with this idea of we always want this new whatever, the new car, the new yeah. watch, the new yeah. synthesizer, the new guitar, and uh, we are hypnotized by this monster that. Maybe now By it's the Android me. Consumerism. Hmm. Consumerism. Yes. And, uh, yeah, everything is about uh, selling and buying. And, yeah, um, like I can look through um, wherever I was. I might have dreamt it, but it was looking through a window at an office. And um, uh, I don't know what I was going to think. I think I faded out there. The, or it's, it's good. Uh, uh, he says the real cost of whatever you or you want is actually a piece of your mind. <laughs> it's not uh, yeah. the money value, but the. There's a yeah. price to pay. But it's not your uh, mind. It's a piece of it's your it's a piece of <laughs> What? What did you say? Your recollected RTD. lucidity. <laughs> yes, because we don't have when a you mind. know when you have the words. So he puts up this sign, "Fuck greed." Now Drachma is called the Cosmic Queen of Greed, or something like that. So it could be a spiritual statement, "Fuck greed, no more materialism," or it could mean something else. Literally, uh, I'm just looking up the the cast, uh, Dirk. Hunch and Toot, the narrator, Drachma, Four Slings. No, don't seem to have that. So, so as Drachma sprawls lewdly across the sofa and picks up a small hand mirror and applies lipstick, Hunch and Toot works the screen control panel, causing a slide to flash on. 
Buck Reed. Hunter Two bows and dances off as the lights come up on the orchestra for the closing passages. Dirk and the Four Slings return and join Drachma for their bows, after which they all exit left. Lights come up on narrator the last as he bows, straightens up, points his hand toward the screen in a sweeping gesture, giving the cue for a quaint slide which says, the end. But in the dialogue parts, um, Huntitude is singing, just pimping all night for the goddess agreed. Any of you people want a good piece of ass? Form a line on the door because the goods won't last. She got tits like a bank. She ain't never on the rag. If she don't do you right, just salute her like a flag. This ain't no ordinary bitch I'm going to interest you in. She the goddess agreed. She's going to make your pecker grin. So just get in that line in the back of this room and get your ass on home because that's the end of my tune. That is how this horrible opera ends. He becomes a pimp. <laughs> with a gangbang. Yes, with a fucking gangbang for everybody to line up. That is the closing. I mean, what kind of mind? What's Frank attempting here? This is worse than manipulative <laughs> satire. It's not That's even any ro- beef art robotoids. I mean, and wait, this is who the is he writing for? Oh. Um, um, this is the what? What will be the upgraded verse from 64? Meaning, right? No, wait a minute. No, uh, 64 is upgraded in 69. This is 72. This is another play, but of course it's the same old fucking theme of the global theater. And uh, some alien on another planet wants to capture the planet, but he has to do it from the moon. And some Earthling group tries to stop him. But it doesn't end up with organic robotoids melting. It doesn't end up with a happier ending in an orgy in 64. And 69 is the robotoids collapsing. This ends up with, this is, this is Zappa. Now, this is right when Women's Lib's just starting. It starts at 69, uh, I, 70. I, I remember, I think it was Sartre, Jean-Paul Sartre, who, who talked about the like the serial relationships we have in, in modern society, like you make a line and, and you pay in the supermarket, yeah. and, and then the next and the next and the next. I think that's like this type of metaphor that we engage in this type of uh, serial relationships in modern times. Everything is like... yeah. Like uh, very and superficial. What, it's just like pay and go on the next, or <laughs> or you, pay and go. You talk with goodbye. Yeah, the, you, <laughs> you did your bit. Yeah, you you engage most most people like that, like um, in serial relationships. It's, yeah. it's no more a conversation or or a real interaction. It's just like a yeah. Very remember fast. when I was in Berlin and and. Uh, Roxy was showing around her neighborhood and the different stores she goes to, and she had nothing to say to the clerks. I'm all friendly, a new human being. I start talking. Roxy thinks I'm a fucking saint because I'm talking to people because she never talks to any of them. <laughs> she just goes around the same boring neighborhood, buys her milk, her dope, her condoms, whatever she fucking buys, and uh, hardly says anything. <laughs> But I'm there all keen yeah, on any totally, little storekeeper. I was really surprised that uh, Bob will engage conversations with everybody. He... <laughs> <laughs> I, was a everybody. I was an anthropologist. I was trying to learn about the culture. <laughs> I was doing anthropology. Listen, for example, in the, in, the book, in the bookstore, uh, you start... Talking, talking to the person the just standing there. About everybody, and everybody's looking at you like, what? What is he talking about? <laughs> he talks about <laughs> the flu and, and the daughter. <laughs> I thought I was on the radio. I never realized I'd gone someplace. I hadn't seen physical space in years. And there, we got this on video, me point, showing some anonymous customer the picture of Mary McLuhan in the middle of medium as a massage, you know, with no clothes on. I said, this is the author's daughter. This is very McLuhan. 
right there on the video. And, uh, yes, it was, uh, you know, I noticed that um, uh, on the beach, you'll see uh, different couples talking to the couple that's on a sun couch beside them. And they're, they're, they're superficially talking, friendly, but these are people who would never talk to anybody in their neighborhood. But when they go on a vacation, they start feeling friendly, and they have to spill in, fill in their idle time, so they start talking to strangers and telling them all about their lives. Uh, that's a kind of modern uh, hypocrisy, forced idleness, forced sociality on the, on the vacation. So I, I was used to that superficial, hypocritical, hypocritical tourist lifestyle, so I did that, walking around being friendly like you do when you're traveling. <laughs> I'm, I'm never going to have to see these people again. I have no responsibilities for them, so let's find out all about them and then go, bye, and never see them again. So, uh, uh, Roxy mistook my uh, tourist cliche behavior as a wonderful, saintly being. <laughs> Roxana, were they open to talk to Bob? Or they just looked at him? No, he somehow made them talk about everything, yeah, about I, his life, about uh, the wow. <laughs> favorite music, the favorite music uh, radio station, and yes. And whatever. how they'd heard of McLuhan, yes, I've heard of McLuhan, they all heard of McLuhan. <laughs> <laughs> But I didn't always bring up McLuhan. I would bring up Zapp or LaRouche or one of the other holy offices. I'm always staying within the on duty, propagating the uh, my teleplay, my screenplay. Like Frank, he keeps writing the same fucking musical. Uh, so this is when women's libs coming in. A feminist would say this Frank hated feminism, and uh, he's got the evil woman taking over the planet. That's his perception of. Uh, of feminism. This is, this is when it's happening. 68, 69, 70, 71, 72. So um, maybe Frank is satirizing being a misogynist. You know, pretending he's one. Or yes, he's uh, mad at them like, I, I was, like McLuhan. They, they're missing the hidden ground. They're too busy trying to liberate their tribe and missing uh, what's coming to them in the android meme condition. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, I was thinking about that because uh, uh, in Mexico City we have such masses of people that we are used to this serial type of engagement with the mass mm. because this makes things like more efficient or it's the only way things can function. You don't engage the collective uh, like an individual but as a mass and you have to wade your way through it. You couldn't interrupt the traffic flow by talking. Is that what you're saying? Yes, uh, everything is done very fast. Right, and, and, uh, and no, and no friendship. And I care. Yes, really and I, I remember when I first came to Berlin. I, I will be desperate because, uh, for example, when you pay something at the bakery in Mexico City, the the people make the like the, they know how much you have to pay but they make it in, in their mind the the addition and they do that yeah. very fast and here's like very everything seemed to be slow for me right <laughs> and that made but you the, desperate think, yes because it's like uh, I, I was used to this type of serial engagement that everything is fast and really quick and, right. and you don't re you don't really talk with the people so it slowed it's down so you thought well maybe i could talk you were you weren't ready to talk but you were um, it was being implied that you could talk and that uh, bothered you you didn't know how to do that is that what you're saying well i i was not used to it i <laughs> uh, every, everything seemed like slow. <laughs> yeah, human scale. <laughs> yeah. But were were you in a rush somewhere? Were were you? Did you have to be somewhere? Yeah, you were in school. No, you know, but uh, were, 
you're just used to this um, speed. Rapid and also, speed. for example, yeah. I remember in, in Mexico City, people move very fast in the crowd. And here yeah. sometimes, for example, now that it's Christmas and some streets are, are crowded or the shopping centers or this and that, I get desperate because people don't don't move as fast as in Mexico City when they're in the, in the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> you get anxious. Yes. So, so well, you're you, not you used like to Carolyn. You know, Carolyn's really good. She makes instant friends. All her, she'll make, you know, when you go through the airport and, and put your suitcase and it goes and gets x-rayed and all that, Carolyn will, will make a friend out of the person, you know, helping with the suitcase or zapping you with x-rays it, within the 10-second exchange. Uh, <laughs> Carolyn has bonded with them. <laughs> she does something cute or charming that they like. So they do a double take and look at her. And, She's pleasant to look at, and so they fall in kind of a love with her. And I'm walking along, sour and grumpy, and watching <laughs> this go on. I just watch it for fucking decades. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I usually comment on it. Another friend, you know, like you know. <laughs> so, so the person, they're sort of remove themselves from Carol and now dealing with the next person, but they if they're listening they hear the husband go, Another friend another best friend <laughs> Yes, you but, do uh, have one very very special I think. Yes, we, we are the uh the final retrieved humans. We are the uh the first to show up or the last to be here or something like that. I can't remember the order. I've lost my place. <laughs> I don't know where they're coming or going. Remember Dirk, and we did this, teaching his religion. He said, um, remember he was playing off like Zappa does on, on cliche phrases. We're going to know where it's at because we know which way it went. Remember that conversation? <laughs> Those lyrics. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> where yeah. was that? Uh, I remember that last week. So this is, so he had the same scenario and it, a different ending. What is the ending? The um, Hansen Tude, he I don't think he's taken over the planet. He's just become a pimp. He's just uh, satisfied. Well, he maybe never wanted to take over the planet. And uh, uh, Drachma is reduced to being a... Uh, a, uh, a hole, a servicing hole, H O L E, just a hole for people to. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's see, where is the the grammar, the grammar lesson? So what? This is very light. So. We are going to go to um, the Zemaras book, which has all these scripts. They're all going to be lumped together in this new book. Where Frank says those interested in the conceptual continuity or are familiar with a lot of things, we're going to find um, it all put together. So it was Bob's job to make order out of it. Yeah, here it is. Um, Dirk says, that's right, I have a promotional ID I have a promotional idea that will prove once and for all how heavy we are, trying to do his meditating cult, and simultaneously show conclusive evidence to every infidel and unbeliever not only where we're at, but also where we're coming <laughs> from. Now, he, he gets them to go to space, to go to outer space and go to the Drachmas rock or planet, and the forcelings object to it, but he zaps them, sort of like Cam Beefheart, just, just travels them through time and space. Um, but he says, we're going to do something up there so that when we come back, we'll be a bona fide religion. So he says, uh, we're... Yes, but the, uh, actually, he's, he's portraying what is happening now, you know, like, this side sees the others as the infidels, and we are heavier than you. And yeah. the other side has this same <laughs> attitude, and it's, it's so absurd, and, and he's making a satire of that. And it's it's amazing. Yes, we don't need this um, 
endangered aliens to come and try to conquer Earth. It's like humans are actually <laughs> the ones that are attacking humans. <laughs> so that's yeah, even more and, horrible. And he, he says when they become a bona fide religion at the end of this treatment, this screenplay, they'll all be able to go to airports and hand out leaflets. Now, that's just beginning in, uh, in L.A. in the late 60s, early 70s. The cult, Scientology, um, the Hare uh, Krishnas. other cult, Harry Krishnas, they're all starting to hand out leaflets, and this is driving Frank nuts. I mean, he's trying to run a revolution and educate everybody and get them to go to the library and figure out what's going on and not be dupes. And the stupidity is spreading around him as little cults spring up <laughs> handing out leaflets. So he's lashing yeah, out at what's happening in his world right there in 71, the 72 in cosmic debris. LA. Yes, the it. cosmic debris, cosmic right. Debris. So we're going to find out where we're at, but also where we're coming from. Dirk says, I have meditated longly and deeply, and in doing so I have penetrated to the very core of this marginally imponderable dilemma. It's, it's only marginally imponderable. And I have found the answer, and the answer is, quote, the difference between your, where you're at and where you're coming from is where you went. <laughs> the difference between where you're, you're at and where you're coming from is where you went. He used to say in the, in the late 80s that it's not, I don't know what, he said it's when. The big question was when. This is amazing because that's what Ion is saying all the time. It's like, yes, there is no time. Ion has made fun. Ion is really going like that. back. Because, right. Uh, he would make fun of directional. Like we're going. <laughs> we're going <Careful>. sideways. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and he's always playing with the Arnes and the Isness and the. The what went is and the, the that's right. That I, is, you know, that's where, why when I start yeah. reading this, you know when what? To, I, 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 let me say this. Uh, when I read this kind of stuff by Zappa, and then we, we point out how Ion does it, I say, that fucking Ion is just zapping, just reading Bob's mind and completing it. <laughs> <laughs> just going a little further than Frank yeah. did. Yeah. It's uncanny. We, we find, you know, he was playing with it, doing it, and then we find out, shit, it's all in the scripts of the uh, of the holy offices. <laughs> you know, it's like Ion um, scanned me, figured out all the fucking thoughts I engaged, and then just spewed it all back with a speeded up completion. <laughs> it's yeah, pretty amazing. It is yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he said at one point the difference between where you're at and where you're coming from is where you went. I would not be surprised that you'll find that in some old cash flow. <laughs> this is what's funny about this. And uh, then he says, so they're going to go to the moon. And he says, precisely, when we get back from when we went, everybody will know where we're at. <laughs> when we get back from when we went... And before it was is where you went, now it's when you went, everybody will know where we're at. <laughs> so he didn't tell them then that they would have to go to the moon, and they were quite shocked later. He says, well, here's the plan. We're all going to the moon or to some rock, mystery rock, where Drachma was. So Dirk wanders off. He, he fades into nothing. Drachma is trapped in a brothel, and uh, Hudson Toot's doing okay, and... And is that all? And the four slings, I don't know, maybe they were killed. I don't know what happened to the four slings. Um, let's see. They got their drops and ascended. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, what happened is that very carefully the four slings grouped themselves around Hudson Two, waiting reverently with bowed heads until Dirk gives the secret signal like Frank would give secret signals, whereupon they pounce on the unsuspecting spider and rip off all of his arms and legs except the practical ones, tossing them around the stage while the orchestra plays some terrifying passage. Strobes flash and Drachma stands near the sofa looking aghast as the scene blacks out and the lights come up on the narrator. 
So they ripped him apart, and I think he he liked it. He didn't object too much to that. Um, it says, and so with an exhilarating religious fervor, the force leads come to the assistance of the distraught Hunchen Tube, relieving him of the very cause of his deep-seated emotional problem, as symbolized by his wriggling little spring-loaded appendages, plunging headlong into the abyss of his insexual distress, in order to liberate him in much the same manner their dismal competitors had attempted for countless centuries on earth acting in the sincere belief that they, the forcelings, after so many inept bunglings by those other benevolent foundations, would finally get it right. We return now, we return you now to outer space for the results of their labors. And we already read that. Then we, we end up. What did the forcelings, are they around in the um, <laughs> end scene? See them mentioned. Hunter uh, Dresser swore... Well, the force things are trying to save Dirk from being hypnotized by the watch. That's the last thing they're engaged. They're trying to, to save their leader, and they fail. It says, Dirk stumbles blindly into the wings, fetishing his watch. And doesn't say anything more about the force wings. So, um, the Concentration Moon. You heard me play that song, Concentration Moon, eh? Did you like that? From We're Only for the Money? Yes. Concentration yes. Moon. <laughs> moon Unit. <laughs> I wonder if Moon has ever thought about the conceptual continuity and how her name fits into it. If I ever see her, I'll ask her that. You know that you're just a fragment of a larger theatrical layout by Frank? You're one of the themes? <laughs> See what she says. Uh, I, I'm on her Facebook. I don't know. Maybe I have to become a member. I will ask her. I can present this on her Facebook page. Yeah. I will be quickly banned with rude my rudeness. <laughs> yeah, but we're used to that. The rest of the people will see it. And they'll know the value of what I did. Because they're so heavy, Adeline boy. Yes. yes. The wimplings. The INS are wimplings. Cannot even come up with something to ask Ion. Wimplings. Not you two. The rest of them. They don't even show up anymore because because Ion ain't here. We are people still listening on the computer, but the turnout here when Ion's not around really shows you what this is all about. It ain't about Carol and Bob's charisma. It's about Ion. It's the only thing worth showing up for. They put up with it. They put up with this. Uh, looking at um, Sarah, uh, she asks, I wonder if the dissonant ambient funk was recorded separately from the dialogue. That probably. She goes, ooh, John Cage and Norman McLaren. Norman McLaren was an animator for the National Film Board. Then she goes, mmm, Verez. Then she goes, Roxy Harmonium, triad of fourth and fifth. Then she says, Cadence. Then number 125 says, Dirk, did Frank write Boogie Nights? Remember Dirk Diggler? I saw Boogie Nights. Uh, then, then he says, Four Slings. Then he says, Bob, you're so country. Everybody talks to everybody in the country. Oh, I'm a country person. Right, I'm a rural uh, overalls wearing person. <laughs> and you're then, the muggle man. Marvel man, you know, ride into town and make friends with everybody and hand out cigarettes. Um, 125 says, quote, ripped off all his arms and legs except for the practical ones. Ha, ha, ha. They, they like that line. The forcelings knew which ones not to rip off. Now, our task is this awesome book called Demoras, subtitled The Book by Frank Zappa. and has a picture of Frank with his chest hairs, no shirt on, and he has a nice, I don't know, a 40s hobo kind of suit jacket. And uh, he's got straggly hair. It's 1984, and he's holding up his hand in a green glove. Demeras, Frank Zappa, copyright, 1984, all rights reserved. Um he says, forward, this Gigi little homemade book was prepared for the amusement of people who already enjoy Zappa music. It is not for intellectuals or other dead people. 
It was designed to answer one of them. <laughs> yeah, it, you have to get help me or get out. Yeah. It's all yeah. for your entertainment. I mean, Roxy was just starving in Berlin. There was no more live people. She was surrounded by dead people. She wasn't sure if that's what was happening, but now she could see that is what was happening. And uh, so he says, the book is designed to answer one of the more troubling questions related to conceptual continuity. Quote, how do all these things that don't have anything to do with each other fit together, forming a larger absurdity? Well, I think my pattern of the concentration camp is is uh, what we're going to see here. Um, your enjoyment, no, not exactly that. It's going to be updated. It says, your enjoyment of the contents could be enhanced by hearing the music described in the text. The album shown on the back cover contains some of these songs. It's got four albums. Francesco Zappa, Zappa's album called Demeras, Zappa's Old Masters Collection, and Thing Fish. Uh, other songs derived from Joe's Garage and Ship Arriving Too Late to Save a Drowning Witch. This is a storybook. It is not a rock and roll biography. This is the only real and official Frank Zappa book. All other books attempting to trade on my name are unauthorized and full of misinformation. This book is dedicated to all of the fans who have made the last 20 years of large-scale absurdities possible. This book, see, large-scale absurdities. This book used to be called Christmas in New Jersey. Now, I read that last week, so I hope you um, can handle that. So it starts off with uh, Francesco, you know, 250 years ago, uh, talking to the Duke of York, and we went through that. Then Francesco meets up with Shemp, no, yeah, Shemp, the alchemist, and then they go to Broadway. They go to New York, 1984. We figured out that Francesco is Frank. Frank is telling us that he's like beef art, a real phenomenon of the mystery landscape, and way more than people suspect. And he's lived for hundreds, if not thousands, of years. Um, then we went into the beginning of the universe where Uncle Willie, uh, it says Uncle Willie is seen relaxing on a grotesquely tufted maroon sofa, smoking a cigar. On his knee is the dummy, now with a face just like his, like Uncle Willie's, dressed in a flowing white miniature robette. Well, reading um, one of the Zappa books, when Frank was like, you know, seven or eight or six years old, he would take Carl, who was the... The third, the second brother, Bobby, was a few years. Uh, Carl might have been like nine years, eight years younger than Frank, whereas Bobby was only three years younger. So this younger brother, uh, he would sit him on his lap and do puppetry or ventriloquism, fake ventriloquism. The very thing that Uncle Willie is doing with the dummy is what Frank did with his little brother. Interesting point, <laughs> right? He entertained the yeah. family with this, you know, improvising stuff, whatever the young mind would come up with. So so there's, there's you, you have Zappa is sitting there thinking about how he used to have his brother on his lap. Then he said, okay, now it's uh, 40 years later. We're surrounded by organic robotoids. So at best, it's going, I'm going to be a weird duck thing called Uncle, re- weird pervert called Uncle Willie, and I'm not going to have my little brother. I'm going to have a fucking automated dummy on my lap, right? <laughs> so he's updating the what he did, what he what the scenarios of his life, overlaid large scale absurdities. Yes, <laughs> the uh, was large, you yeah. also mentioned before this that under the electric environment and the android mean everybody became this type of organic robotoid. Yes. yes. It doesn't have to be a cyber. Most humans are in this state of organic robotoid situation. That was in the uh, Gutenberg galaxy. Everybody was a robot by, you know, 1600, 1700, the print visual space. Oh, no, even human. Even, even before electricity, we were already organic robotoids. Well, that's what I'm saying. I said the Gutenberg Galaxy. I'm talking 500 yeah. years ago was when we became organic robots. And we became angelic. He writes in, uh, well, posthumously published, so we don't know how much he wrote, but it could be considered it. But Bruce Powers, 
not Bruce Powell, but Bruce Powers, former CIA guy, he's a professor at Niagara University in upstate New York. He uh, he was one of the last guys to engage McLuhan. In his book, he talks about angels versus robotism, angelism versus robots, and angelism seems to be aligned with the Gutenberg galaxy, and robotism is the electric fate. But McLuhan uh, said in 1968 that robots were a product of visual space. So it could be a product, it could be a case of Handiades, one by means of two. But yes, the electric age is, is implying a liberation from the robot world. You had to be a robot to listen to Ed Sullivan every day, every Sunday. Once you have digital do-it-yourself media, you um, aren't in the dancing to the same tune as everybody else. Yes, like uh, they will say the uh, same program in the same channel at the same time. Right. Like every, everybody will right. just uh, program their lives to to adapt to the TV program. Yeah. And now you said the, with the video recorder, TV was made for the video recorders that were taping the yeah. program. <laughs> <laughs> They're watching it. Okay, so the dummy wants to bring in the short girl and squat the magical pig. Now, Frank in 70, 71, 72, uh, that would be, uh, he broke up the mothers and then he reformed them with uh, Flo and Eddie from the Turtles and put in a couple of new mu musicians like George Duke. So they went around 70, 71, acting out this weird scenario of the big sofa and short girl and squat the magical pig. Did little sketches. Uh, and the, the sofa was there at the beginning of the universe. So that's in this book. So that's an early uh, theatrical performance piece. So that's developed a little bit. You can't read all the details, but um, then the... Uh, that's the end of chapter one. Uncle Willie, um, this is where old Zircon, in, at the end of chapter one, um, Uncle Willie says, Darkness fell suddenly in all forests as canceled leeches and transoms swarmed ashore, devouring bushes while they slept. Farmers walked off and got lost because there was no stars, not even the moon. Then from a distant cave, there's the cave thing again, the measured tread of cloven hoof on darkened gravel. Old Zircon, the phased-out Byzantine devil, dressed in a costume uh. of that period except for his feet. There's your Pergamon obsession, uh, Roxy. The Horror Babylon, or the, <laughs> the King of Babylon. Old Zircon. So he's including ancient religion, Hocus Pocus. Um, they have the exterior of old Zircon's cave set in a dark, barren landscape of infinite gravel. Old Zircon says, Looks like the leeches have ate up every bush. Bet this place will look funny when the lights go back on. Old Zircon launches into a charming sort of cloven hoof tap dance routine, producing sparks which ignite the local moss. An enormous bonfire, totally out of proportion to the amount of fuel available, springs up around them. Uncle Willie and the dummy stand nearby unnoticed. I remember reading this last week. Do you guys remember this? Yes. Yeah. yeah, Uncle Willie. I remember. Said, I remember Uncle, Uncle Willie. Yeah, Uncle Willie says Old Zircon danced his quote special dance until sparks ignited all adjacent moss. One by one, dangerous-looking unknown animals make their way to Zircon's fire. With a snap of his fingers, he produces an assortment of primitive musical instruments and proceeds to do his version of a Las Vegas lounge act for them, for the animals, I guess. Uncle Willie says, all fierce and murderous beasts assembled to a large red fire just outside the cave. Old Zircon beat his special drum, blew his special horn, and strummed his special guitar. Then he sang in a deep voice until the smoke turned to stone, forming several lumpy new mountains. So his voice altered the, the landscape around him, one of which could talk. Yeah, so then frequency... Goes, Right. Until He's creating. Came stone. Yeah. Oh. Smoke the right. stone. Right. Zircon is one of these old ascended guys who can knows how to manipulate his mouth to make realities. So in chapter two, it goes into Billy the Mountain, and that story is on um, 
uh, and just another band from L.A., 1971, and Billy the Mountain. So it lays out the Billy the Mountain story. And Billy the Mountain wants to go on uh, a vacation, takes his wife, Ethel, the tree, and they just cause, they, they trudge across the desert, destroying everything. So it's another destructive motif, um, another monster wrecking the human scale. Um, so that goes on for a while. And then uh, there starts to be TV broadcasters. So uh, Frank would take <clears throat> sort of well-known names locally or different situations, and the character would be uh, almost George Putnam. So instead of having the character be George Putnam, he would say almost George Putnam or almost Barbara Walters. These were characters. And um, almost George Putnam is talking about uh, the destruction that Billy the Mountain's making. Um, Jerry Lewis holds a telethon to raise funds for the, all the crashed places that Billy the Mountain caused. Is Frank mean a metaphor for what he's doing? Is he crashing things like a monster? Uh, then you bring in the other character of that era, Studebaker Hawk, superhero of the current economic slump. And I think we did him. Um, then there's a little throwback to Squat and the Short Girl, um, Old Zircon. Then, then it gets into the next character after Studebaker Baker Hawk. He gets into Gregory Peckery. And he's a trend monger. He manufactures new trends. So that becomes the content, uh, already was the content of um, the Baby Snakes video where Bruce Bickford made all this amazing clay animation following Gregory Peckery's uh, scenario. So that was written up, you know, 12, 13 years before. Um, now, my first checkoff... Um, so Frank is going to deal with the same idea that there's no time, or time cancels itself out, so we're not going anywhere. So in uh, Gregory Peckery, in his uh, trend-mongering office, invents the calendar. So here's Frank coming at time in another way. And with that, old Zircon says, and with that, Gregory turned and strode nonchalantly into his dinky little office with the desk and the catalog and the very hip water pipe, and proceeded with a vigor and determination known only to piglets of a similarly diminutive proportion, proceeded to a single to single handedly invent the calendar. Um, uh, what old Zircon says Gregory Peckery, his eyes rolled heavenward and his shiny little pig hoofs on the desk. Uh, with his eyes rolled heavenward and his shiny little pig hoofs on the pig hoofs on the desk, Gregory ponders the significance of eternity and fractional divisions thereof, as mysterious angelic voices sing to him from a great distance, providing the necessary clues for the construction of a thrilling new trend. Sounds like me making my chart. And my chart is, is an attempt to enter time, right, and lay out uh, changes in duration, in the duration of spans. So Zircon says, And thus the calendar, in all of its colorful disguises, was presented to the bored and miserable people everywhere. Gregory issued a memo on it, whereupon the entire contents of the steno pool identified with it strenuously and worshipped it, the memo, as a way of life. Or maybe they worshipped the calendar, maybe that's what it meant. And took their little pills by it and went back and forth from work by it and paid their rent by it. And before long, they were even having birthday parties at the office by it. Because now at last, Gregory Peckery's exciting new invention had made it possible for everyone to find out how old they were. See, there's your programming of the environment. That's, that's uh, Frank looking at a new invention and showing how it altered people, conditioned their behavior, but all the time fitting into the concepts he laid out 10 years earlier, 20 years earlier in, uh, in Cat and Beefheart versus the grunt people in terms of no time. Hmm. Right? Do you get that? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Now, Gregory... Um, no, he, he was really into a bigger agenda of just being a rock star. That's yes. something... Right. Um, you know, uh, McLuhan writes about how Erasmus 
hijack the printing press to make a new new kind of classroom education. Like Zappa says, holy shit, I'm this talented musician. I can go into pop culture and uh, write, wreak havoc on it. Because if I play good enough music, they'll let me do it. So he was, uh, he was like the siren, as you've said before, in uh, Ulysses' travels. He, his guitar, his music could get an audience that he could then play with. So old Zircon says, unfortunately, there were people who simply did not wish to know, you know, how old they were. And that's why on his way home from the office one night, Gregory was attacked by a rage of hunchmen. Hunchentupa, these are hunchmen. Making his way through the evening traffic, Gregory notices that the other vehicles which crowd and bump his little red car are all inhabited by slowly aging, very hip young people. You know, that's me and Carolyn, slowly aging, right? Very hip young people. So again, he's, he's making fun of me. Who appear to be casting sinister glances toward Gregory through their glinting, acid-burnt-out eyeballs, trying to run him off the road or make him bump into something, giving strong evidence of hostile aggression. To elude them, Gregory takes the short forest exit off the expressway. They zoom after him in all manner of cars, trucks, garishly painted buses, and motorcycles. Gregory takes a bumpy trail off the main short forest road, which leads him up the side of a famous and conveniently placed mountain into a strange cave on the edge of a cliff, not far from a little twisted tree with eyes on it. Meanwhile, the enraged hunchmen and hunchwomen rumble through the short forest until realizing the little swine had escaped. They decide to park their steaming vehicles in a circular pseudo wagon train formation and have a love in. So there it is. There's uh, the... Um, Celestial's agenda. Now it's part of the culture in America. Because under the influence of a fantastic amount of trendy chemical amusement aid, these hunchmen and hunchwomen, they perform lewd acts, rip each other off for small personal possessions, and dance with depraved abandon in the vicinity of a six-foot pile of transistor radios, each one tuned to a different station. So, uh, Zircon is dealing with uh, Gregory, uh, then um, the greatest living philosopher shows up, Quentin Robert de Nameland. And he is in a, some of the skits of this period we're talking about in the early 70s. Quentin Robert de Nameland. Um, let's see, you got the modified singing cowboys doing stuff. Uncle Willie doing stuff with the dummy um, Tudor Baker Hawk. He falls off the mountain, gets injured. Billy the Mountain wrecks him for a while. Um, then you go into chapter three. We did this. Buddy is dealing with the scientist named Hertzberg, and they were looking at the uh, new machine called PDE conversion. Um, Um, I have ticked off here. Well, let's look at, it, look at it another way. Time is not like what people think it is. It doesn't start over here and then go over there. Time is just one big lump of stuff. Everything is happening all the time. I can prove it to you. When you're watching TV on Channel 9, there's always something else on Channel 5, right? Now, have you guys gone? Still there? No. Yes. Good. We're Good. here Good. listening. Yeah, we did that. We did that Channel yep. 9, Channel 5 stuff. So um, so a lot, of, a lot of stuff about particles and chopping up waves, the physics of that, which is Zappa filling out what he said back in 1970. Um, but I, I like explain. the phrase you, you said before, this trendy Trend uh, chemical... No, trendy chemical entertainment. Like, yeah. uh, I never thought about it, but uh, yeah, we, we always have, besides what we call entertainment, there are these substances that um, yes. most people engage to, to relax and, and to have fun. It's not only the entertainment, but the substance. It it's, uh, plays a big role in in the societies. 
Yeah, what is that? That's um, people not wanting to talk to each other, so they must occupy their mouths with confection, is it called? Confe- combustibles? Comestibles? To, uh, <laughs> Consumable. So they... Combustibles. <laughs> no. yeah. There's something called comestibles or something. <laughs> I don't use that word too much. I remember looking it up about six months ago. Anyways, they, uh, they have to keep their mouths busy. So as they get more and more leisure industry activities, uh, leisure society, they're involved with people, got to interact. But if you're drinking, smoking, eating, you don't have to talk as much. That's my present interpretation of your scenario there. Yeah, the chemical um, entertainment. Yes. Uh, so uh, Uncle Willie had died, crashed in the Christmas tree, but then he came back. So um, Buddy Wilson is trying to figure out how to explain it to his children. So he says, to mess with anything natural, if you mess with anything natural and you can believe there's going to be something supernatural coming out of it, every time they run that machinery over there, they could be messing up our entire chronological ozone layer. And when you mess around with somebody's chronology, you stand a very good chance of putting that sucker out of sequence. Somebody that's already been here before might come back. So he's doing that. Mm. Um, and they propose with Buddy's ability to bring ghosts back that they bring in Elvis Presley and Jimi Hendrix. Uh, then the Joe's Garage scenario, uh, where everybody's criminalized and music is outlawed, so people can be uh, controlled and categorized. Um, our criminal institutions are full of little creeps like you who do wrong things, and many of them were driven to these crimes by a horrible force called music. So, uh, now Zapp in the late 70s was writing about music as becoming a figure of terrorism. That's because we're about to move into the extreme Android meme extension of MTV, of television, which would uh, affect the music industry, you know, in a big deal. So, like, Frank is defending uh, the oral culture, the musical culture, uh, before he adapts to MTV. He's uh, saying that they're going to outlaw music. Maybe a, a, just a phase of paranoia on Frank's part. <laughs> <laughs> well, but uh, in a way, they already did uh, with this short format. Like he was finding this uh, amazing music on his own, but he was surprised that it was not presented on the media. Right. So in a way, they already have this type of subtle censorship of of real music. They're promoting only the the music that goes with the substances that sell. Right. Yes. Yeah, and Zappa used to say that whatever substances were being used would determine the kind of musical climate, the type of hit. So he then goes into a lot of Joe's Garage stuff about the dilemma of, um, uh, what is her name? Mary. Mary's a Catholic girl. She gets bored with her little town, gets bored with Joe. So she goes on the road with the mothers or a band. doesn't say particularly the, the uh, mother's invention, but it does name some of the members who were in there at one time or another. And Larry, remember Larry from the Pony World? Uh, 20 years before, he's a character in, in this Joe's Garage part. Um, who is Larry? Also, there's much commentary by the central scrutinizer in this period. Larry. Larry singing, we could jam. So why, who is this Larry guy? (laughs) 
don't see where Larry comes from. So maybe he just popped in. We're not supposed to you're supposed to know that he was with the green women for a while. The green <laughs> cult. So Mary goes and becomes a crew slut and then she ends up when she in the first part when she's um going to the Catholic club, she's mentored by Father Riley. Well, Father Riley gets defrocked and he ends up in Miami someplace um, leading wet t-shirt contests. And that's how he and, he and Mary reconnect, re-meet. So, um, still Joe stuff. Joe's in jail. He gets pluked, constantly pluked. And... Um, The center crew scrutinizes this. So Joe's learned how to speak German. He goes into this place and he sees these little kitchen machineries dancing around with each other. And he sees this one that looks like it's a cross between the industrial vacuum cleaner and a chrome piggy bank with marital age stuck all over its body. It's really exciting. And when he sees it, he bursts into song. So uh, the industrial vacuum cleaner was seen dancing on the cover of Chunga's Revenge in 1970, that album. So this song is called uh, Fuck Me, I'm Clean. <laughs> you get that? <laughs> Fuck Me, I'm Clean. And it introduces the robot, Cyborg. And Cyborg's hanging out with with uh, Joe and like, maybe Larry. And Central School. But we see how these, uh, the Coitus team. Yes. Very Constantly. Yes. Uh, very what? Important. What they the the coitus. Uh, um, well, Frank's ambivalent. He's making fun of all the coitus going on. Uh, like Cyborg, he gets uh, actually gets broken. Cyborg, the automated something. Uh, he gets pluked here and there and always getting broken screwed up so Frank is um, is dealing with the disservices of the counterculture he had a little influence on it's now the ground has changed the counterculture ain't what it used to be it's not as relevant as a counterculture and Frank's looking how to be in any environment he's determined to be a solitary artist so he uh, gets influenced by me and keeps coming up with new stuff that we make relevant uh, we attempt to translate into public mortar. Frank just keeps punt it, pumping out the uh, data. So um, I have ticked off here. Joe's saying, this is exciting. I never pluked a tiny chrome-plated machine that looks like a magical pig with marital aids all stuck all over it, such as yourself before. So, you know, back uh, eight years before, uh, the pig and squat and the sofa were happening. Well, the pig theme comes back with uh, Joe's garage at the end of the 70s. Um, I have ticked off this. Joe picks up the dummy, flicking bits of cake spew off the side of his mouth. The camera pans left to find Uncle Willie seated at a small control console with cables running across the soundstage floor connected to the rear end of Cyborg. So there's the programming uh, committees. Uh hmm. Uncle Willie's got some technical version of it. Uh, the lyrics of a song are, blow job, gimme dat, gimme dat, blow job, gimme dat, gimme the chromium cob. <laughs> Would you write that stuff, Bert? Uh, no. Are we looking at a deranged mind here? Uh, just fetishizing <laughs> body processes? Damaged by the Pope? Well, uh, he's the using shock value for a point. <laughs> yeah, and the president is um, interior Oval Office. The president, with his handkerchief wadded up over the receiver, he's attempting to talk in a low voice. Steam rises from a freshly served hot toddy near the jar of jelly beans on the desk. Reagan liked jelly beans, and and the president's doing a Wyndham Lewis. He's calling up people randomly, so he says to this anonymous person, "Your mother sucks cocks in hell." 
<laughs> would would this have been allowed to happen? Would the uh, the people who arrested Lenny Bruce would they end up redoing it with Frank? Having the president saying your mother sucks sucks cocks in hell. That's all they have, just that. We're just supposed to get a glimpse of the president doing his business. Uh, <laughs> Uh, then they go back to Cy, Cyborg's apartment, and one of the characters is, get this, another swipe at me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> another mocking of me. The character is, geez, where did it go? Oh, yeah, in, in L.A. earlier, in the early 70s scripts, uh, L. Ron Hooper, L. L. Ron Hoover, you know, the leader of the, Church of Appliantology. Um, just a second, I look for this disgusting uh, theme. Okay, um, why is it lost? Ah, here it is. Cyborg shares an apartment with a modified gay Bob doll. <laughs> gay Bob doll. Why? Why, Frank? Why? Did I hurt your feelings? With Why have me in and out of the fucking movie scripts? Bob guy, gay Bob doll. What's that? What's that about, Frank? <laughs> So um, we go now to chapter four. There's 11 chapters. And this is the central scrutinizer. Now, Father Riley B. Now Joe is in jail. And Father Riley B. Jones. Is that the same? What was the father called before? Still looking for the name of the priest. Still looking. Yeah, it's Father Riley, same name. Okay, Father Riley B. Jones. So he's trying to administer to Joe, who's now in prison, for making music. Um, so that's still the Joe's Garage stuff. Now, Buddy becomes um, sort of like a Zappa character, like Billy Sweeney. He builds things. Um, you know, his device to bring uh, people back from the dead. He uh, he gets irritated by the device after a while. The social disservices, he can't be left alone. He must have a public role for changing the lives of everybody with the new technology. We'll probably be the only people that, that hide from uh, our inventions. We will not want to take credit for it. Right? Can you dig that? <laughs> yeah. It's gone stealth. Um, so we're now in... The, there's a big fight in, in the Madison Square Garden. It's between the real Jesus and uh, I think... Um, and Mr. Zircon, but maybe Zircon, is he too old? Yeah, it's, um, says the big fight, old Zircon imitates Hitler's jolly jig, delivering a devastating punch which duplicates the angle and velocity of the Hertzberg Bemelman Sig High. So the velocity of their Sig High salute is matched by the uh, angle of Zircon's punch. 
But where was that? Uh, there's also a bit about Mr. Bemelman's, if you were following Hollywood scandals in the 80s. Bemelman was a big studio director, and he, he got caught stealing money or something. Uh So the other place, okay. In the glare of some horrible unknown beam, we see expressions of panic on the faces of the four scientists. One of them yells, shut it off, shut it off, for God's sake. Scientist two says, we can't shut it off, it's too late. Whereupon an exact instant rep replay occurs. The first scientist repeats, shut it off, etc., etc. The same instant replay happens three more times. Just when it starts to get boring, we see a delayed replay of the first entrance of the unknown doctor and the shot of slightly wrong middle-aged janitor abruptly intercut with portions of the shut it off dialogue. Remember in McLuhan's review of Naked Lunch, Ticket Express, uh, Ticket to Implode or whatever, um, he's saying that Burroughs is advocating uh, hitting the shut off button. So we could make, so these are profiles of psychological types like on my chart this is his version of the chart what do you think of that guys wow so uh, somebody the almost Dan Rather reports <laughs> that as a result of their experiment, a most grievous time-space aberration has occurred, creating an irreversible chronological dysfunction. Now anything can happen. Now anything can happen at any time, from any time, and for any reason or no reason at all, with no regard for continuity, as science has just done away with it forever. Science's products do away with the visual space guidelines. So then you go into Chapter 5. starts off with Carl Sagan. And um, Billy is hand, Billy is hanging out as a roadie. Uh, Cecil is his ho horse world is coming back. He's pretty excited. Um, then they get sent up in uh, uh, what's his name? Um, Who wrote that book? No. Uh, you mentioned something he made in 1970. Roxy. Um, can't remember. Can't even remember what we're talking about. Why am I sitting here talking into the microphone? What, what am I uh, exploring here? Just kidding. I'm on top of it. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> Uh, um, back to the Oval Office, the president, as he might have looked in 1955 as a host in Death Valley days, he's now consulting with his advisors on the significance of this matter. Uh, I guess it's um, Billy has got on the moon. Is that where we're at? Yes. Um, So Billy announces he's going to the moon. Then Reagan comes on. And uh, somebody says to him, that thing, it's in the air again. The president begins to recite the Lord's Prayer, pausing briefly to order another hot toddy. He's extremely perturbed by the possibility that the X-1 might reach the moon before the government's very own hand-picked, corn-fed, all-American astronaut. He orders that the X-1 be, must be destroyed and plans for the one and only official U.S. government lunar landing be drastically accelerated. So I guess X-1 is Billy's plane. There's a montage of obviously cheap stock footage, jet fighter scrambling, radar stuff, anti-aircraft guns twirling around, factories working overtime, 1930-style telephone operators violently jabbing at overloaded switchboards, etc. So um, we get into a suburban scene with Alan, 
has a home in Encino, works for famous international pitchers, and he's got ridiculous kids and a ridiculous wife who um, who eventually wants a divorce. Uh, ghostly occurrences. Uh, here's an item treated in a humorous way by the newscaster regarding ghostly occurrences in Palo Alto, ending with one of those horrible lighthearted news comments about the number of shopping days left before Halloween. I think I had uh, something Frank was going to say about that. During a pause in Horace's computations, we hear this delightful sounds of his enthusiastic crystal lunch consumption over the intercom, followed by a series of even more disgusting sound effects, crunching bone matter and tearing human tissue mingled with ang agonized groans, vaguely reminiscent of the transformation sequences in the movie American Werewolf in London. Are you guys still with us? Yes. Yeah, did... Uh... Did you, no, you, you didn't get knocked out, did you, Eliza? I mean, um, uh, Roxy? Is that you, Roxy, right there? Yes, it was. Yeah, you got knocked out. Right, do you have anything you want to say about what we're saying here? We're getting into cocaine decisions. So we're getting into the 80s here, and... Um, the characters in this um, big extravaganza are Buddy, Uncle Willie, the dummy, Abraham Lincoln, Father Riley B. Jones, Old Zircon, the real Jesus, Hertzberg and Bemelmans, Hitler, Billy, Cecil and Larry, Mumar, Gaddafi, all dressed to look like screenwriters, costume and set designers, directors and cameramen, etc. So we're, we're getting this uh, Hollywood executive, who's Alan, who's um, a disaster in his family, and uh, and doing a lot of cocaine decisions. So in Chapter 6, um, look at this. We cut to the interior of a special effects ware warehouse. As we pan around the room, we notice haphazardly stored in a corner the incredibly fraudulent paper mache spider <laughs> from Missile to the Moon. So the, the spider is now just paper mache the spider motif. That's how it appears anyways. Alan is talking to Roger, who is negotiating a rental deal on a used giant squid, loudly defending its maneuverability, efficiency, and seaworthiness. Roger shows traces of light green clown hair. Um, Gretchen, Alan's wife, is her toenails are dripping with flesh-colored beige enamel. We hear her humming her favorite parts of the Zappa song, Baby, Take Your Teeth Out, as she works. Then there's, now this is early, early 80s when people were getting word processors, so on the desk is the newest, most advanced, most expensive word processor in Hollywood. Uh, it doesn't say whose office it is, unless later. Now we come to Harry. He wants to look at Channel 13 so he can watch the rubber tongue when it comes out of the puffed and flabulent Mexican rubber goods mask next time they show the movie The Bernuka. So he's buying CDs and videos. Uh, Francine, Alan shrinking, shrinking at Francine for some reason. Or just yelling out her name. I think that's his secretary. Um, reference to Elephant Man. Uh, the, the movie tonight is Steaming Poop Shoot. <laughs> so, Barney and uh, his wife have these little projects going. Florence, uh, the wife Florence, another wife, enters carrying a tray with cookies and two tall glasses of milk with long straws in them, announcing Din Din. Mm -hmm. 
So the kid Jimmy with his father Barney and uh, the mother is, I guess, Florence. Yes, Barney. Now we did Barney way back there. No, that was Buddy Wilson. So Bar Barney's a new guy. Barney is incredibly ugly. Did I get that right? He has been affected by the AIDS virus through uh, glute colonia, which we're going to, the thing fish theme. Um, they, his family, he and his wife and son have to wear bags over their heads. They got zapped by one of these uh, Dr. Evil's concoctions. His son is saying, what did you do, Dad? Barney says, believe it or not, I worked the smoke machine on the last Big Kiss tour. How's that for a resume? I worked the, uh, the smoke machine on the last Big Kiss tour. There's a reference to Annie Sprinkle. I'm, I don't know if you guys know who Annie Sprinkle is. Um, look her up. She's a porno star, entertainer, performance artist. So Jimmy, still baffled by what a KISS tour was supposed to be, asked his father, well, uh, are you still in show business now or what? Yes, Jimmy, I'm still in show business. You may never see me on TV or in the movies. You may never hear me on the radio or hear about my activities in the theater. But I am, even today, the most important show business figure in the entire Southern California area. Can you guess what he does? <laughs> what does Barney do? What? Why would he be the most, why would he be the most important show biz figure? in Southern California in the early 80s. Hmm. Because he's a drug dealer. He supplies the cocaine for everybody. <laughs> all the executives, all the pluking executives that Frank makes fun of in cocaine decisions. So there's a cocaine plague going on. But um, that takes up a big chunk. Then Chapter 8 is more hunch and toot. Uh... <laughs> And then uh, 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 where, where oh, chapter nine is Shemp and Francesco. Back to Shemp and Francesco. There's eleven chapters, so <clears throat> we get back into the Broadway play. We began with friend, with Shemp and Francesco. So yeah, they get back to Harry and Rhonda, which we heard a bit of on playing some Thingfish. So it's uh, going to come nicely back to Frank trying to get this stuff on Broadway. <laughs> and it's 5 o'clock, Bert. Doesn't there, yes. doesn't there like the Cinderella thing, you turn into a pumpkin or something? Yeah. <laughs> he, he turns into <laughs> well, the hunchy toot. Yes. Hunch, and hunchy toot means you hunch and then toot on the harmonica. You know, like a, a fake white boy doing blues harmonica. They hunch and then toot. That's what the word means. Hunch and toot. <laughs> <laughs> and in the early 70s, Frank is complaining about everybody celebrating B.B. King and all these boring blues cliches while he's composing the completion of all ear experience. Acoustic space. Yeah. The auditory imagination. I quote T.S. Eliot at the Zappanale. So we went, I don't know, five or six fucking hours, man. That was quite a stretch and very well done by all of us. We did a good five job. Five hours of crunchy dude. Calm. And there's more to come. Yes. More to come. Yes, we, we've got to do another five or six hours to finish the book. Thank you for making this large-scale absurdity possible. <laughs> That's what I want is. <laughs> yes, it's a tiny and yet large scale, side scale. It ions a tetrad in action. Ion <laughs> extends, obsolesces, retrieves, and flips into the opposite. And but then you have to explain why the tetrad is dead. Yes, we will. I'm sure Frank will help me. It'll be inspired by. <laughs> I said we before I get into the tetrad, we got to get into the book. So the book will push me to that with its absurdities. So we can look forward to that next week. Yeah. And the unusual behavior of the Bob. Yeah. <laughs> you just said the, the unusual behavior of the Bob? No, the, the usual, usual behavior. behavior. Oh, the usual. Yeah, the, the ritual. 
<laughs> a souvenir from a ritual in progress. Yeah. Yes, it's a long, it's a, a hundred year long evocation, a ritual of evocation, <laughs> which worked. <laughs> a chanting, and then Ion showed up, and Frank and all the greats were new in their own expressions by default what was coming. But that's a good summation, yes. If Ion didn't show up, we would have had these, uh, even Moon would have blown up. <laughs> Moon unit. Okay, so um, right. I now have to play uh, the last part, the last hour and a half of rewrite number 41. So you can, guys, well, Bert won't be here, but if you want to come back later to talk, uh, Roxy will be here. Okay. And remember Anybody, the sensei uh, drop off. <laughs> Just Yes. Check. You mean you drop yeah. off and sleep, or what? No, no, no. Sometimes you you ask, "Are you there?" Oh and, yes, I have to look at the bottom. Yeah, I have to look at the bottom of the template here. Yeah. All right, so um, I'm going to go to. Uh, sorry, we excluded other people, but this is a special uh, gourmet portion of the program we create with the uh, experts Bert <laughs> and Roxy. Oh, it's they work their way. In. They worked their ways up from the bottom like Billy Sweeney when he was a janitor in the, <laughs> the plant that was shut down in Happy Valley. Yes, <laughs> they worked like their ways up from... He calls, calls around 2 in the morning and he's like, take your loss of media page, I don't know what. And he's talking about <laughs> and seeing a jockey and I don't know what. And I'm like, no kidding, this. <laughs> Did you say Bob calls you at two in the morning? Is that what you said? Yes. 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 And, and then you were talking about these very complex things uh, in the in the tetrads and 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 I'm like okay, I have to read the book. I don't know why, but yes, then I understood. Oh, okay. yeah. I I, so, I I brought the lost media, so she realized how great it was, and she's been taking it to work all week, reading at work. There's, there's not much to do at work. So she's re studying Tetrad lost meeting, getting paid for it. <laughs> perfect, perfect. Yeah, and you did a good intro, Roxy. Uh, your didactic professorial statement of the importance of Zappa and Bob and McLuhan uh, at the beginning, five, six hours ago, was well done. What would you say, Bert? No, she she's okay. done a great job with her musical background and her comment and, and interacting yeah. with you. It's really a great synopsis of what this is. I'm a, I'm amazed. And at all this, of that. Uh, I'm amazed at this book of us and them, of them and us, and how everything. It's them or made. us. Them or them us. Or us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a survival yell. You know, it's either them or us. Who's going to make it? You know. <laughs> But you're amazed at this book, yeah. And uh, what was it? I just know that, you know, we're, this is going to be five or six hours. It'll be added to the 40 hours we're already done. You just know that millions of Zappa fans will start listening in about the second hour. They'll start to notice there's something fishy going on here. Bob's hijacking <laughs> Frank. And this is a fraudulent production probably done by Alan and Harry and Rhonda. And uh, they will not listen to the rest, and they're going to miss all this great stuff that is a uh, really great explanation of what Frank does. It's so powerful. Half of the um, people didn't live enough to hear it, right? They didn't live. They didn't survive to get here. They hear it. <laughs> yes, but some, yeah. some will join the force link. Yes. It will be new. The ranks will swell by the those that deserve knowing about it and understanding. <laughs> right. Yes. Now look at Frank. He's holding a green glove on the cover of this. What is my color in the chart? Green. That's his version of Bob. He's holding up this little glove. That's his symbol for me. Beautiful green glove. Yes. Uh, what's the quote in, in the Finnegan's Wake? The hand holding the, the hand chart. The hand the chart. 
Yes, that's a, like at page 593, you know, the beginning of the last section. The hand poots forth the chart. Yeah. We can we can bring that up someday. But okay, so that's it. I'm going to uh, mute everybody, and we're going to play. Uh, what's his name? <laughs> Who was that guy? <laughs> Ion. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, we like Ion. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay, Bert. Thanks for contributing. <laughs>